this time on Mega Shippers. Dock worker George Peck. The idea is to get as much speed as possible. Is in a race to make space. Boom! For thousands of tons of fertilizer. Before the heavens open. I started to completely fell down. And rain threatens to destroy the seven million pound cargo. Just what we need. In Spain, supporting a round the world yacht race is anything but plain sailing for build team leader Piotr Ostrowski. We need to go up and uh, unstack it. And in Essex, a tight squeeze for classic car dealer Richard Bidolf trying to ship £2 million worth of vintage motors to Birmingham. Hopefully we can get a few sold. Jing, jing. Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume. One miscalculation... No, 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 no. I've got 10 metres to go ahead! One change in conditions... It started to completely fell down. ..could spell disaster. Mother Nature stamped her feet. ..with reputations... ..and lives on the line. Oh. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the Mega Shippers. The Port of Immingham, Lincolnshire, just outside Grimsby. Britain's busiest cargo port, moving over 55 million tonnes of raw materials and freight every year. Next arrival, the Pochard S. 200 metres long and 23 metres wide. On board, 26,000 tonnes of fertiliser. In charge of getting it off the ship is operations manager Craig Stephen. So at the moment, we're just in the planning stages for 26,000 tonnes uh, of granular rear coming in for two customers, um, about £7 million pounds worth of cargo. Really valuable, which is going to take around 20 guys and around four days to discharge the cargo. Known as urea, it's an essential fertiliser for farmers, made from ammonia and carbon dioxide. Today's load's worth £7 million, pounds, but it can be easily destroyed by rainwater. Unfortunately, the weather's just something we have to deal with in this, in this part of the world. And Craig relies on an age-old method of measuring the weather. Sometimes the best weather forecast is literally to put your hand out and see if it's raining. Um, we, all of our cargoes predominantly are weather-dependent. To keep the 26,000 tonnes of fertiliser bone dry, operations manager Craig has to ensure there's enough space in the 5,000 square metre hangar. The end of the shed looks absolutely miles away at the moment, but as the vessel continues the discharge, the cargo will get closer and closer and closer to us to the point where the whole shed will be full. But to make it to the inner offload area, the bulk carrier must squeeze through a narrow lock. The vessel's 200 metres long and 23 metres wide. The lock is 26 metres, the vessel that's come in is 23. So we're going to have about this much room either side of a 200 metre vessel. So bringing it in will be quite tricky. With not much space and notoriously challenging waters, Immingham's specialist tug team will try to bring the Pochard S safely into port. The fleet's newest tug, the Superman, will lead the operation. So bringing the vessel in at night obviously reduces visibility. There's no room for error. Every single thing needs to be planned and done to exact, exact timings. As the bulk carrier inches towards port, the tug crew get ready to take over. Engineer Edgar Dalderis, Captain Wayne Roundtree and first mate Kevin Finn set sail in the Superman. With a 4,000 horsepower engine, the tug has enough torque to help move a ship 15 times its size. The Pochard is um, 199, nearly 200 metres long. So it's quite a big ship and he'll definitely uh, need assistance of tugs. All these jobs are stressful. When things do go wrong on a tug, they go wrong rapidly. An hour's sail outside the port, the tug meets with a bulk carrier. The Pochard, uh, Superman. We're just passing the outfalls now. I'll, uh, I'll keep coming towards you. Thank you. First mate Kevin Finn 
must try and catch a rope thrown from the pushyard's deck. A vital connection to control the bolt carrier's speed and direction. As the pushyard is still moving just over nine miles per hour, Wayne needs to slow her right down to below walking pace before she enters the port's lock. Then we'll just start as a break until, until the ship's ready for fair, fair manoeuvres into the lock. The basic danger of it is if it snaps. As the bulk carrier steams towards the lock, Wayne does all he can to slow her down before she gets to the narrow gates. The Pochard weighs nearly 57,000 tonnes fully loaded, so even without her engines running, her momentum could carry her for miles without a helping hand from the tugs. There's very, very little room to play with. They have to get it right first time, otherwise it causes damage to the lot and damage to the ship. If she slows herself down, she'll lose the ability to steer. Tug Captain Wayne is in permanent conversation with the pilot on board the bulk carrier. Yeah, do you want me to put any weight on the starboard quarter pilot or just follow your stern round? Just follow the stern round for now, please. Aye, aye. With just 150 centimetres between the lock walls and the pushyard, Wayne can't risk hitting the sides. It could cause millions of pounds worth of damage. What we don't really want to do now is let the ship rub along the, the concrete blocks as it's going in. Yeah, number two pilot, we're still on 25%. Okay, yeah, give us start at 10 now, please, thanks. 10%. We're actually, like, steering him now and, and braking him. Yeah, 25 right of stern. That's correct, would you clear, yeah? Yeah, we'll do, pal. The lock's only 250 metres long, but it takes the tug team more than half an hour to navigate. That's fine, mate. Lovely, thank you. And with a final nudge from the tugs, the bulk carrier is successfully berthed. Bingo, we're in. We'll go down, have a cup of tea, um, and then get ourselves in bed. Another satisfied customer. Having worked into the early morning, the tug crews may be ready for bed, but there's still millions of pounds of cargo to unload. One and a half thousand miles south is Alicante, Spain, a fast-growing resort at the heart of Andalusia that welcomes over 800,000 holidaymakers every year. But on the town's busy marina, a holiday's the last thing on the minds of the team from GAC Logistics. They're transforming the dockside into a brand new village, constructed to accommodate the participants in the Volvo Round the World Yacht Race. The first stage of a 10-month global chase across four oceans. Seven yachts and their crews sailing between 12 countries and covering over 50,000 miles. The yacht crews are the center of attention. But as each group of sailors begin the race, the support crew leap into action. The ground team of over 800 have to dismantle the race village. Nearly two and a half thousand spare parts must be loaded onto a container ship destined for Cape Town, South Africa, 7,000 miles further south, where the tents and pavilions will be rebuilt ahead of the team's arrival. Logistics manager Jeremy Troughton and the rest of his team have got just 96 hours to deconstruct all the race facilities. It's not like any on a bus. We've got 100 containers going on this ship. We've got 2,000 tonnes of cargo, uh, and it's not just turning up and stepping on board. In parallel with the race, the support buildings will circumnavigate the world on container ships. It's the biggest logistical challenge in the world of sport events. As the yachts head out to sea, the crew on land are also sailing close to the wind. It is so unbelievably tight. It will be right the way down to the wire. Team base breakdown manager Benny van der Waal has a tight schedule. It's the first time this new set of buildings has been taken down. From Volvo Pavilion, 
tilt the dome. It have to be uh, this complete structure has to be gone tomorrow at four or five o'clock. Uh, it's the first uh, bump out. We call this a bump out, so I think it's going to be a late one. On Wednesday, everything has to be gone here because otherwise, if we miss the vessel to uh, Cape Town, then we have a big problem. And just like the yacht crews, the dockside team are a truly international mix. Dutchman Marcello Altoff is breaking down the yacht team's base camps. I'm unbolting the frame, and then the moment all the bolts are loose, he's going to put one rope on one side, and I'm going to take the frame on the other side, and then we're going to let it down, and then guys downstairs are going to take the frame over from us. It's a huge job, with each team base being constructed from more than 300 separate parts. But that's the best part of the job. Heavy duty. Like this, I don't need to go to the fitness. My girlfriend is happy with me. Work goes on late into the night. By morning, the schedule's slipping. Boss Jeremy Troughton has to muck in. Today's one of our biggest days. The challenges that we really face is uh, tiredness of people. A lot of people uh, did quite a late shift last night. The deadline of Friday in the port is probably a little bit more under pressure now, but uh, we have to be flexible and adapt. The team's biggest challenge is the giant dome, a metal and canvas portable 100-seat cinema. It's a 13-metre-high dome-shaped thing, almost uh, 20 metres diameter at the base. Uh, the cover needs to be lifted off with a crane, so it's always a bit nerve-wracking. Um, but, you know, hopefully uh, with the right equipment, uh, it should all go smoothly. But as soon as the job begins, the crew hits a snag. Yeah, we need to go up and uh, just uh, unstuck it. The crane can't get high enough and the canvas can't be safely removed. Thanks to strong Atlantic winds, the yachts in the ocean race are on their way to Cape Town and scheduled to arrive in a matter of days. The holdup in Alicante has put Piotr Ostrowski and the logistics team around four hours behind schedule. If they can't shift it, one of the critical elements of the race village may not be going anywhere. Immingham, on the northeast coast of England, at the mouth of the Humber estuary. The 22,000 ton bulk carrier, the Poshard S, is in port after negotiating the narrow lock before dawn. As one of the six hatches is released, 26,000 tons of fertilizer worth seven million pounds is exposed to the elements for unloading. Yeah, I mean, it's really good to get the vessel alongside to get us working uh, a good day's weather and get a really good start. So that's really important, you know, to get just to get the mission underway. So our big challenge now is just the weather. You know, everything now is running great. Uh, if the weather comes in, everything stops, the lids come down, and then we're, we're at the mercy of the weather, really. While the weather holds, the urea fertilizer is taken out one grab at a time into a hopper and released into trucks below, waiting to take it to the storage shed. The bulk carrier must leave in 96 hours, and the dockside crew are under pressure to unload over 6,000 tonnes a day. But the load must be removed evenly to stop the vessel leaning over to one side. We can see we've got hold one, hatch one. OK, the, the crane driver's taking the cargo out in a nice, even uh, direction to make sure we maintain the balance of the vessel. The urea is made in Egypt by combining ammonia and carbon dioxide into granules under high pressure and high temperature. It just looks like sugar, I suppose, and you know, and you can really smell the, the urea um, sent to it. This is the kind of things that people don't anticipate when they see bags of fertiliser on farm. You know, this is how it gets here, and this is what we have to do to get it out. Each grab by the crane's bucket contains 18 tonnes of fertiliser. At 300 quid a tonne, that's over £5,000 worth per pickup, so nothing could be wasted. Once he knows the grab's tight enough, He'll lift it out of the vessel, put it into the hopper and into the transport. The driver's happy now that he's not going to lose any product as it goes from the vessel to the hopper. But we need to stay within our target of losing less than half a percent of this 26,000 tonne cargo. Not many people get to see what we see. You know, products this far back down the supply chain and get to play with essentially what, you know, big boys toys, you know, the 150 tonne cranes, six tonne grabs, you know, 200 metre long vessels. You know, it is, it's really exciting. It's going to take almost 1,500 pickups 
to get all the fertilizer out, carefully watched by the hatchman. Crane driver is up in his cabin there. He can't always see the inside ledge of the vessel. This guy's acting as his eyes and ears to make sure that we don't damage the vessel in any way and that we're making sure the cargo is coming out nice and evenly. Spotter Michael Howard All right, buddy. is making sure they don't miss a granule. So discharge is going well. Are you happy with everything? Yeah, yeah, we're mainly discharging from the offside because there was a little bit of a lift on the ship, but it seems to be going all right now. Right, OK, so we're keeping the vessel stable. Yeah. It looks like it might rain in a little bit, so as soon as it does, we'll close the lids. Okay, as fast as the crane fills up the hopper, the lorries are loaded up to take it to the warehouse. But with 26,000 tonnes to unload, dry space is at a premium. These guys are coming directly from the vessel, tipping onto the floor. The guys in the two loading shovels are just pushing that cargo up, and they'll continue to do that until the car goes all the way back to where we're stood now. 20 tonne loading shovels, 40 foot blades, pushing the cargo as high as we possibly can. It falls to driver George Peck to build a seven metre high fertiliser mountain. Right, so I'm just backing up, getting ready for a good run up. The idea is to get as much speed as possible. It's push, climb, gathering the gear, getting as high as you possibly can, whilst the other shovel driver is just coming along the side of me, pushing up what I've gathered together. OK, and this is, this is the stuff. This is your granular urea. OK, so this is the stuff that goes on the fields and ultimately you know, affects what we buy in Tesco. So it's really important that we, we treat this cargo with the utmost respect, keep it, you know, keep it pure white, so that when it gets to the farm, it's in the condition it arrived here in. Get back through, get a bit of speed. Boom! Two weeks ago, this stuff was in Egypt. It was manufactured in Egypt, loaded into the vessel, made its transition over to Immingham, and now it's being unloaded uh, into the shed now. You can see the guys behind us working in tandem together, getting the heap as high as they can. Making a good run up. Plenty of speed, more speed the better. Impact. Beautiful. Not very often you get to drive a big old truck that is, Tonka Toy. Smash. Lovely. Okay, so there's over a million pounds worth of cargo off already. The whole shipment's around about seven and a half million quids worth. So, you know, really starting to see some value in the shed now. But there's still plenty more to unload. The Pushard S needs to set sail again in three days. But the clouds on the horizon could shut the whole operation down. In the Atlantic Ocean, seven crews are racing from southern Spain towards Cape Town in South Africa. When they arrive in a matter of days, it's vital the support team's base camps are in place. Back at the starting line in Alicante, the logistics team have a parallel race to get all the buildings ready for shipping. The support offices and team headquarters are still being broken down and put into 130 containers. A giant 13 metre high geodesic dome, which houses a 100 seat cinema, is proving tricky to dismantle as the only crane on site is too small and the canvas cover is stuck on the frame. It's supposed to not happen. Should not happen. It's just a little price you pay when the crane's too short. Construction coordinator Piotr Ostrowski has to call in a portable lift. But up top, elbow grease is all he has to help unsnag it. Finally, it's free. But almost 30 metres up in the air, the wind is picking up. And just as they attempt to gently lower it down, 700 kilograms of canvas comes crashing down, smothering Piotr and his Australian colleague, Steve Larson. They emerge stunned and unscathed, but the same can't be said for the top of the cover, which is still attached to the crane. When they examine the torn canvas, Steve's clear what happened. The little repair was a bit unrepaired. 
the constant building and dismantling over the years can take its toll on the structures. It was an old repair in the fabric after the last race back in 2014. The tour, I think they're, they're just going to have to buy the bullet and, uh, and replace it. With the canvas sent off for repairs, they need to safely dismantle the frame. The bigger crane has finally arrived on site and holds it in mid-air while Piotr and his crew break it down layer by layer. But the team are now six hours behind schedule and night is beginning to fall before the frame is finally loaded up. You have good days and you have bad days and the level of progress has been slightly frustrating today. The ship that's picking up the containers is heading towards Spain and arrives in 48 hours. Quite nerve-wracking at the moment. Um, we know that there's a, a long way to go and we don't really have much more time. Work will have to continue well into the night. Things are happening, but it's just whether they're happening fast enough. And right now, the programme is slipping across the board. Just outside Grimsby, on England's northeast coast, lies the port of Immingham. A team of 20 dock workers have just four days to unload 26,000 tonnes of nitrogen fertiliser that arrived from Egypt. Charge hand Tom Close must keep the cargo moving, but with only a quarter of it unloaded, one of the pneumatic fenders protecting the hull from the concrete wall has been forced out of the water by the weight of the bulk carrier. We've asked the vessel to slacken its mooring ropes off, and then uh, we'll be able to just nudge it back in the dock. With the vessel moving around, the unload is temporarily suspended for safety reasons. Now, we've currently we've had to stop just because the ship's going to be pulled away from the quayside. Obviously, you don't want the grabs really swinging in, could cause damage or something. And obviously, it's not really safe for people working alongside the ship. We're pulling away and we keep working. It's also a challenge for key foreman Alan Cook. Everything's at a stop now. We've got guys waiting in the sheds. While the bulk carriers moved away from the dock, ready to be remoored. Hopefully, when he tightens the ropes on the aft end of the ship, it might just pull the front end off a little bit and the fender should roll back into the dock. Should. <laughs> By loosening the ropes holding the ship to the dock side, Alan's hoping gravity is going to help them out. Good, you're getting. There you go. Guys, back in. Yeah, I think we're good to go, mate. Both cranes back up and running. No stoppages for the past couple of hours. Hopefully, it just keeps going on like this throughout the rest of the shift. We'll get another two and a half thousand ton off, and uh, we'll be on the way to the good tonnage really for the day. But while they've been fixated on the rogue fender. Ominous clouds have been gathering. Yeah, there's some quite dark clouds coming across now. Um, hopefully, it isn't rain showers. Like I said earlier, when I checked the weather forecast, it, it said it would stop about 10 o'clock, no more. But you know, the British weather's like it always changes, so it, there might be more to come yet. Tom Close and the team have to work fast, but that doesn't mean cutting corners, as farms expect their fertilizer to arrive in perfect condition. Cargo surveyor Francois Cutterso is on quality control. Obviously, the quality is paramount. If it's too small and too fine, too dusty, when it comes to final use on the fields, it will just blow in the wind without being spread properly. And, and the same with during the bagging process. If it's too small, uh, a lot of it will be put as waste because it cannot be going through the system. Francois needs to check the fertiliser hasn't been damaged during the sea journey from Egypt. Picking up the product from the fall of the hopper. This allows us as well to control temperature over 30 degrees, so it's, it's pretty good. When you pay £7 million for your fertiliser, you need to know you've got what you've ordered. These products are extremely weather sensitive. Um, you don't shut the, hot, the hatches fast enough um, and you carry on discharging and then the product will get affected. They start to dry off, they will go set like concrete. It will become very, very brittle. It crumbles away to dust. I mean, you can see the uh, granules are very well formed. They are bold. It's nice and white, which is very good. 
The farmers want big, loose granules that drop on the fields and gradually dissolve over time. Everything is contained on the higher size scales, which means that the product is stable and is very good. Any type of contamination will have huge financial implication. New hopper operator Connor Gardner must ensure he maintains quality while racing against the darkening skies. The job of the hopper is to basically filter the product through into the wagons in a safe way. It goes in cycles. One minute there's six or seven wagons there and it's flying and then next minute you, you're down for 10 minutes or five minutes. After more than 10 years as a truck driver, Richard Robinson has developed a communication shorthand with the hopper operators. We know the truck's full when he's beeping his hole. As soon as he's hit his target weight, he'll beep and that's when we shut everything off and he'll pull away. Once on board, it falls to Richard and the team to get each load into the warehouse half a mile away. About 29 tonne in the body. That'll put us at about 44 tonne overall. We're weighing the load. Is it your last load? No. Wish it were, though. <laughs> With just under 20,000 tonnes still needing to be unloaded in the warehouse, Connor's day is about to get a lot tougher. The heavens are ready to open. The top of the hopper is immediately covered by the crane's bucket. The fertiliser can withstand some moisture, but if it gets too wet, it'll combine into one big useless pile. But the jaws at the bottom of the hopper have suffered a malfunction. They're stuck shut, and the exposed fertiliser can't be released to the safety of the dry lorry below. Aye, 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 I'll the fitness. I'm going to get the fitters to come out and check. Did he press the uh, helping reset button on the offer? I have, mate, yeah. The rain is a major problem. On the vessel, the covers are pulled across the hold to protect the fertiliser granules. But Francois worried the load stuck in the hopper will get saturated. Is it completely down? Completely down, mate. Because I'm just shutting it down, started to pelt it. Completely fell down. We've got a, about a wagon and a half in there as well. Ah, man. So, yeah. There's nothing we can do. Just got a standby guy and he's on his way. No worries. There's nothing we can do. <laughs> Just what we need. It's not good, really, is it? Couldn't have chose a better time to break down, could it? <laughs> as a torrential downpour flies over us. <laughs> Luckily, the repair crew are there within minutes and managed to solve the problem. I don't know what he's done different to what I did. We'll go in again. That's the bonus. The hopper's emptied into the dry lorry. Hey, OK. OK. Not ideal, but hey -oh. By the end of the day, Tom and his team have overcome all the skies could throw at them. And as the rain subsides, the crew can get back to work to unload the remaining 12,000 tonnes. Back in the warehouse, Boss Craig is satisfied. So I guess many people don't really think about this kind of thing when they're buying food in supermarkets, how the shipping industry affects the food chain. We discharge fertiliser from vessels into sheds and onto farms, and I suppose in many ways, you know, the shipping industry is the unsung hero of the food chain. Over the winter, much of the fertiliser remains in Immingham until it's delivered to farmers ready to spread over the fields in spring. The county of Essex is renowned for its love of flash motors. But on an industrial estate in the town of Grays, a different class of classic car is cared for by vintage car dealer Richard Bidolf. We don't sell cars, we sell pieces of art. And what you see here is a piece of art for somebody. The prized possession in Richard's collection, a 1931 eight-litre Bentley Tourer, valued at over one million pounds. Bentleys have long been the pinnacle of British engineering, but their hefty price tag means they're reserved for a very particular clientele. Any self-respecting millionaire is going to want to have one of these. <laughs> it's just a beautiful thing to drive. I mean, it's the sort of car that when you drive it down the road, mothers lock their daughters up and they see you coming. <laughs> it's full on Mr Toad. It may look like it should be in Wind in the Willows, but this automotive work of art comes with a colourful history. 
It's an 8 litre Bentley, um, built in 1930, just before Bentley went bankrupt. Shipped new to Singapore, the Maoist Chinese owner used it as a form of transportation to take his girlfriend to the races, to be blunt. It was known as the Horam Saloon. The car can clearly tell a few stories and has a price tag of £1.2 million. But to sell it, it needs to be put on display at Birmingham's Classic Car Show, 140 miles away. Final polish before we get ready to load. Get a couple of marks out of here. We lighten the show up all ready to go. It's too risky to drive such a valuable car on the open road. And when it comes to shipping luxury motors, specialist haulage firm Straight 8 Logistics have just the men for the job. Spencer Wynn Greensmith and Simon Davis have been charged with the safe delivery of the million pound Bentley and four other precious classics. A 1923 Alvis 1240 Dux Bactora, a 1927 Bugatti Type 35B, a 1932 MG Magna F-Type Salonet and a 1954 Bentley R-Type Sport Special. They need to get to the Birmingham NEC in time for the annual classic car show. It's quite a big drama, lots of logistics. Um, it's always a bit of a headache getting everything sorted in time. We're going to drive these cars down, get them on the truck, get them unloaded and get them on the stand. So um, it's a lot for us to do. Hopefully we won't be bringing them all back at the end of the show. We'll see. Get a few sold. Jing, jing. The truck that will carry them to Birmingham must be precisely loaded. Spencer and Simon have turned carrying classic cars into an art form in itself. Basically, two decks, flat top deck, which we can extend. We can lower the middle section of the bottom deck for higher vehicles. Walk around it, make sure everything's where it needs to be, ready for the cars to come on. Inside the warehouse, Richard Bidolf and partner Christoph Cowens are ready to load two million pounds worth of cars. What I think is you give directions. Yep, absolutely. Left a bit, right a bit. Chris and I'll do the driving. Yep. That way, any damage is done to us. So the first one upstairs will be the Bentley. 1.2 million pounds. Cross fingers, it all goes well. Great piece of kit, lovely thing to drive. But it is a big old truck. Question is, will it start? Starting. Retard, a bit of throttle, neutral, ignition. Only 100 Bentley Tourers were made, but as Richard got the skills to reverse a 96-year-old worth over a million pounds down a steep slope. Let's see if we're going forwards or backwards. Backwards, that's a good oh, start. Yeah, that's fine. Follow it up. Piece of cake. Stage one complete. Now just a question of squeezing her on board. The problem is, the car is 1.8 metres wide and the truck has only 25 centimetres of extra space either side. Straight up. Yeah, we're ready to go. So as you crest the top, it does dip away from you. No so, worries. All right? Just don't want to slip the clutch. No, no, but if you feel that's going to happen, yeah. just get onto the deck and we can lift it up. we just got to take it easy. We've got to make sure we go up in one smooth run. No clutch slip and just stop on a dime, basically. The safety of the million pound motor rests on Richard's skills behind the wheel. One slip of the clutch could make for a very costly repair. He's made it, but to stop it rolling out, the transporters must strap her in with a wheel chop bar. OK, handbrake on, in gear. Handbrake on, in gear. Can you just stay in the vehicle for me for one minute while I just get at least one strap round it? Control, we always get one strap on the wheel before we get out of the car, just to make sure it's secure and uh, very straightforward. Absolutely as planned. The MG presents a different challenge. It's a much thinner car, and the running tracks in the lorry are a fixed width apart. Wow, that is narrow. There is a risk or damage to tyre. We could fall Just, off between the two if we're not careful. Yeah, if we're not careful, yeah. Guiding the MG on board, Richard's assistant, Christoph Cowens. Straight up. Who has no choice but to run the tyres right on the edge.
but the MG manages to stay on track. Next, it's the R-Type Bentley Special. A new ride for Richard. Right, my Bentley Special virginity. Never driven this car before. Press the button and see what happens. Not much is the answer. There we go. Sounds nice. With one and a half million pounds worth of cars already squeezed onto just 13 metres of track, it's a tight and very expensive fit. We do bring the cars closer than what some people would think you would bring them. We generally rule a fist distance between the two. The cars don't move when they're strapped, and even if they do move, because of the nature of the trailer, they all move together. Therefore, they're all moving in the same direction. They don't do their individual things. What we're trying to avoid is obviously this one becoming loose in any way, shape or form and damaging the back of this one. Not only have you damaged the back of this one, you've also damaged the front of this one. So doubling your bill. The 90-year-old Bugatti Type 35 should be small enough to fit on the truck, but Christoph's got his own size issues. The problem is it's not very easy to handle because it's an old racing car, essentially. Tiny wheels and pedals. Hence why I forgot that I have to take off my shoes every time I get in it. It's got an incredible amount of power and no brakes. So, I mean, what could possibly go wrong? With the first three cars loaded, on the top deck, a new challenge has been presented. The lower deck is only one and a half metres high, and Christoph needs to duck. Despite the risks, packing the cars in tight can also present a business opportunity. We've got so much room in this big truck, I'm almost wondering if we shouldn't take a sixth car, maybe a Silver Ghost or something, just so we've got a bonus car up there in case we sell something. 15, 16, 17 we can do. But will there be enough room to cram in an extra Rolls Royce worth £178,000. So we're going to drive her in all the way onto the lower deck in the middle. Uh, we'll secure her and then we'll lower the deck to the floor. Pump some fuel pressure up. Ignition on. Mixture full rich. Retard, bit of hand throttle. Let's see if she goes. She's away. The windscreen's folded down. But as a last-minute addition, Watch your head. no one's sure if they can squeeze her in. In Alicante, Spain, the Volvo Round the World Yacht Race support crew are under pressure. It's day four of an operation to pack up a whole village of team offices, pavilions and tents that need to get to Cape Town. Seven teams heading towards South Africa expect their base camps to be there when they arrive in a matter of days. Each team base is like a pit lane for the yacht, where management, sailors and engineers work out strategy and carry out repairs. Over 2,000 separate parts involving over 300 tons of steel and over 100 panels. The only way operations manager Jeremy Troughton can ship them is by flat pack. They're essentially made up of eight sections which, which move on a flat rack and then one 40-foot container. And inside that 40-foot container is the, the posts and the doors and the, the materials to build it with. Jeremy's put Ferry van der Waal in charge of the crew packing up the last few team bases. It's a big circus which needs to be moved and packed up. The huge structure is carefully stacked on the flat pack trailers. Well, the challenge is to be ready on time, that's for sure. But uh, it comes natural to me. This is what I love doing. And the dirtier my hands are, the better I feel. Awesome, love it. I, I grew up in the circus, I'm going from city to city. Nobody will ever get it out of my system, that's for sure. There's only one difference in a real circus and here. In a real circus, you have two clowns. In this circus, well, we got hundreds. But safety is no laughing matter. 
it's easy to lose a finger between metal and metal. Sometimes the guys, they look there, but they're holding it here, and then it's too late. Each base camp is made up of metal framed units that must be dismantled room by room. All designed to fit perfectly. This is the limit we have, and we are absolutely not allowed to go even a centimeter higher. And we are about five centimeters under, which is great. Once the flat packs are loaded, they'll be stacked on board the 300 meter long Maersk Luce, which is scheduled to dock at Algeciras port 380 miles away before it sets off again for Cape Town. And the boat is always going uh, left to right, up and down. And then you get all the dents in the container, which we don't want. So we strap it all nice down and it will always stay uh, good. They're running out of time. And once full, each container needs to be loaded onto a truck and get on the road to the port seven hours drive away. We are still behind and it doesn't take much to sort of push us further behind. At 12 meters long, they're the biggest containers in global shipping and fully loaded can weigh up to 22 tons. Crew member Ruben Don right. is working in a limited space. We have a pretty fully loaded container with a, quite a heavy one, so um, indeed not so much maneuverability and we need to first, so we're going to lift it, then we need to turn it 180 degrees and only then we can uh, actually land it on the truck. We have to be careful with the lamppost as well, so um, there are a lot of things um, which are not in a perfect position. With the giant 12 meter long box swinging in the air, palm trees and lampposts quickly become a very real problem. This is really, uh, I think, pretty much as close as it can get. <laughs> it falls to Ruben's gentle but steady hand to push over 20 tons of container clear of the street lighting. The more you get the weight forward away from the boom, the diff more difficult it gets. You're on the limit of what we can do. And that limit has just been reached. I don't know what's going on. The, the container is stuck on, <laughs> on the crane. Hey, boom like it. It's not possible. Hey, boom like this. The crew have to lever the container away from the crane, allowing the truck to safely reverse underneath. <laughs> yeah, very happy about it. Safe and sound. Up to the next one. It's taken four days to load up nearly 2,000 tons of flat pack buildings okay. into 130 containers. Everyone has said it wouldn't be possible in the time we've had, but what we try to do is achieve the unachievable and battle against what other people think is impossible. Transported by a 100 lorry convoy on their seven hour journey to the port of Algeciras. The yachts out at sea are facing their own challenges but they're blissfully unaware of the problems their ground teams have had on land. We've had the race within the race, but all working as one team to get the job done. With just minutes to spare, the final containers arrive on site. It takes the containers 12 days to make the 8,500 mile trip to Cape Town, South Africa. So here we are in Cape Town. We've got the majestic Table Mountain behind us and uh, We've just started delivering the first containers onto site here in Cape Town. We're ready to start all over again. For the first time, they've managed to build and dismantle this year's facilities for the sailors and fans of round the world yacht racing. With 10 more countries to visit over the next 10 months, this is just the beginning. The yachtsmen and women get much of the glory, but behind the scenes, the logistics operation keeps the race on the move. In Essex, Richard Biddle's trying to squeeze a 178,000 pound Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost into the back end of a car transporter. Hold it there a second. She's, uh, yeah, we're just, we've got an inch spare here. Luckily, there's just enough room. A bonus. We always like bonuses. Oh, I'm really happy about this. This is great news. I mean, it's a tight squeeze, there was an inch. A quarter of an inch we'd have been worried, but hey, she made it in, that's fine. And it gives us another chance to sell something, so um, really happy to have this, it's a great car. And last up, the 1923 Alvis, which nearly comes a cropper. Shut the door. 
before she's safely tucked in the final slot. Yep, we're all loaded. Uh, we've got the extra car on that, the, uh, that Richard requested. He's all very happy about that. So we're just closing up and we'll be setting off shortly to the NEC. There's 140 miles of traffic to negotiate and they need to make it before nightfall, so time is pressing. With nearly £2 million worth of unique motoring history in the back, it's one of the most valuable loads Spencer's transported. So you've got to think what you've got in the back. It is not so easily replaceable and it's an awful lot of money. We want to get there safely and we want to get there quickly. Without the worry of £2 million of cars to tow, Richard Bidolf has beaten Spencer to the motor show. We're waiting for the truck, we're here, it's getting dark, we're hoping the cars are all in good shape. Um, excited, let's get them off and get them unloaded. Where is it? Come on. Should be here any moment. I'm antsy. Here he is. It's a pretty sight, eh? Yo! Yeah, we made it here in one piece, so there we go. Any movement en route could have cost the transporters thousands of pounds. The bonus Silver Ghost arrives unscathed. OK, straight in the hall. At this stage, we've come so far, yet we don't want to make it fall at the last hurdle. Having been successfully loaded... Hold it there a sec, I'm going to check the back. Getting the unload angles right is crucial. If it's too steep, the back end could scrape on the tarmac. OK. Nice and gently. £1.2 million worth of car can't be taken lightly. She's clear? Yeah, she's clear. Let's see if we can get a bit of a roll on. There's been no damage. Uh, Richard's checked all the cars. Our £2 million load has arrived safely and handed back over to its owner. And behind every mega shipment is mega money. If we sell one of these, the show is paid for. If we sell one of these, a couple of months is paid for. If we sell two or three, we're going to have a very good Christmas. And Richard did have a good festive season. Three cars sold, including the Silver Ghost, for £170,000, ending up in Italy. This time on Mega Shippers, the sky's the limit. Project manager Mikhail Smetsas uses hundreds of wheels to balance two giant metal cubes reaching for the clouds. Carrying two uh, huge modules, you can lose your stability. Worst case, fall off. In Ipswich, Des Not uses a bit of his old magic to send 50 trucks flying through the air. It's like something out of Harry Potter, isn't it? <laughs> and Andrew Goodman parachutes in to lift two heavy tanks, but ends up sailing close to the wind. That might be a little bit tight. Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume. One miscalculation... No, 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 no. I've got 10 metres to go ahead! One change in conditions. I started to completely fell down. Could spell disaster. Mother Nature stamped her feet. With reputations and lives on the line. Yes. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the mega shippers. Rotterdam, on the west coast of the Netherlands, Europe's largest port. It covers nearly 40 square miles and is home to one of the world's largest oil refineries. Operated by Shell, it's already as large as a thousand football pitches. But continued global demand for new, cleaner fuel means further modernization. After months of meticulous planning, Agility Project Logistics are bringing in two new pipework modules for the refinery. 
they're being handed over to Mikhail Smetsas, a senior project manager with Mammut, who has to transfer both giant cubes off the cargo vessel and onto a small red barge. The Roldog vessel is uh, too big to go to the final uh, destination. The draft is not sufficient, so that's why we're transferring uh, these modules first to a barge and then moving uh, the barge to uh, the Shell Ponis refinery. The largest module comes in at 1,350 tonnes. The second module, 850 tonnes. The equivalent combined weight of 2,200 cars. Both cubes 33 metres high, 14 metres wide. This is a big deal. It's not uh, small cargo. It's uh, really big. It's very expensive, of course. The Roll Dock Storm is a roll-on, roll-off cargo ship and berthed end-to-end -end with the barge. Mikhail can now get on board to see the scale of the task ahead. We're now in the hold of the Roldock vessel. The modules are standing on load spreading equipment as well, completely welded to make sure that during uh, the sea passage the module doesn't move. It's a lot of heavy steel, which takes a lot of time to cut it all off as well. The modules must be cut free from the deck overnight. All of this will start at 12 o'clock tonight, then the cutting crew will start and they have seven hours to complete because seven o'clock tomorrow morning we start uh, coming in with our trailers. In the morning, the first challenge is lining up the cargo ship with the towers at the entrance to the barge. When the ramp's coming down, you see it's uh, pretty close to the uh, tower of the barge on that side. So we've uh, taken off some of, uh, of the ramp to make it fit uh, in between the towers. Now we just have to adjust uh, the barge a little bit. The Roll Dock Storm is a semi-submersible. It sinks itself by adding seawater to its ballast tanks to get level with the barge. The vessel is currently uh, ballasting as well. So uh, going lower and you see that the ramp is getting uh, almost level with, uh, with the barge. It's a delicate balancing operation. There's still a danger each vessel could drift apart or crash into each other. We've put in some additional stopper blocks to prevent uh, the barge and the vessel coming too close together. And we've attached two additional winches to prevent the barge and the vessel going too far apart from each other. Cargo superintendent Jan Wilhelm Munster has to work with Mikhail to carefully connect both vessels. The ramp is the physical bridge between the barge and the ship. It can take approximate 1,600 tonne of load on the ramp itself. It's crucial for the whole operation. The ramp has to be on almost zero level, otherwise trailers get stuck and they can't drive off. Four trailers, or transporters, will lift and move the giant modules. We're going to remove uh, the modules with self-propelled modular transporters, SPMTs. You see them here, lots of wheels. Uh, it's like Lego, you can connect them all together and they form one big uh, trailer. Uh, no matter how big the trailer, it's still going to be operated by one person. You see the trailer is now all the way in the down position, but we can actually move the deck of the trailer uh, up and down about 600 millimeters. Each axle can have about 30 tonnes, and as you see here, we've got 28 in a row. We've got an extra, an, an extra trailer next to it, so lots of capacity. In all, across four transporters, 50 axles and 200 wheels. Three hours into the second day, a 19 metre long convoy of SPMTs moves onto the cargo vessel. We're uh, driving in the SPMTs at the moment. All SPMTs will position them underneath the module. We have to make sure that we position them in the correct position. We've done all the engineering to make sure and calculate where the trailers actually have to go, that uh, we have the correct uh, center of gravity. Uh, once we start picking it up, we'll actually see if uh, the drawings are uh, correct. We can see what it is in reality. But the reality is, there's a problem with the measurements. The supports are uh, a little bit wider than expected. It's only a couple centimeters, so we move up the trailer uh, a little bit. 
it's crucial they get the modules perfectly upright. You can lose your stability, you can overload some axles. Uh, worst case, the modules start leaning to one side. Precautions are required to avoid a disaster. OK, we're going to start rolling. The smaller module is the first to leave the cargo vessel. 850 tonnes, with enough pipework to stretch out over 27 kilometres, is carried towards the barge. It's operated by one person, but of course we have a lot of uh, spotters as well. Uh, the supervisor will give him uh, the directions. Crew from the vessel, they will make sure that their own vessel uh, stays stable. But the entrance to the barge is flanked by two towers 17 metres apart. The module is 14 metres wide, leaving just 150 centimetres either side. Any wrong move now could cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. You have to work very accurate uh, with this kind of module. You can lose your stability, worst case fall off. The port of Ipswich, Suffolk, at the head of the River Orwell, 12 miles inland from the North Sea. More than 50 second-hand trucks need to be transported to the Caribbean. Nothing? I've got lights, but nothing else. Oh, we're going to jump start it. They're standing still for so long. They ain't got no energy in the batteries. Well, try again. Come on. <laughs> Any diesel in there? There you go. You got it. Des Knott is project manager for Kestrel Logistics and supervising the shipment of the vehicles. So the trucks we've got here will be loading today on the, uh, the vessel Bow Trader, which is heading out to the Caribbean. It's good news that some of these old trucks are actually not going to the wreckers or the breakers anymore. They're actually going to be reused into the Caribbean. Have a new life in the sunshine, which is, uh, which is pretty nice. An old truck like me could do with a, do with a holiday out there. After a 15-hour voyage from Antwerp, the bow trader arrives in Ipswich. A 118-metre-long vessel capable of taking 6,300 metric tonnes of general cargo across two decks. But on arrival, she's the wrong way round. The reason we're turning the ship is uh, because the, uh, the cranes on board the vessel is on the left side, so the, uh, so the ship must come along on, the, on its left-hand side or the port side alongside the quay. It's a little bit tight to turn in the river here, but the bow thrusters are working, uh, the stern thrusters are working, so uh, she'll spin around on herself. The next challenge is to catch her guide rope. Um. He's trying to throw that uh, tennis ball attached to a, a small piece of uh, small piece of rope to uh, to this chap who's going to catch it. Hopefully, come on, guys! It's three minutes past twelve. You're late. Throw it harder. This time, that's it. The bow trader has almost 1,300 square meters of deck space, and Des plans to use every last inch. OK, so we're starting to, uh, to assemble the cargo alongside the vessel for uh, ready for loading out tomorrow. We've got some 50 pieces to load, excavators, trucks. Basically, if we start work at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning and we finish at 6, 6 o'clock tomorrow night, we've got to move uh, four, four pieces per hour. Before any trucks can be lifted on board, the top deck must be cleared so they can access the lower deck. They've done a lot with the machine. <laughs> but the unlashing crew are having problems removing the chains. I have had my weight in beaks, but it's good. We'll try the other end. That one's a bit too tight. But with some extra levers, the chains are removed. And the top deck can be cleared by the 29 metre high onshore crane. But there's another problem two giant generators taking up all the space in the hold. 
European Caribbean Line's cargo superintendent is Benny Kirkhoff. He has to work out how to lift the two heavy generators out of the lower deck to make room for the trucks. We got two big generators in the hold, 55 tons each. And we're gonna use two ship's cranes to do it. Each crane can lift 40 tons. We've got two spreader bars of six meters length each. With both of the ship's cranes involved, a unique frame is required to get the first generator out. They've just attached the lifting devices called side shoes under the generator containers. Everything goes very, very quiet. Everything's, everyone's concentrating. Um, it's very, very dangerous now. In this procedure, the most important thing is to think before every step you do. That could be very dangerous, uh, especially when you've got uh, loads where the lifting slings could shift or things like that. If the load's starting to move, then the slings can move and then the load can fall over. The generator's being offloaded onto a truck to get it out of the way. But as the generator comes off the bow trader, the remaining cargo on board makes the ship lean over towards the sea. You're lifting 55 tons and you're going to put that with two cranes outside the ship. So you get a momentum, an overhang to this side. So on the starboard side, the crew will have to pump in ballast to compensate that weight. Ballast is a counterweight and Benny has to take seawater on board to level the ship. Both cranes must work together closely to get the generator square on the truck. We have to get it perfectly on the trailer. It's uh, because of the, the size of the load. Down, both ends. Any, any movement, as you can imagine, 55 tonnes, it's, uh, it's up a little bit, going around a corner. If it's not central on the trailer, it's dangerous. A little bit more, that more. Keep going, all the down, way. down, down, down. Down, down, down. It's down. It's like pulling teeth. <laughs> but three hours after the bow trader arrived, only one of the generators is off the ship. We're running out of sunshine, and uh, we have to do this while it's light. It's no, it's no good under lights at all. So uh, we need to get this uh, wrapped up straight away. While the second generator is taken out of the hold, as many of the trucks as possible are loaded onto flat racks ready for the morning. It's like something out of Harry Potter, isn't it? <laughs> and Des wants the team in two hours early. It's not much time and it's going to go to the wire. I hope to see cargo flying about all over the place. We're going to get it done tomorrow. Famous last words. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be swinging chains around if it's, uh, if it's getting late. Even an old boy like me. In Rotterdam, the cargo vessel Roldock Storm is offloading two huge pipework modules onto a transport barge. Project supervisor Mikiel Smetzers is trying to squeeze a 14-metre wide unit through a 17-metre wide gap between the towers. With just a narrow gap either side, the module has to be kept perfectly upright. Seawater is being pumped in and out of both vessels and used as ballast to keep them level as the module moves across the ramp. After 75 minutes at less than half a mile an hour, 850 tonnes of pipework makes it on board the barge. Barely fitting in between the towers, but still good enough. Looking good so far. Most of the weight we keep on the trailers. Once that's done, we can start putting in all these uh, stoppers and start welding. A metal seal around all the footings is the only way to keep the module in place when it travels across the water. The small one's almost done, and now we have to do the big one. But the second module is 500 tonnes heavier. This module weighs about 1,350 tonnes. Add another 150, 200 tonnes for the trailers and the supports. So quite a lot of weight in total. 
with pipes sticking out on one side, there's just 20 centimeters clearance between the module and the tower. Jan Villa Munster is cargo superintendent on the Roldock Storm. To get the last module off safely, he has to keep his vessel absolutely level with the transport barge. Seawater is pumped onto his ship to compensate for all the weight that's leaving his deck. We're doing the ballasting and we're driving off the uh, last module. So we're doing quite well. All going to plan, I hope this one is off at three o'clock. So should be just in time for tea. But at less than half a mile per hour, it's a slow process. And just as they're almost there, the module gets stuck halfway between the cargo ship and the barge. Each vessel's out of balance, and the suspension on the transporter is on the limit. It's getting out of stroke, which would mean that the axle is not putting any weight on the barge, and more weight is spread to the other uh, axles. And using a tape measure is the quickest way to do it. And using a laser just takes batteries, etc. Good old-fashioned tape measure, that's how you do it. They have to use more seawater ballast to try and get the vessels level again, so the suspension can cope over the ramp. OK, uh, Michel, uh, we're ready uh, to start rolling again. Last axle on the barge, discharge completed. Everything has been discharged on the barge, and now we can start cleaning up and prepare the vessel for the next project. Jan Willem's job may be done, but McKeel's work has only just begun. A successful discharge. Both the modules uh, have been transferred from the Roldock vessel onto our barge. The hardest bit is still to come. To take the modules to the oil refinery, the fully loaded barge must travel two and a half miles across one of the busiest waterways in world shipping. The following morning, the 91-metre-long Dina launcher is free of its mooring. Modules are safely on the barge now. Uh, we've just cast off from the Mammoth uh, premises, and now we're on our way to the Shell refinery. Both modules' combined weight is more than 2,300 tonnes. But they've been lashed and welded to support blocks attached to the deck of the barge. There's nothing special about the barge. It's just a big shoebox made of steel. The Dina launcher has no power and can't go anywhere without two 700 horsepower tugs, one to pull and one to push. At low tide, they guide the barge across the water at just two miles per hour. Each module teetering 34 meters above the water. If any ship cuts across their path, the rear tug would have to apply reverse thrust to bring the barge to a halt. An hour later, the modules arrive safely. Once we uh, arrive at the shell, then it's uh, hands-on again. The robo operation over there is going to be a bit more challenging because uh, we will be tight uh, dependent. Uh, we can only use the upper part of the, of the tide and we only have about a, a window of about two, two and a half hours to uh, complete the robo operation. Once docked, the barge is secured in place by the winch ropes. A hinged, flexible roll-on, roll-off ramp connects the floating platform to land. We've arrived at the Shell Panis refinery. Uh, we're now preparing the Roro uh, ramp, adding the last uh, wedges. Uh, the ramp is uh, too steep at the moment uh, to do the operation, so we have to wait for the tide to come, uh, come up. Once it's more up, we can start uh, the drive-off operation. But high tides, not until nightfall. Uh, darkness means that, yeah, you can see less, there's a lot more trip hazards. Uh, you have to make sure the barge keeps stable, which is uh, difficult to see during the dark. And to make matters worse, McKeel has got just a two-hour window of high tide to get both modules safely on land. He needs the water level at maximum height to keep the barge horizontal to the shore. 
The tide is something we can't change. It's depending on the moon and the weather. We have about a two meter tidal uh, window here in Rotterdam. For this operation, can only use the, the upper 50 centimeters of the high tide. Once the margins are on land, then uh, my heart rate goes down a bit. The port of Ipswich, Suffolk. A shipment of trucks, tractors and excavators is on its way to the Caribbean by cargo ship. It's six in the morning and logistics manager Des Knott is overseeing the load up. We've got 28 people ready to, uh, to start loading the, the vessel. Everybody's here, everybody's on time, the crane driver's ready to go. All in all, 51 moves to go. We've got 12 hours, let's, uh, let's crack on and do it. The bow trader is a cargo ship, so the trucks can't be driven on and must be lifted using more traditional methods. The cab trucks will have nets applied to each wheel and they'll be, uh, they'll be lifted on. So they drive over the nets, then they'll lift gently and uh, then begin to, uh, to, to lower it into the cargo hold. There'll be a supervisor in the cargo hold that's watching the cargo coming over his head. He'll be speaking to the crane driver by radio, giving him instructions. There'll also be hand signals, which are universal. The quayside crane at Ipswich is nearly 29 metres high and can handle up to 40 tonnes per lift. The trucks can weigh up to 25 tonnes each and must be perfectly balanced despite the time pressure. We calculated that uh, every hour we have to achieve four lifts onto the vessel to, uh, to, to get it finished today. Every 10 minutes we want to, we want to see a lift on the vessel. I, yeah, We'll uh, keep the pressure on. Time's tight for Des to fill the 400 square meter lower deck of the bow trader, almost two tennis courts of space. We're all going on, uh, on board the ship now, so we'll have a look at the, uh, the stowage, what's been achieved so far, see how the lashings progressed, see how we can make it go a little bit faster because we're slipping a little bit on time. Ready? Lead the way, boss. 30% of the vehicles need to go in the lower deck. Watch out, watch out, train this end. They're two hours into the operation and Des is keeping count. We've got 11 pieces of, uh, of trucks already loaded. It's slowing down a little bit because uh, in the nature of the operation, as things get a little bit tighter, there's less room for people to move around and uh, we're watching the trucks come in, we've got to slot them into less and less space. For now, they're on schedule, with eight vehicles loaded in two hours. But maritime lashing laws must still be applied. We have to go three times the weight of the, the, of the cargo. So this machine is 50 tonnes. So we have to uh, apply a minimum of 150 tonnes of force on, onto this, uh, to this machine to keep it guaranteed in position that it won't move. On the D-rings, which are fixed to the vessel, these are generating 27 tonnes of, uh, of force. So the calculation is uh, 27 tonnes We've got 27 tonnes, we've got 50 tonnes, we've got 75 tonnes. On each side, we've got 150 tonnes of cargo restraint, which is in line with the guidelines. So therefore, under the worst sea conditions, this isn't going to move. Crane driver John Scott must get each vehicle on board safely. Well, there's 12 people on board, what can count so far, what we see. And you have to watch out for all of them. You compare this to a game of uh, Jenga or Tetris. The idea is to, uh, to maximise the space. The challenge really is a lot of people work in the hold to make sure nothing gets hit or nobody gets injured. And John is always operating partially blind. They can't see anything. They've just been told where to steer and go back and forward. So they really need to be a good team to do this. That's really important for them and trust each other. Four hours into the load-up, and they're just one vehicle away from filling up the lower deck. 10 o'clock in the morning, we're ahead of schedule. Six o'clock is still looking good for us. But the optimism doesn't last. The lower deck's last truck won't start, and they can't drive it onto the slings. So, Benny, it's not, uh, it's not working. 
No, the unit stopped running when it was on the nets and no way to get it started again. Well, we'll pull it out of the way if we can and uh, see if we can get it going in the meantime and get it on deck if we can, but uh, otherwise... Uh, I don't think it will be running anymore. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, it looks like we've lost two units off the load list, but this one, is, which is broken down, and uh, up, in the yard, up in the yard where we, where we held the trucks, it was a little bit wet and one's got stuck in the mud. Portsmouth, Hampshire. Historic home of the British Royal Navy. A former military base and in South Sea, home to two Second World War tanks. In command today, Andrew Goodman and the team from Move Right International. With an unusual job transporting both for restoration and repair. Got to remove from the front of the museum two Second World War tanks. Uh, the first one is a, a Churchill tank. And weighs approximately 40 tonnes. The Churchill crocodile was developed to attack German fortifications on D-Day and had a built-in flamethrower which could reach over 150 metres. The second one is a, a Sherman tank. Uh, which weighs about 32 tonnes. The 1943 Sherman Grizzly was built in Canada. Only 188 were made and it's nearly six metres long. These tanks are going away for refurbishment at a, uh, an installation not far from here. The tanks will be leaving South Sea and travelling just three miles along the coast to Fort Cumberland. So today, in order to, uh, to move the tank from their current positions, uh, we've got a 350 ton capacity crane. It's one of the biggest cranes in the country, weighing 90 tons. It's got a 70 meter reach, and with the tanks just 10 meters apart, they need to decide where to put the crane for the most efficient lift. Rather than having to move the crane uh, to set it up once and then to move it again down the street to, to make the second lift, We've decided that if we can set it up once and do the two lifts from the one position, then obviously that will save quite a lot of time later on today. The crane is so heavy, the outriggers must set up to avoid a minefield of utilities under the road, which could be crushed during the lift. We've had to carry out a detailed survey of the roads around about, obviously making sure that we weren't on top of any gas pipe, uh, gas pipe lines, electric lines, etc., etc. So we've. We've had to pick our spot very carefully where to set the crane. With the crane in between both tanks, the 40-ton Churchill Crocodile is the first to be lifted. Instead of having four lifting points on the top of the tank, it's actually got three. Two to the rear and one to the front, so it could potentially be a little bit unstable. It falls to lift supervisor James Carson to make sure three eight-metre-long nylon slings are attached to the three built-in hoops with bow shackles. Yeah, it's nice to be involved in stuff like this. It sort of beats your day-to-day stuff. Day-to-day -day building work, solid work. But as soon as the crane driver puts a bit of tension on, there's a problem. Right into the sling on the end, you're a scrubber and that. See just where we're lifting it here, so I cut into okay. the sling. Um, as soon as we pull weight on it, it's pulling against it. With almost 80 years of military history behind the sharp metal edge, it could cut through the sling in mid-air. 40 tonnes of tank could smash into the tarmac and rupture a gas pipe. No, you need some either some timber or some rubber. Well, oh, she's down in the van down there. <laughs> to the place. Hang on. the mat. Lift supervisor James Carson needs to come up with a quick solution. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute, yeah. Just pack it out so it doesn't cut the, cut the strops out. A little sharp edge there. As soon as it pulls against the strop, it's going to cut the strop. Rubber mats are the first line of defence for a strong but not indestructible sling. A nylon um, or a web-based material. So what we've done is just put a bit of timber, give a bit of protection around the sharp edges, basically. It's amazing how often an odd scrap of timber has, uh, has saved the day. The lift can finally begin, and 40 tonnes of tank can take to the air. 
But despite surviving the Second World War, just as it's about to go on the trailer, a flagpole and bus stop threaten the Churchill's progress. In Rotterdam, Michiel Smeetsers is at the final stage of delivering two huge modules for the Shell oil refinery. The modules are still on the barge now. Once the tide is good enough, we can start driving onto the, to the row, row ramp. The modules are going to continue into the refinery. We're going to make a wide turn to the right over here, and then it's about 200 meters that way, and that's where we're going to position these modules. The barge turned up three hours ago in daylight, but now it's pitch black, and they're forced to wait for the tide to bring the barge up to the height of the dock. They only have a two-hour window to complete the move before the tide recedes again. Watch when you're walking on the barge, it's still a lot of pipes, a lot of hoses, uh, and also some open tank holes. OK, if no further questions, good luck, and let's get these modules off. At 6 o'clock, with the tide at its peak, the move can begin. Keeping barge and land level is a major challenge. The self-propelled modular trailers have a limited suspension. We have to watch for the tide now. The ramp is going to move. Uh, if the barge is moving, of course, the barge is going to sink in and this ramp is going to go down again. But the tide is pushing it back up, so we have to make sure that we uh, stay within the, the hydraulics of the SPMT. But as the transporters move the 850-ton module onto land, the barge gets lighter. So the first module is now coming up, so the barge wants to come up. So we use the second module to drive uh, forward and push the weight down again. In the meantime, we're ballasting on the back to try and keep the barge down. They only have one hour to move each module. After 50 minutes of maneuvers, the tide prepares to turn and the first module must be landed in less than 10 minutes. But unexpectedly, the barge starts to twist. We've got about one centimeter difference between uh, port side and starboard, which is well within tolerance. Bow and aft, there's about a difference of 50 centimeters, but as the barge is 100 meters long, that's well within the tolerance. Finally, after an hour, the first module is off. They've now got just 60 minutes to get the second one on land. We got the first module off, and now starting on the second module, slowly moving forward. Uh, we're still on the high tide. While McKeel gets the second move prepared, the team at the oil refinery use the transporters to get the module to its installation position. It's a 150 meter narrow path. Passing just centimeters from the existing modules installed over the last 12 months. As the complex bundle of pipework lands at its final destination, McKeel has got just a few minutes before he loses the high tide and the 1,350-ton module still has 10 metres to go before it's on land. The last module is exiting the ramp. A uh, couple axles to go and then we're done. Still cold. <laughs> But with just a few minutes to spare before the high tide runs out, the second module makes it safely into the refinery grounds. My job's done, I'm happy. Uh, it's up to the others now to uh, do the final installation. I'm gonna go get a drink. After nearly two years of planning, it's been a remarkable engineering achievement. And when the new modules are installed, Shell will have the ability to refine crude oil into cleaner petrol and diesel. The port of Ipswich, Suffolk. Logistics manager Des Knott has just a day to load more than 50 trucks onto a cargo ship and get them off to the Caribbean. But one of them has broken down. It's such a shame, but uh, what can you do? Nothing. Yeah. So uh, two units down, but uh, hopefully we can get on with the operation any moment now and uh, get the hatch covers down and uh, have the whole afternoon to, uh, to prepare the deck and load the deck. 
Five hours into the load-up, they're halfway there, and the inner hold can be closed with 17 vehicles squeezed inside. The remaining items must find room on the top deck. Crane driver John Scott slotting them in exactly the right place, some just 15 centimetres apart. Well, we picked up good speed. We need two more lifts on edge cover number two, and then we have one hour work left on edge cover number one, so it seems we will finish in time. The winter conditions en route mean every vehicle on the top deck is vulnerable and extra precautions are required. Sailing through the Bay of Biscay is going to be a, a pretty rough passage and the vessel's going to be pitching and rolling and, uh, and listing, so uh, they've doubled the lashings and I'm just having a quick check to make sure that uh, nothing's going to move, slide across the deck. This is going to be uh, rock solid and in place. On the two-week voyage across the Atlantic, the lashings will be checked two times a day. Second mate Marcus Saeed Sello must make sure nothing falls off on the way to the Caribbean. During the journey, we have always to check the lashings, sometimes twice a day. Some of the cargo can smash into the ballast tanks, so we get a big leakage. It's pretty dangerous when you're on the ocean and there is no help. We're all alone. By five o'clock, everything's on board, an hour ahead of schedule. What we thought was a tall order was achieved. I'm dead chuffed and I think, uh, I think the job has gone very, very well. And she finally sets sail at 10 o'clock at night. The bow trader heads out through the English Channel and down across the Bay of Biscay to Hijon in northern Spain. So, we have here a view from the bridge. As you can see, all the trucks are still on the ship. All the lessons are checked and everything is good. Leaving Europe, the bow trader heads out into the Atlantic towards the Caribbean Sea. 26 degrees, we're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We had some good weather, much better than we expected. Still a bit of rolling. Guys checked the lashings today, everything was good. Always a dangerous job, but it has to be done by someone. And those guys are doing this every day. 365 days a year, cargo ship crew are risking their lives on the ocean to keep the global economy going. But 15 days after the bow trader left Ipswich, the crew and all the trucks arrived safely in Georgetown, Guyana. From the rain and snow on the motorways and A-roads of Britain to a new life in the sunshine. In South Sea, a 40-ton Churchill crocodile tank has got stuck between a flagpole and a bus stop. There's less than a metre either side between the tank and the uprights. But haulage boss Andrew Goodman is confident. It is a bit of a tight, uh, what between the lamppost and the, uh, and the flagpole. Oh, and the chaps forward connect. That might be a little bit... Uh, He'll, he'll get it through there. Let's go up now, babe. Lift supervisor James Carson has to guide a precious six by three metre chunk of military history through by hand. So far, so good. Uh, we'll, we'll just wait till it's on the trailer, shall we? A 20 metre long low loader will be taking the tank three miles down the road to the restoration shed at the 270 year old military base, Fort Cumberland. About that much, then. Perfect. Just put a few chains on there to hold it in place while we uh, we trundle up the road with it. Wouldn't want to lose this on the uh, on the seafront at uh, South Sea, would we? Cause a bit of a stir. The Sherman tank is only 30 tons, but this time Andrew needs a different lifting strategy. They've only got hoops. I mean, they're 60, 70 years old when the worlds were done. The tanks have been sat in the, uh, in the sea air here. So rather than relying on those lifting points for this part of the lift, um, they're actually cradling the, the tank with these long boat slings going underneath the tank under the main chassis so that we've got it in a, a basket effect. 
Um, obviously the concern is though that it's quite sharp edges on the bottom of the steel frame. So again, to protect the lifting straps, we're, uh, we're putting rubber factors in behind. The crane is using a heavy duty lifting chain and each 16 meter long boat sling is strong enough to hold 32 tons each. Okay, brilliant. Each trailer is capable of carrying up to 250 tons. The closer it is to the back of the trailer, hopefully the easier it'll be to get it off the other end. But before they can tackle taking it off, they have a three mile journey down the coast to Fort Cumberland. It takes 10 people to move the tanks. Two escort vans lead the way at 10 miles an hour. The 20 meter long transporter carrying 30 tons of military history along South Sea Seafront. All the drivers in constant radio communication to help the procession navigate the hazards. On arrival, getting access to the hangar is limited. Backing into the building where the, uh, where the tanks are being stored, uh, it's quite a narrow entrance, but uh, Adam's done very well there. He's uh, managed to get that in without causing too much damage to the grass. We don't like leaving our imprint. It's a tight squeeze, but the Sherman retreats into its home for the next 18 months. The limited height in the hangar forces Andrew into a new lifting strategy for the tank. Now, because we've got quite a low roof structure here and uh, we couldn't get a crane in with the jib up, as we haven't got that, what we're using here, this is called a mega lift system, and basically it's four hydraulic rams, uh, one in each corner, and uh, a steel beam across the top with lifting brackets on, and that's driven from two power packs, one at each end, so there's two independent operators, so they can lift the, the rams accordingly. This time, it's only a 15 centimetre lift off the trailer, and the team are prepared to risk the 75-year-old lifting hoops. We'll just lift the, uh, the tank very gently off the bed of the trailer, then pull the trailer out from underneath, and then we can lower the whole system to the floor. Job done. Thirty tons of Canadian military hardware raised delicately so the trailer can pull out. We'll just get it down on the floor. Andrew's praying the 75-year-old hoops hold out for a few more centimetres. Safely down, the restoration engineers can now do their bit to recognise the sacrifice of the soldiers that use the tanks in anger. A lot of young lads gave their lives for the democracy and the freedom that we have these days. It's good that we remember those that give the ultimate sacrifice. There's a, a, a great sense of uh, relief, I suppose. That everything went as planned, so yes, it's uh, been a good day. But we've now got these two uh, historic relics of the Second World War safely ensconced in, uh, in the shed. A good feeling of uh, satisfaction and the job well done. With the 75th anniversary of D-Day in June 2019, the team have just 18 months to restore the tanks. In a year and a half, they'll be put back on display to commemorate the Allied invasion of Normandy during the Second World War. This time on Mega Shippers, naval architect Mark Way has to deliver a three billion pound aircraft carrier. But first he has to get her out of the dry dock. And this is the critical part for me, making sure we keep this piece here away from here. Minimal margin for error, as heavy haulage expert Lloyd Baglardi attempts to maneuver 300 tons of steel cable under a low bridge. It is gonna get tight now. <laughs> and yacht builder Lawrence Pask needs all hands on deck to help protect a million pound yacht en route to America. How's that? Go on, lads, there's enough of you out here, come on. Across the world, 
there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume... One miscalculation... No, 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 no. I've got ten metres to go ahead! One change in conditions... The started to completely fell down. ..could spell disaster. Mother Nature stamped her feet. ..with reputations... ..and lives on the line. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the mega shippers. Recite Scotland. Over a thousand acres of land the UK's largest dock. Historic shipyard for the Royal Navy, building Britain's battleships for over a hundred years. The dry dock was built in 1915. A century later, the latest three billion pound aircraft carrier, HMS Prince of Wales. Construction began in 2011. 51 million hours of work to create a unique twin island design. 73 metres high from masthead to keel, including 15 decks. Built to transport 40 jet fighters around the world with a range of 10,000 nautical miles. I name this ship the Prince of Wales. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Engineer Stephen J.J. McKenzie has worked on the project from the beginning. We're on the deck of uh, the Prince of Wales, the second of the QEC class uh, aircraft carrier. Uh, each one is 65,000 tonnes, four and a half acres of flight deck. Only carriers afloat with two islands. The forward island here runs the ship. The aft island will control the aircraft landing and taking off. She's 280 metres long, 70 metres wide. 40 jet fighters will be brought up on deck by a pair of hangar elevators. She's designed to be home for 600 people, including sailors, officers and flight crew. It's been a great project to work on from the start. I've been on it a long time and to actually see the Prince of Wales going into service will be a proud day. HMS Prince of Wales must now be floated for the first time and taken to the other side of Rosyth Dockyard. The dry dock is 311 metres long, 42 metres wide and 15 metres deep, and it must be flooded with water. Chief Naval Architect Mark Way is in charge of the move. Currently the, the ship is sitting on about 300 uh, steel stools. So these stools are distributed very carefully around the ship, located at strong points throughout the hull to support the mass of the ship. Each stool supporting 183 tonnes. It'll take 31 million gallons of water to fill the dock and lift HMS Prince of Wales off the supports. It's my job to make sure that we understand the ship condition so that when she does float off, it comes off from that design point. We don't want her to come off from a softer or weaker point that might cause the damage to the hull. Mark's challenge is how to get Britain's most expensive ship floated and moved safely without hitting the concrete wall of the dry dock. It's a matter of centimetres on either side of the hull. Right now, I'm standing basically in the, one of the critical areas of the docking, which is the gap between what we're calling the bilge keel, which is a thin that comes out from the side of the hull that um, helps dampen the movement of the ship. So here we have a gap, it's about kind of shoulder width, and this is the critical part for me of making sure we keep the, this piece here away from here so we don't cause damage to the ship and also we don't cause damage to the dock. The dry dock is in the final stages of being cleared out. Tomorrow morning we're going to 
I'm going to have to do a final inspection to make sure that nobody is actually down here in the dock bottom um, because it's become a very unsafe environment as we fill the dock bottom. We've got two very large culverts that are going to flood hundreds of tons of water in per hour. She will remain on the blocks. But what we do expect to see is because of her sheer size that she will move. With only centimetres between the hull and the dry dock, if the bilge keel is to survive, Mark needs to constantly balance the vessel. The actual heel and the trim will be controlled by my team moving ballast weights on the flight deck. When the Prince of Wales is floated off the stools, it could lean to one side. Concrete and iron counterweights known as ballast are essential to keep the vessel level. We have about 600 tonnes of ballast carefully distributed around the flight deck um, with a number of very large forklifts to allow those weights to be moved in prescribed fashion. And I'll be the one on the day who will be directing the chain movements of those weights. The weather forecast is good. The flooding of the dry dock is due at first light. At seven o'clock the next morning, it falls to a team of 40 engineers to get the 55,000 ton vessel afloat for the very first time. Okay, good morning. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm John Edgar, I'm the dockmaster. We've uh, confirmed that the weather's okay for today. I'll be undertaking the, the flood and the process for putting water into the dock. Obviously, it's a pretty cold day. Um, there's probably a bit of ice on the flight deck, so be careful where you're walking for slips, trips. Timeline really, we're planning to put water in the dock around about 0800. Dockmaster John Aitken won't turn on the tap until the aircraft carrier is secure. Once we, uh, once we put water in, we'll take a bit of tension on it, get it really tight, that'll be us, good to go. The flooding of the dry dock begins at 8 o'clock sharp. So we're just going to get the water level up to probably near the top of the blocks. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty exciting, really, I think, at this stage. This is the first day, really, where the hull will become wet as a complete ship. We'll not see again for probably another five, six years until her next docking. But even Mark doesn't know whether the aircraft carrier will lean to one side as she floats. And he's relying on shifting 700-tonne blocks of concrete ballast around the deck to balance the vessel and protect the hull below the water. Workshop Nottinghamshire. Brunton Shaw Steel Rope Maker. For over a hundred years, the company has layered strands of wire and twisted them into a helix to form some of the world's strongest metal rope. It's a kind of living thing for us, a wire rope. So this is, this is the kind of comparison, this is the diameter of the actual rope. I think we're ready for it move now. Production manager Matt Mills has a giant bobbin of steel cable ready for export. The rope itself is roughly about 3,660 metres of rope. So it's took a lot, of, a lot of time, roughly about three weeks, to actually process it from purchasing, acquiring, the wire to actually finishing the rope. With the real weight on top of it, it's exceeding roughly 295 to 300 tonne in total. So it's one big piece weight of rope. Right, the challenge inside now is to get it to go. Now, we've got it to this form, we'll get it outside. Six metres high and five metres wide. It's one of the biggest reels of steel rope made in Britain worth half a million pounds and being exported to Mexico. Very slow, this is roughly kind of speed where it'll actually be going out onto the roads as well. So it's a very slow process to actually maneuver a 300 ton piece weight or anything. Then we're just at final destination now. And then this reel will not move at all then till Saturday. The ends of the reel must be removed so heavy haulage engineer Lloyd Baglardi and his team can build a frame for the road trip. The beams are about eight metres long. Uh, we use a fork truck to get off the trailer. We'll uh, lay them down, two beams in front and behind the reel, get more square in position, 
then off that we can then do our frame that needs to go around it, bolted together with our quadrants, and then that is the main section that will actually carry the reel. The girder frame, to get it correct, our frame has got to be completely square and put the correct distance part because we have to be extremely wide. So the, the girder frame beams have got to be as tight as possible for going down the road because in a way it's, it's like two different parts. Two 16 axle modular trailers with 64 wheels are attached to each end of the new girder frame. The three part convoy is now a total of 80 metres with a truck at each end. One facing in each direction for forward and reverse manoeuvres. It's so big it can only be moved at night. At 10 o'clock, everything is ready for the 40-mile road trip to Ghoul on the Humber Estuary. I think we can't wait to start rocking and rolling with it. But the load is just over five metres wide and can't turn sharp corners. The exit is too narrow. What are you doing? Check it fence down so we can get, so we can get all the truck out until they widen the factory gate, the cable's not going anywhere. Resyth, Scotland. The three billion pound aircraft carrier, HMS Prince of Wales, is being floated for the first time before going to the far side of the dock to be fitted with her propulsion system and military equipment. Could you open the door another 5%, please? Yeah, open another 5 okay. As the water level rises, the 55,000-tonne vessel is very slowly lifting off its supports. Naval architect Mark Way has to make sure she stays level as she floats. Whilst we're doing this operation, there's other operations going on as well. We've got about 600 tonne of ballast that's going up onto the flight deck. Most of it is in uh, concrete blocks that are weigh about seven and a half tonne each. A 16 tonne forklift truck manoeuvres the 700 tonne blocks down either side of the flight deck. Inside, the remaining construction materials must be evenly distributed. So right now we're in the hangar deck of uh, Prince of Wales. And on the hangar deck, it's been used as a major store area for the ship. And what we've had to do is capture the weight of every single item here. It's a cutting edge vessel, but monitoring horizontal movement uses ancient technology. So we have a pendulum strung from the deck head, which is about six and a half metres up, down to um, the, the actual hangar deck level. And this is a, a very basic measure. This has been used for hundreds of years, really, but it's a very tried and tested system. The pendulum here is to actually record the angular heel change that we see from the ship. Every minute movement is recorded. Dockside, another team's using more modern technology to monitor any movement caused by the flood of the dry dock. So this is a Leica total station, and it's basically a laser theodolite. So it, it shoots a laser beam up to a prism that we've got attached to the hull of the ship basically on the starboard midship bulkhead. And this will provide us an accurate millimetre measure of the position of the ship relative to its initial start and position. There's six positions all around the hull, forward, midships and aft, and both on the port and starboard side. We're ready to take the level up to 4.5 metres when you're ready to go. Yes, Jock, I'm happy for you to proceed to the next level to 4.5 metres. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Jock. OK, stand by. I'll keep you updated as the level rises. So, as the water level is starting to rise now, we want to make sure that the ballast is at least equally distributed. So we've got about an hour and a half to move whatever ballast is coming on into those port starboard locations. As the level of the water increases, Mark and the team adjust the ballast to keep her level. After seven hours, the dry dock is 80% full and 55,000 tonnes of carrier has only moved two degrees to the starboard side, safe to undock. With all systems checked, the dry dock is full 
and the day of the big move has arrived. Well, today we're, we're just really finishing off the final completions of uh, her preparation for the Prince of Wales to be removed from one dock, so it's a big um, tug exercise. Half Moon Bay, half Moon Bay dock, Master. We've chosen specifically some of the tugs here. I mean, Kitty Wake, she's got a haul, I think, a region of about 65 tonnes. Um, the rest are in the 30 to 50 tonne range. So, you know, we're talking very powerful tugs um, to give us that control necessary as she comes out. You know, she is, a, is effectively um, a dead ship right now. You know, there is no control on board. It is all through the, the tugs. Uh, communication is quite important. Uh, main channel for myself, the lead pilot, and uh, the tugs will be channel 74, VHF 74. But most of the tugs, pretty much, are all just perpendicular to the hull. A straightforward push on or a pull off, OK? On the bridge of the Corrigan, Master Chris Stutchbury is part of the six tug team supporting the Kitty Wake. And our task today is to help move the Prince of Wales out of the dry dock here in Rosyth onto the lay-by berth for final fitting out. And once the carrier's out the dry dock, we'll be making fast the bow of the carrier to help us swing in the basin and a final position alongside the lay-by berth. The pilots will be suspended below the forward aircraft lift of the aircraft carrier where they get the best view of the whole operation. Okay, all stations on 74, all stations on 74, this is the dockmaster. Just to announce that the ship move will take place at 11.30 today. 11.30 for the time, thank you. Today is, um, is a real significant landmark, um, really for the project, because we move out of a dock build scenario to a floating vessel. But it's a rare and dangerous manoeuvre. It's a three billion pound floating shell that needs to be protected from concrete walls. Reputations are on the line. The sheer size of the ship, the minimum clearance she has from the walls of the dry dock, and a lot of money involved. A lot of money involved in this ship, so you uh, have to be very careful. I would say it's as, it's as good as it gets. This is the show type. Okay, to go, yeah. 300 miles south in Worksop, a 300 tonne reel of steel rope is heading for suburbia. As you'll see on the journey, there's lots of tight corners and to be, it looks impossible, but these guys can do the impossible. It's very, very challenging. The factory fence is in the way and must be rolled back. It's a 40 mile journey at night through heavily populated areas from works up to Ghoul Port on the Humber Estuary. The cable reel suspended between two 16-axle self-propelled modular trailers with a truck cab at either end. We're going to drive out onto the road, one truck facing forward, one truck facing backwards. So when we actually go to reverse up the hill, one truck will be pulling forwards and one truck will be pulling backwards. There's an engineer to control each trailer, two spotters walking along each side, a driver in each truck, and two support vehicles. The police escort of four officers in two vehicles will guide the logistics team. But as soon as they leave, Operation Supervisor Lloyd Bagladi runs into a problem. Uh, the first obstacle is just here, just getting out onto the road. There's a slight curve in the road, some um, lights that need uh, to be watched. We've got a lot of uh, wheels about, so we've got to make sure they're all out of our way. Don't hit anything like curbs. Is <laughs> that far off the curb, mate? Well, we're reversing up the road, up to the next junction, because the turning is too tight for us to turn. So if we go backwards, we're on the right angle then to make the turning. Obviously, the sheer size of the loads. Uh, Head to the road, Jamie, yeah? And sometimes the route you wish to go, you can't go that way because there's a weight restriction on one of the bridges or, you know, the road can't physically take it. The other obstacles are private cars. Well, we've 
put a letter drop out so all the local residents know that there's this load coming through. We've got about 100 yards before we, uh, before we get before I get to the cars. There's police no parking signs out, so people shouldn't park there. But they'll just say that. But they'll just say that they was parked there before the cones went out, and you can't prove otherwise sometimes. We'll stop here, nice and steady. A single car is blocking the road, and the whole convoy has to stop. We've had uh, cones out all day. We've had the, pl the police about watching over the roads, and still. The cars have got between all the cones and brought us to a complete stop. No, no, it's about this. I've been on holiday. So hopefully last car might be out of our way now and we'll carry on. The car may be out of the way, but two hours into the journey, the difficult turns are coming thick and fast. Are you going up front, Tim? Follow Eric now, Jay, yeah? Each trailer has 16 axles and the engineers are in control of the direction of all 128 wheels. Copy of that, Chris. <coughs> Both trailers have a combined 256 wheels, travelling at an average of two miles an hour through the most difficult sections of the route. Uh, can you either go to the near side of touch your near close on these lights up ahead? Keep it like that, you're going to be fine. You're about a foot off the railing on the other right off side. There's only 30 centimetres between the load and the railings, and it's even closer to the traffic lights. Stop there, Rick. Stop there. Yo. We're about this far off the kerb. Nice and steady, nice and steady, nice and steady, nice and steady. There you go, get there. The frame surrounding the cable reel is nearly six metres high, and Lloyd's route just got more tricky. Deckard main problem that we've got to come across now, it's the low bridge. We've got to move right over to the right hand side and get very low to miss the, the bridge. It is going to get tight now. <laughs> uh, as we're just going under the bridge now, just make sure we're not getting close to the top or the bottom. The route under the bridge is heavily off centre. I'm forcing the right hand side of the cable reel up against the wall. There's just a few centimetres in it, and they creep by at two miles an hour. Round to the left case when you can, mate. Keep on going to the left. Keep it going, nice and steady. Nice and steady. That's it, that's going. That's all right. At the next set of lights, they're not taking any chances. Heading towards the motorway now, we should get along a little faster. Four hours into the journey, they've covered just eight miles. But the convoy takes to the motorway and can pick up speed to 30 miles per hour. By eight in the morning, engineer Lloyd has to walk the last few metres to check for any more obstacles. Warming up now and walking again. That's not too bad. Last stretch of road. 11 hours and 40 miles later, one of the biggest rolls of steel rope in Britain arrives safely in Goulport. Lloyd's work is done. We've got our sister company coming in with uh, an LG crane who's going to set up and get ready for a lift and get it onto the boat for us. Uh, we've started about half ten. I don't even know what the time is now, but half nine, so a fair shift, to be honest. Yeah, we're ready for bed. The cargo ship taking the cable reel to Mexico is ready to go. But the crane that's due to lift it on board has broken down. Deep in the heart of Northamptonshire, the Fairline Yacht Yard. Production supervisor Lawrence Pask has been building speedboats for more than 20 years and today needs to say goodbye to his latest creation. Well, today we're moving the GTO 63, the new boat from Fairline Yachts. Um, it's basically going to Ipswich, so we can do sea trials, 
and test the boat before it goes to customer. It's um, we're between 1.2 and 1.4 million, depending on what spec you have. And it took us roughly three months from start to finish a prototype boat, boat one. The Targa 63 GTO is destined for America. She's 20 meters long, made from fiberglass, wood, and glass, weighing over 30 tons with a top speed of 36 miles an hour. When we're moving a boat like this, obviously it weighs around 30 tons, so we have to be very, very careful. When we're moving it, it's um, time consuming and not too easy. We've got to have a lot of eyes and ears, making sure we don't damage the boat on the way out. You know, we've got to look after her. To get her outside, Lawrence needs two electric tugs, each with a four kilowatt motor capable of lifting 20 tons. This is a master mover. Um, we, we need two of them to do it. And basically, it's specially designed to pull full heavy, heavy loads. Are you ready, son? He needs to get the yacht underneath the eight meter high hydraulic boat hoist. Here she goes, here she goes. Keep it going. Keep it going, keep it going. Now keep it. All right, you go on the aft now then. Yeah, she's heavy. She's doing all right. Tell me we're in the middle, somebody. Paul, somebody see me through the middle. How are we looking? How's that? Paul, side back. We'll just see if it's in line for the crane, if the crane driver's happy. If you get it in the right place, in the middle of the crane, it makes it easier for the lift. It just keeps it central, and then it makes it easier to load onto the lorry. Taking her 120 miles by road to Ipswich is heavy haulage lorry driver Mick Cullum, using a unique yacht-carrying platform. Um, well, this trailer's got new top bridge, so you can load the boat all the way through your axles to keep you a lot shorter. 20 meter long slings are attached to four winches on the boat lift. We've got four going on here. Two at the front, two aft, she's quite heavy. Right, got to make sure these don't nip the GRP on these, on here, look, there, all right? Now the slings have took the bag, we're not worried about the wind blowing it now. Okay, tell four, we're all ready. Four winches attached to steel cables powered by a diesel engine slowly lift 30 tons of yacht. Whoa. All right. Okay, Paul. She's in the air. Yeah, we're just checking, making sure before we go up. Okay, mate. What's the string for me? What's the string? What's the string? Okay. Come on, lads, there's enough of you out here, come on. With the vessel in the air, Mick's trailer must reverse exactly into position. Let's help him out. I really need your help, chaps. Just make sure he doesn't hit anything. I don't want us all being out here and then something goes wrong. If the yacht's to survive the road trip, Mick must load her on the trailer completely level and at the right height. Now the boat's over top of the trailer, on there, got to measure the height to see what height we are, because we can't guess any height, we've got to be exact height. Height's important because a lot of the bridges are low, so if we're like 18 foot, the bridge might be 17 foot 5, which we're then too high to go underneath the bridges. 18 foot and a 18 foot 1. It's an inch over the safe height, so Mick has to lower the trailer. It is tight, very tight. Drop that front down to an inch, that gave me 17 foot 8. That's good, then. So we should have two inches to spare under the bridge. Right, we'll get it all loaded up now. With Mick satisfied, 30 tonnes of boat can be delicately lowered down and lashed to the trailer. We're going to secure the boat down with ratchet straps to the trailer. Um, stop the boot moving on the trailer and that keep it nice and tight and secure. Looking pretty good. But the delay has put Mick behind schedule. No, we're not on time. Um, really, we should have been left there at half past nine this morning. But now we didn't leave there till 8, 10 to 10, uh, 11. So we are like an hour and 20 minutes behind time. So hopefully we can make that time up. Um, by going underneath some of these bridges and not going the back roads. 
Mick has to guide the yacht from Andal in Northamptonshire, 100 miles east, to the port of Ipswich in Suffolk. Overseen by a support car and a police escort. So there's a big old load to stop on the spot. So um, yeah, hopefully we shouldn't have to do any sharp braking at any time. To make up time, they need to take the shortest route involving B roads and low bridges. We've got a low bridge now coming up, so we're going to have to ease up, stop, lower lower the trailer to the floor, and then we'll proceed underneath very slowly by watching it as we go. Traffic is stopped in both directions. If Mick can't get the trailer low enough, he could cause catastrophic damage to the entire hull, costing hundreds of thousands of pounds. Bye, It's touch and go as he creeps forward, and Mick must rely on the support car to help him through. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Rescythe Dockyard, near Edinburgh, on the Firth of Forth. Wally, could you ask Kitty Week just to come clear the transom just now? Dockmaster John Aitken is leading a huge operation to move a three billion pound aircraft carrier out of a recently flooded dry dock. OK, well, I'm going to give some slack on the aft starboard transom line, so just get ready to let go. Stand by. Seven years after they started construction, mooring ropes are about to be dropped. I was just releasing the last the aft starboard line. There it goes. All stern lines are clear and now ashore. OK, stand by. A team of 40 people dockside and seven tug crews are responsible for getting her out safely. Um, we've had to clear an area that's safe for the, the tug to come in to secure to the ship. And once Kitty Wake's on, the only thing attached to Prince of Wales will be Kitty Wake. The Kitty Wake will be the only tug pulling her out into the basin. She has two 3,500cc engines, turning two and a half metre wide propellers more than capable of pulling all 55,000 tonnes of HMS Prince of Wales. Pilot, Rupert, you copy that, all lines away. All copy, Jock, uh, that's all lines away and clear of the vessel. Okay, Jock, we're all clear for now. We're going to start to uh, come out number one, Jock. Right, so it's start. Okay, Kitty Wake, 10% of stern, please. Three navigation pilots direct the Kitty Wake to make sure the aircraft carrier comes out dead straight. He's just started to move astern very slowly. One pilot up on the bridge and two more low down each side on specially built viewing platforms. I like it, it's slow and controlled. Very slowly, the aircraft carrier is pulled out into the basin at around half a mile an hour. It's vital to protect the side of the ship. We can see he's probably about 100 mil clearance between the side of the fender and the hull. So she's just gliding out, which is exactly what we'd like to see. And 10 metres below the surface, the bilge keels are just 50 centimetres from the concrete wall. We've got a mark on the hull where the bilge keels are, where we've got the narrowest point. So this is a key safety passing point right now. Slightly narrowest. It's obviously not taking much to move her because the Kitty 8 was only pulling minimum, so very little power. You don't want to get up too much momentum because it's difficult to stop. If the bilge keel hits the wall under the water, the damage will cost hundreds of thousands of pounds to repair. Um, a little bit nervous at this point. All eyes are on the marker for the widest point of the hull. Pass that blue, blue tape. Yes, so, yeah. Paul, that's the bilge keel's clear. Thank you. It's a huge relief for the team, and the pilots now have more room for manoeuvre. It'll count when you can, come on in. Going on, push on the barge, 40. Going on, push 40. As more of the Prince of Wales emerges into the basin, each tug supporting the kitty wake moves into position directed by the pilots. So right now this is probably the most delicate point of the manoeuvre as we continue to keep coming out straight from the dock. 
Domini on the hole, please. Just for info, that's the uh, quarry I'm finished with the barge, so he'll be making his way around to pick up the port tow shop. Half an hour after the move began, they're clear of the 300 metre long dry dock and out into the basin. Quite relieved, really. I mean, it's a bit unnervous seeing her come out. It's quite odd, actually, to see her come out as well. It's just quite bizarre. She must be turned 180 degrees, but the fog's testing both pilots and tugmasters to the limit. Chris Stutsbury's in charge of the Corrigan tug, now attached to the bow, helping to swing around towards her new berth. So have you got a bit of on the, the two barges there? How is she looking for the swing? Looking fine for the swing here. The, your bulb, I would say, is at least 100 metres clear of the barges. That's pretty fine. Obviously, you know, because she's so big, references of her size are very difficult. You can't see the bow, you can't see the stern, you can't see the, the opposite side. So you're very much constricted in what you can see. He's very slowly turning the bow of the aircraft carrier to starboard, the stern to port. He's ha almost halfway through the turn at the moment. He's coming through now. I'm just going to swing her up stern right to port now. Can you wait? Turn her stern. Dogmaster John Aitken must now get her safely berthed on the far side of the basin. Another four metres or so of the rest are on the fenders, which is good. And uh, everything appears to be clear. Okay, okay. One metre astern, one metre astern. Three and a half hours after they began, HMS Prince of Wales is in position for her final fit out. We're putting the storm lines in place. So these lines here are designed to hold the ship in a beam wind of over 100 miles an hour. Started in good weather, but as you probably saw, the, the fog came down. Probably a bit of a challenge, but uh, the job is finished. The tugs can regroup, but for the shipbuilder, it's now about adding 10,000 tonnes of military equipment and getting her moving under her own steam. Now that she's afloat, we're actually able to now commission the propulsion system and actually be able to then basically start the heartbeat of the ship, which is the engines and uh, the propulsion system, which we'll need for sea trials. A, a very hard task to achieve, but yet we've managed to get there, so totally, totally, totally over the moon with it, really, over the moon. HMS Prince of Wales won't be ready for sea trials until 2019, but by 2020, she'll be part of the Royal Navy with a squadron of 40 jet fighters capable of going anywhere in the world. The port of Goul, 40 miles east of Leeds. The UK's most inland port, 50 miles from the North Sea. A 300 tonne reel of steel cable must be loaded into the hold of the 90 metre long Dutch cargo vessel Filia Netti. But a broken down crane means the cable reel still hasn't gone anywhere. When the new crane arrives, operations manager Danny Skidmore needs it set up close to the vessel. But the reason we slew round so far is because we want to put as much weight uh, to the key edge as, as possible. With a 35 metre long boom, there's a danger the 90 ton crane could topple over without extra weight on the back. So we're unloading the, all the ballast sections now, load them up into this tray, 200 tonne of it. That's the next step. Once that's done, get the rigging on the hook and go for the lift. To pick up the 300 tonne reel, they need a six metre long spreader beam with loops of wire rope attached to each end. This is a spreader beam that goes down the, the length of the cable reel. So there'll be slings on the top and there'll be slings on the bottom. But before they can start, the marine warranty surveyor, Cameron Wright, needs to check the beam is safe. Make hell of a mess if it comes off. 300 tonne. <laughs> but there's an issue. The, the certificates that have been supplied for the spreader beam, uh, the, the numbering doesn't tie up with the, the uh, numbering on the spreader beam itself. Um, so without that matching up exactly, uh, 
wouldn't be able to let the lift go ahead because then We've all got to stop. Why? Because Ken said it's too dangerous. A typographical error causes another delay, but the team have to get the cable reel on board tonight. Bit more, bit more. Keep going, mate, go on. Keep going, keep going, keep going. With the right paperwork now in place, the spreader beam's rigged with two 150-tonne capacity bow shackles and two six-metre-long slings of heavy-duty steel rope. Uh, we've got the heavy haulage, guys. Uh, they've got the SPMT under the cable reel. Uh, they'll be lifting that up and getting it packed out so it's uh, nice and secure. Uh, and then once Osprey give us a nod and they're happy, we can send that across into the lift area. But just as they're all ready to go, the Filianetti's in the wrong place. Uh, the vessel's got to move slightly, uh, slightly to the west. That allow us to then slew the cable reel into place. Um, there might be a little bit of nudging with the vessel, uh, hopefully not, and hopefully we've done our maths properly, uh, and that should be fine. With the vessel now in the right position, the self-propelled modular trailer can finally roll the 300-ton steel cable drum into place below the spreader beam. Well, guys, just waiting for you now, mate. Rope off a bit, Mark, rope off. The beam is attached to the giant bobbin of steel cable by looping the wire rope slings around each end of the reel. Up on the rope a bit then, Mark, just take a little bit of weight. Finally, the giant roll of steel cable makes it safely into the hold at one in the morning, on its way to a new life in Mexico. Everyone's gone that extra mile uh, and everyone's conducted their job brilliantly, so I'm more than happy with it. Heading towards Ipswich on the A14, heavy haulage driver Mick Cullum is trying to squeeze a million pound yacht under a low bridge. The yacht is five meters high and Mick's just 10 centimeters away from causing serious damage. Yep, but all 20 meters of yacht make it through unscathed. How much did you only for that bridge, Wes? Yeah, like three or four inches. Yeah, so we had three or four inches underneath that bridge, so that bridge is about 18 foot two high. So all good. It's 11.30 in the morning, and Mick only has four and a half hours to get the yacht to the port of Ipswich. Um, if we get down to the port and it's too late, um, they're not allowed to lift after four o'clock. So if we get down there at four, um, They'll probably leave us till the next morning. There's nothing you can do about it. But Mick's route towards the coast, along the rural roads of Suffolk, isn't getting any easier. Once we go on the back roads then, and then I saw like narrow, twisty lanes, um, trees, so you just got to take a bit more time. All the hazards result in more delays, and the yacht arrives in Ipswich at five o'clock too late to lift it off the trailer. We're here a bit late, um, but that's the way it goes. We won't get off loaded till the morning, um, so we'd have to stay here the night, sleep in the old truck, and uh, off at eight o'clock, half eight in the morning. In the morning, they must get the boat off the trailer and into the fitting out area so she can be prepared for sea trials in three days' time. Just putting the slings underneath the boat to lift it off the trailer. So I'm just giving the guys a hand. Each polyester duplex sling is connected to a bar to spread the load. These straps are 12 tonnes, they're in a basket, they give you 24 tonne in a basket. So most of them are 12 tonne each. So you can pick up a fair bit of weight with these ones. A diesel engine provides power to a hydraulic system, which lifts the 30-ton yacht using winches and wire rope. Once I got it off the trailer, Clem and the trailer, I was just slowly pull up there at the way and so I pulled my trailer up. 
the million pound yacht travels the last few meters by air and into the fitting out area. In three days, she's due to begin sea trials, but she's still not ready to take to the water. Uh, just unwrapping the boat, ready for the guys to come and uh, work on it. The team are under pressure to finish the yacht. The radar arch, taken off for the road trip, must be reinstalled alongside extra electronics and more boat furniture. The new owner expects perfection. And 72 hours later, yacht developer Lawrence Pask is back for the big reveal. He's got a container ship to go on to as well, so he's got to get there, so it's going to uh, USA, so we've got to get things done here and get it right, right first time. So that's what we we're up against. Another ship leaving. <laughs> a million pounds worth of British built yacht is in the water for the first time. To see it going like that, it's where it belongs, isn't it, on the water. And see it in the factory, you don't appreciate it till it's out there where it's going to live for the rest of its life, so. She was designed by an Italian and lovingly built over five months. But it's the end of another relationship for Lawrence. She's, she's a lovely girl, yeah, she's lovely. She, yeah, she's spot on. She sits in the water lovely. We don't give her a name, it's up to the owner. They pick the name. This time on Mega Shippers, harbour master Stephen Scally has the economic future of a Scottish town in his hands as he prepares to export three offshore wind towers. I'm always nervous with these size of ships coming in. Anything go wrong, then it could be a disaster. On the Humber Estuary, just outside Grimsby, heavy haulage man Terry Savory winches 130 tonnes of locomotive onto a narrow trailer. Just coming up to the jump rail now, Jamie. And in Sussex, unload supervisor Robin Merry is under pressure to reap rewards from old soil. If it doesn't make our cargo, it costs everyone money. We're out on the wire, that's for normal with shipping. Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume. One miscalculation... No, 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 no. I've got ten metres to go ahead! One change in conditions... I started to completely fell down. ..could spell disaster. Mother Nature stamped her feet. ..with reputations... ..and lives on the line. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the mega shippers. Campbelltown in the west of Scotland, on the southern tip of the Kintyre Peninsula. A natural harbour known for exporting whisky is now home to a new industry, making offshore wind turbines. CS Wind are building 200 towers over the next two years. Huge sheets of steel are pressed into sections and welded together. Each tower made up of three pieces up to 36 metres long. Each individual tube coated in zinc, aluminium and three layers of sunshine resistant paint. Three new towers in nine sections are ready to be exported and installed in the Irish Sea as part of a new wind farm for the power company Orsted. But the only way they can be transported is by sea. The cargo vessel Rotravente is heading into harbour to pick up the towers and take them to Belfast ahead of installation. Good morning, Camelton Harbour. Yes, good morning, sir. The pilot will board on arrival. Guiding the vessel through the estuary and into the harbour is navigation pilot Robert Keir. Yeah, I arrived in town last night and there was about 25 knots of easterly wind. Uh, we made a real tricky job today, but we've just, just this morning, it's just turned flat calm for us. So we've got this weather window. With the weather due to stay calm, Robert takes the pilot's motor launch to meet the cargo ship and get on board. 
Harbour Master Stephen Scally stays dockside to check everything's ready. Today we've got uh, one of our large ships coming in to load the uh, offshore towers. And uh, the ship, she's 142 metres long and she's 6,500 tonnes. For this ship, the navigation is quite easy, it's more the berthing. That's the challenge, that's why we have tugs and pilots. It's a one and a half mile journey out to join the Dutch cargo ship Rotra Vente. Uh, captain of a ship should know his ship very, very well, but the captain cannot be expected to know every port in the world that he may go to on an intimate basis, so therefore the pilot's hired to guide him through the most dangerous part of the trip, which is the last, the last bit with shallow water and fast currents and things, you know. But it's a very big ship for the size of port, so it's quite a tricky job. We'll climb up the ladder, go on the ship, it's quite dangerous. Yeah, unfortunately there, there are deaths every year. We lost one of our colleagues in London this year, falling off a ladder. You just have to be very careful. With the Rotter Vente travelling at around five miles an hour, the pilot launch must pull alongside, matching the cargo ship's speed. OK, guys. It's a critical manoeuvre. Morning, OK, sir. morning, sir. Thank you. Board, Thank you very much. Yeah, Harbour Master Pilot, uh, Stephen aboard Abima Devar Island, uh, all good, 6.3 max. No known defects, and uh, on they went to you. Back on the dockside, Harbour Master Stephen Scally must get the 142 metre long Rotra Vente safely docked. Well, we're not a massive harbour, but yeah, it's a very big ship for us. I'm always uh, nervous with these size of ships coming in because these situations, quite a lot of things could go wrong. If you hadn't get tugs, anything go wrong, then it could be a disaster. Communication between the tug captain and the pilot is crucial as the rope's attached. Yeah, just stretching the gear now, Bob. Stretching the gear, thank you. Tug is fast, captain. OK. All right, Harbour. Harbour, pilot. Probably about 15 minutes away from uh, entering now. The German captain, Derek Snyder, is relying on Robert's local knowledge of the shallow waters surrounding the harbour. We're going to come up, not heading for the port, but heading further to starboard to give us uh, the sea room to, uh, to swing and be more or less lined up already for the head of the berth as we go through. So we're not turning as we go in the port. Best to, to turn in the wide area and we'll be already be lined up by the time we get to the port. The Rotra Vente is 142 metres long and weighs 6,500 tonnes empty. The captain brings her into Campbelltown Harbour at three miles an hour. A tug on standby close behind, ready to slow her down if she approaches too fast. For these size of ships, yeah, it's pretty difficult for them to stop. It'll take a, it'll take a wee bit of distance for them to stop, so that's why we've got to make sure at all times we've got these size of ships in, the channel's clear. Going clear? Okay. The most difficult part for this berthing is, is the actual ship to come in between the two piers here. There's not a lot of distance between the two piers. You've got 64 metres and you've got a, a ship there at 20 metres beam, okay? The tug's going to help with the ship for turning and its manoeuvrability to come in between these two piers, this narrow entrance, to get berthed up safely alongside the berth here. It's a huge challenge to get the 21 metre wide ship through the harbour entrance. There's just 22 metres either side of the vessel, but the captain is in full control. If the tug's going to slow us down off, Captain, no need to worry about right hand of the yeah, 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 uh, thing. So. If, if, if I would need a tug, I will let you know. Yeah, that's fine. The oil will stop, so. Bring on, Stephen. Thanks. Uh, how many metres to come ahead, roughly? Two five. Two five ahead. Two okay. five. Twenty-five metres ahead. Okay. Okay. And please keep watching on the starboard side. Built in 1758, Campbelltown Harbour was never intended for a ship this size. 
but even at 142 metres long, there's still only room for three offshore wind turbines. Five metres, pilot, five metres. Five metres ahead. Five. In position, pilot, in position. OK, keep in fast. position, make fast. That's the ship in position now, so once the ship comes alongside, we'll get the rest of the ropes out, head lines, stern lines and breast lines, and get the ship secure alongside. Can't relax yet until all the lines are ashore and fast. But at the moment, it's looking good. <laughs> I'm quite happy. <laughs> OK, pilot, all good, in position. That's it. That's me happy now. That's a, that's a headline ashore, stern lines ashore, two springs ashore. So that's the vessel moored safely alongside and everything's secure. So I'm a happy man. Ever make good. Time for a cup of tea. With the Rotravente docked, she's ready to get the three turbines in nine pieces secured on deck. Loading's due to begin first thing in the morning, but some of the sections are still at the factory five miles away. the port of Immingham on the Humber estuary near Grimsby, handling 55 million tonnes of cargo every year. The Stena Fortella roll-on roll-off ferry has docked. A class 66 locomotive owned by the rail haulage firm Freightliner needs to be loaded on board to go to Germany ahead of starting work in Poland. Train driver and engineer Simon Grego is in charge of the move. This is a locomotive, it is not a train. It actually runs on its own power and it hasn't got any vehicles attached to it. If it had vehicles attached to it, it'd be a train. If not, it's a locomotive. It's a heavy locomotive, it's designed to move heavy trains. Anything up to 3,000 tonnes in the UK and our European operations can be up to 5,000 tonnes train weight. It's 127 tonnes in weight, 3,300 horsepower. It's got 12 cylinders and it's a two-stroke engine. It was built by Americans in Canada. She's 21 metres long, almost two and a half metres wide, with a top speed of 65 miles per hour. I've been a railwayman for 37 years, straight from school. Um, uh, my granddad was a railwayman, so it's, it's partly in the family. The locomotive's reached the end of the tracks and needs to be put on a trailer to get on the ferry. But when she arrives in Cuxhaven in Germany, she'll need to get to Poland by rail under her own power. So if it starts. This is not started. She's not wanting to play. You can't jump start them. If she's broken down, the whole delivery might have to be called off. Well, I've reset it, so I'm going to try again. See if she'll this time. That's a good noise. I said it's going to start. There's no running, so we're okay. So there's no problems there. We'll just get the brakes set and we should be fine. So what I'm about to do now is just release the brakes to make sure they won't come on when we're moving it at all. But the locomotive's not going anywhere until Terry Savory from Alalee's Heavy Haulage has moved her onto a unique modular trailer with 10 independently steerable and height adjustable axles. It's designed to carry the weight of every loco that's ever been built on the, in the UK. And it's just perfect for what we use it for. Terry and the team have to put together a 16 meter long rail track ramp, creating a 2.8 degree slope up to the trailer. That way a bit, Dave. They need to get a move on. The Stena Fortella ferry leaves in five hours, but the locomotive must be ready to load two hours before she sets sail. The ferry is five o'clock this evening. It should take us no more than three hours to load this, hopefully. They can't get the measurements wrong. 
the ramp must be perfectly aligned with the trailer. The only connection between ramp and transporter are two loose sections of rail track. This is what we call a jump rail. We've just put that in. Now I'm going to position the trailer so there's a little gap either side and then we're ready to winch the loco on. If the trailer and ramp aren't the same height, the locomotive could fall off the rails. Yeah, we uh, just adjust the height and then we'll have one more final check and then we're ready to winch. OK, Jamie. That's all, we, that's all we have to do. Is a 25 ton winch cable. We only require maximum, I believe, an eight ton winch to winch this up. Even though it's 130 ton, we're not lifting it, we're just moving it. So it doesn't require a lot of uh, power. With the winch in place and tension on the steel rope, they can begin to pull a 127 ton load up on the ramp. OK, Jamie, whenever you're ready. Keep going, Jamie, you're two foot from the rail. OK, yeah, all good at this then, mate. If the winch breaks, it could roll back onto the dockside. The only backup to keep 127 tonnes of locomotive in place a two kilogram metal chalk. Solely for safety. It doesn't need it, but it's just better to be safe. You're just coming up to the jump rail now, Jamie. As the locomotive approaches the jump rails, it's a critical moment. With the team listening carefully as it creeps along the track. All the banging and cracking is just the ramp on the rail and on the stones that you haven't seen. It's not the ramp breaking. At this point, you wonder, will it fit the trailer? If it doesn't, Terry will have to reassess the whole lift. The ferry's leaving at 5 o'clock, and they must have the locomotive loaded up two hours before departure. Campbelltown, West Scotland. The Rotravente is ready to be loaded with three wind turbines, but some of the sections are still five miles away at the factory. After making land-based wind turbines for over 16 years, the company are now making offshore towers, which are almost twice the size, generating four times the power. A big moment for CS Wind and coordinator Leslie Black. Well, today we're shipping out our first offshore wind turbine tower. It's the first of its kind that has been made here in the UK, and this is the first time that we'll be shipping to the harbour in Campbelltown. The towers will form part of the 207 turbine Walney Wind Farm in the Irish Sea off the coast of Cumbria. Each tower has a rotor diameter of 120 metres, with a maximum height of 150 metres and below the waterline, up to 50 metres of foundations down to the seabed. Three new offshore towers are ready to be delivered, each one in three sections. Twice the size of the land-based wind turbines also made on site. The biggest challenge is the size of the sections. Uh, they're almost double the size of what we're used to handling. The largest sections are 36 metres long, and need to travel by road to the harbour, coordinated by transport manager, James McKinna. This is a 136 tonne, six metre diameter section, um, all prepped, ready for shipping. First stage of moving this section is uh, positioning our two reach stackers at either end to do a tandem lift. Each section must be moved by two unique lifting vehicles, known as reach stackers, that can lift 155 tonnes each. It's a very complex tandem lift between two operators, Campbell McBrain. Aye, right, Craig. And Craig Connor. OK, Campbell, I'll just get the far away side. Each section of the tower is protected by a steel H-frame. So 
So now I'm just going to lift up and pull out until my attachments are in position. Both reed stackers must hook under the metal rim. So that's me. I'm happy that my attachments are in position. So me and Campbell just begin to lift in tandem. Now how are you looking, Craig? I'm ready to lift you as you are. You guys happy, aye? Aye, fine, aye, aye. Maybe we'll shoot this wee slope. Why should we doing this slope? We're fine. OK, come on. Each section is worth around £200,000. Any mistake now would be a disaster. Craig spots it's not level and could crash to the ground. Oh, Craig, oh, no, 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 no. With the section now level, they need to get it to the warehouse to prepare it for road transport to the harbour. You are in, you are in. So what we're aiming to do here is reduce the swing of the tower because of the movement we've got coming down that hill. So we need to keep that to a minimum. Campbell started turning already. One of the operators has started turning. Once he's signaled to Craig, Craig will start the manoeuvre to push the tower around to, towards the building. All 136 tonnes is lowered onto specially designed self-propelled rotators, which take them into the warehouse on a set of inbuilt rails. So, first section's in. We're doing well, but we can't really afford delays. Fingers crossed. The Rotter Avente is ready to leave, and the sections need to be driven to the harbour, but they're so big, they can only be moved at night. The port of Immingham, near Grimsby. A 127-ton locomotive is being winched onto a modular trailer by heavy haulage specialist Terry Savory. The last one's just going over the jump rail. The last of the axles are almost there. Go on then, Jamie. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. That'll do. And that's it. All winched on. The loco's heading across the North Sea to Germany and needs to be securely fastened to the trailer. These are chains and binders, as we call them, and we're going to put 16 onto it. If I could find room to put 18 or 20 on, I would. These lashings, we can put eight ton onto them, each one, quite comfortably, without stretching them, without causing any problems at all. With the Class 66 firmly strapped down, Terry must get a move on to make the boat. The trip to Germany is something else. They have a good and a bad boat, and we never know which one we're going to have. The bad boat isn't too pleasant. You're lucky if you have a TV that works. It's definitely not a P&O cruise. Far from it. The locomotive will be the heaviest individual item on board the Stena Fatella, and cargo superintendent Anders Mikhail has prioritised the load. It's not that easy. With, with uh, special projects, it's always a bit more calculations to be done. The truck, trailer and locomotive have a combined weight of 200 tonnes. We will take into consideration deck strength, uh, stability issues. I mean, it's that heavy and it's above the water line, so it will obviously have a great impact on the stability of the vessel. Stress on the ramp, can the ramp take it? Uh, will I affect uh, the cargo operation, the time uh, it will take to load? The inner deck is 25 meters wide, but Anders needs the locomotive on the reinforced central area to stop the ferry leaning to one side. I'm going to place the locomotive here in the centre of two lanes for the good lashing angles. And the strength and area here on this ship is between frame 12 and 70. So I'm going to make sure that we don't go any further or any more off than that area. The winter weather in the North Sea is also a factor when calculating the lashing. 
per unit this heavy and especially this high, uh, we have not only the chance of it slipping sideways, we have to have the chance of it tipping over. So we're going to need to put additional top lashings to prevent just that tipping effect. OK, so we're ready to load you now. What I'd like you to do is just pull around the corner and then you're just going to reverse on the ship. Middle of two lanes, starboard side. OK, sir. OK. Terry has to reverse the loco up the ramp at a maximum of four miles per hour. Yeah, go on, keep going, mate. Joel, healing. Minus point three. Point three. There's no margin for error as the 10 axle, 80 wheel trailer goes into position backwards. So in the end, I would like him right between these two lanes, yeah? yeah. Keep going over slowly, Terry. Keep going, mate. A couple of inches to the right or left, and Terry will have to start all over again. That's perfect, alignment yeah. like that, yeah, good. Go on. You can stop him here by this, this line here. That's fine. A safe arrival on board. That's it, job done now. We've uh, got this onto the ship. The stevedores are lashing it to the floor. And then all we have to do is go and do a 24-hour boat ride to Germany and then repeat it all over again to offload. At exactly 5 o'clock, the hydraulic ramp on the Stena Fortella is drawn up and she set sail for the journey across the North Sea to Cuxhaven in Germany. The Class 66 locomotive destined for a new life in Poland as part of Freightliner's rail haulage fleet. Campbelltown, West Scotland, home of CS Wind, a plant making wind turbine towers to be installed out at sea. The last two of nine separate sections heading for Belfast have been mounted on seven axle hydraulic modular drawbar trailers. The convoy is almost 90 meters long and weighs 240 tons. The sections are so large, all the roads must be closed for the journey to the harbor. They can only travel at night, escorted by three police cars. At 10 o'clock, the convoy's ready to go. Going out, we have two mid-sections, the middle part of a three-section tower. These sections are 27 metres long. Um, they weigh about 125 tonnes each, six metres in diameter. So, yeah, they're pretty big bits of kit to be moving along a small country road. It's a five-mile journey to Campbelltown Harbour. Yeah, we're off, travelling about five miles an hour. They're taking up the entire road, um, and obviously with the height of them, they, they need to take it easy. Um, don't want to hit any, any potholes or dips in the road. It's the biggest heavy haulage operation Campbelltown has ever seen. We're now entering the town, um, and we've got a lot more obstacles to navigate here. The team at the harbour are relying on them being there on time. Any delays now um, to the convoy would we'd have a knock-on effect at the harbour. The streets are narrow. On some corners, just a few metres to play with. But thanks to the skillful driving of the team from ALE, they arrive at Campbelltown Harbour after an hour and a half. The convoy successfully made it in just around about one and a half hours. The sections will wait here overnight, um, and then when it gets light in the morning, they're going to be loaded with cranes onto the ship and then head off to Belfast. It's a massive relief, and um, we're all feeling very proud that it's all gone really well. The following morning, with all nine sections of the three complete wind turbine towers in port, they must now be loaded onto the Rotravente. 
this ship is especially suited to carry wind turbines because the main deck has been strengthened because the weight of these turbines is quite heavy, up to 400 tons. And uh, well, you can imagine if you place such heavy units on the main deck, that there might be a risk that the main deck just gets damaged, bent. The cargo vessel has a special sliding roof, a reinforced deck 100 meters long and 20 meters wide ready to receive three wind turbine towers broken down into nine separate sections. They want to start loading by crane on the forward part and then they even will drive all the towers uh, section by section to the aft just to place them in the right position and then they just continue uh, this way until all nine sections have been loaded. In charge of lifting all nine pieces on board, a specialist heavy lifting team but they've only got 48 hours to get them loaded before the Rotravente must leave for Belfast. Lift supervisor Charlie Powell is, all right there, lads? Yeah. is in charge of a team of eight and two crane drivers. Yeah, it's coming in now. We're just bringing it into position now. Each crane has a tool known as a J-hook to slot inside the rim of the tubular section. Just a matter of pulling tarp back, Joe, we'll be able to guide it in there enough with tag lines, but just getting tarp out of way. Yeah, Joe's going to go up there, he's going to uh, get the j hook into position, pull the tarp all in out of the way so we can attach the j hook, attach the lifting tackle. We'll take about 10 tonne of weight on it just to make sure we've got a secure grip of the j hook. It's quite important, it gets it right in the middle of the place and it pulls it up. Uh, it, pulls it up square then. If you get it too far to one side, it'll want to slightly roll the H-frame a little bit. So as long as it gets the J-hook in the middle of the H-frame, everything should be good. But transport supervisor Joe Ryan must get the measurements exactly right to get the J-hook in place under the beam. We just check the flange. A precise fit is crucial for a safe lift. And then, and then just check it, it should be right. But the J-hook won't slot under the circular rim of the wind turbine. We like to have it right. If it's going to go, we'll have it right. You can't just say, well, it'd be all right. If it, isn't, if it doesn't look right, it usually isn't right. Whether it's a bag of sugar or it's a tower section, uh, you've got to have the right tackle for the job and, uh, and use it correctly. If the J-hook's not positioned properly, the lift can't go ahead. It's like, it's, it's like perfect fit, but I need a couple of mil. It's like it's just 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 right, not a fit. It should go on. It should do, but it's not. <laughs> Does the uh, cambered bit sit on the bottom of the tower? Yeah. Spring. Yeah. We're going to bring it down to the floor and have a look at it. See if there's uh, anything snagging it. It is a little bit annoying, but uh, it's always better to check. If the J hook fails none of the giant steel tubes can get on board. We've seen a little bit of damage on the uh, on the J-hook, on the pad here. It's uh, obviously been caught at some point there and uh, it's sheared a nut off there, so it's just causing the J-hook when it sits down not to sit correctly. If they can't fix it, the lift can't take place and there's still another eight sections to load. We're going to uh, take this pad off because it's worn at the top. I think we're going to look, see if we can turn it round and use the bit that isn't worn. The small piece of plastic padding is delaying the entire two million pound operation. These things happen. You can't just ignore it. It's got to be dealt with and dealt with in the proper way. But turning the pad round doesn't work. They need to borrow the pad from the other side. Is it's running repairs, uh, they're not a standard stock item that people carry. You can't nip down to being killed and buy one of these. So, uh, yeah, we've just got to make sure it's repaired and done in the correct way. About right, that? You sure? Yeah. With the nylon pad swapped around, it's time to try again. All right, Callum, you can check it up, pal. It should work now, we've swapped the uh, plate over so we've got a good nylon pad at the other side now rather than the damaged one, so confident it should go straight in this time. If it doesn't, we're struggling. <laughs> Fingers crossed.
Because it's a bit hard from down here. Joe's has got the eyes up there, so we're, we can only guess what Joe's seeing. So what, get it? The rim of the turbine section is still not sliding down into the receiving slot of the J-hook. It's a major setback, putting the whole loading operation in jeopardy, leaving the wind turbine towers stuck dockside. So that's not right. Just not playing ball. Shoreham Port, in the south of England. The general cargo ship, Wilson Garston, has arrived from the Netherlands. 83 metres long and 13 metres wide. On board, 2,700 tonnes of old soil. Recycled soil is now a valuable commodity in the brick manufacturing industry. Offload supervisor Robin Merry must get the material dockside ready to be taken away by lorry. It basically originates from the inside of grow bags. Once it's been used and there's no nutrients left in it at all, it's then placed in a pole and brought over as a bulk cargo to show on port. After a year growing tomatoes in the Netherlands, the soil has arrived cleaned up and shredded. Obviously, every, every business now wants to see things recycled and we're very hot on it. It feels like just basically with dirt, which is, has had all the moisture taken out of it. Where it's been used for growing of the plants, you can still see the bits and twigs in it. But you see, it's just like a lot lighter now and it's devoid of any nutrients now. Now used to make thermalite bricks to build houses. Be part of this process of using material that once would have been landfilled and now we can actually reuse it and turn it into blocks. It's good for the future. The cargo vessel must leave on the high tide at six o'clock. The team have got just seven hours left to discharge the remaining soil. The main tool for the job, a mobile gantry crane weighing 180 tonnes. It can reach out 26 metres over the vessel and lift up to 30 tonnes. Crane operator Kenny Feeney must do a grab a minute to keep up with the schedule. The grab at the moment is picking up roughly three and a half tonnes at a time. And the cargo on board the ship, there's just under 3,000 tonnes. What you're trying to do is not overfill the grab because it, it's light and dusty so you don't want it blown all over the place. You try and make as little mess as possible. I wouldn't be popular if something like that happened. Dockside, the soil is stacked up to seven metres high. We're probably three quarters away, if not further than that, through the operation. Uh, we've probably got well over 2,000 tonnes, probably nearer 2,500 tonnes off. As the soil's discharged, the ship's losing weight and becoming unstable. We're down below the four metre mark. So the lighter it gets, the more buoyant it gets and the more likely it is to rock backwards and forwards. Every time he goes to get a grab out there, it rocks side to side, quite violently. With the vessel now swinging from side to side, the operation's becoming more precarious by the minute. You're always keeping an eye on the trim of the ship, whether it's leaning to the left, to the right, to try and keep the ship as level as possible at all times. You can't switch off because you don't want to damage the ship. But the five-ton bucket must get as close to the hold walls as possible to get every last grab. The aim is to get as much of this out as we can because otherwise you're just wasting money. Every last bit costs, it's all money. Despite the increased risk, time is pressing. We're looking like we can get dark in the next hour or so and we have a pilot book for about four hours' time where the ship's now got to be taken up the harbour, it's got to be spanned round and taken out. If we miss that tide, it won't sail for another 12 hours. We're definitely up against it a bit more now. This ship could really do with leaving tonight. It really has to get on. It has another cargo to go to. And if it doesn't make that other cargo, it costs everyone money. Right on the wire, that's for normal with shipping. Yeah, right on the barn line. Campbelltown Harbour, West Scotland. Three offshore wind turbines have been separated into nine sections and are due to be loaded on board the Rotter Avente. It's nearly there. But lift supervisor Charlie Powell has a problem with the J-hook at the end of the crane's lifting chain. Everything needs a knock-on effect. It slows down the loading up of the ship. It's affecting the guys because obviously it's still on the transport on the quay side. These guys want to be going and getting ready for the next piece. Ultimately, it all comes down to the ship sailing on time, but 
Unfortunately, these things are sent to trayers. If they can't fix it, the wind turbine sections won't be getting on board. See what I mean? Supervisor Ian Ritchie opens up the bolts to widen the hook to try to get it attached. How's that, Skip? Yeah, that's it. How's that? In, yeah? How come it's fitting now, then? Just made it bigger. Happy. It takes them an hour to fix, but it's a successful repair. Just got a slight difference in the flange thickness. Uh, so all we've done is just open the drawer up a little bit to give us a bit more tolerance and ensure it's engaged properly. Uh, so now we're good to go. Despite the challenges, they're on schedule. We're back on track now. We're just going to take a little bit away in uh, the cranes at each end, release the uh, anchoring bolts. OK, Callum, if you can just nip it up for me nice and steady, Callum. Keep your radius and just nip it up for me nice and steady, pal. We'll just uh, get it slightly floating, mate. That's, That's lovely, Graham. Keep coming like that, pal. That's lovely, mate. Uh, free slow, Graham. Keep slowing round to your right, Callum. Nice and steady, pal. Keep coming, pal. The section of wind turbine tower weighs 137 tonnes. It's 27 metres long and 6 metres high. Lifted in tandem by two mobile cranes. Skip, can I lose a bit of height off Callum, mate? You're a little bit low on your left-hand side, pal. Charlie must get each section landed in the right place on deck. With the section safely on board, Transport Supervisor Joe Ryan still has to get them stowed in the right place using four axle self-propelled modular trailers known as SPMTs. The A-shaped attachment on top of the SPMT locks into the end of the turbine section. So the A-frame's the adapter that sits on top of the SPMT. Once they're down and touching, put two pins that sit in the top of the frame. They're, they're the pins that take the weight of the frame. So when we pick up our trailer, the pins on the airframe pick up the H-frame, picks up the tower. Two transporters, one on each end, lift the wind turbine section just a few centimetres above the deck. 16 wheels across four axles, rolling in parallel, manoeuvre the steel tube. The biggest challenge moving into space, we've got to move into, we've got quite big constraints and we've literally got mills and inches of space either side. If the operator or the spotter has a lapse in judgement and they, they, they go off and miss a slightly, they could be crashing into something. Obviously the stuff we're moving is worth millions and millions of pounds and one tiny little bit of damage can be massive drama in the long run. There's no margin for error as the transporters creep forward at less than half a mile an hour into the section's allotted area on deck. Bit more. Bring it left a bit, Sam. Come down on Alpha Bravo, Scott. The deck is 20 metres across. With each tower six metres wide, there's just 60 centimetres gap between each piece. By the end of the day, three sections are safely loaded and lashed. It's gone pretty well today. We had a few issues which we overcame, uh, but we've caught the schedule up. Hopefully we'll get everything uh, back to normal. The ship will leave on time. We've all got our fingers and toes. We've done our little bit for global warming, so it's been a good day. The following evening, the Rotteravente is fully loaded, on time, with all nine sections. A miraculous recovery, given the delays. She's 1,170 tonnes heavier than when she arrived, and ready for the journey to Belfast. The first complete wind turbine towers made in Britain, heading for the Irish Sea. Shoreham Port, East Sussex. The Wilson Garston is almost empty. 2,600 tonnes of old soil is dockside. But the last 100 tonnes is still on board, 
and the boat carrier has to leave in four hours. Supervisor Robin Merry must go into the hold to make sure every last ton comes off the boat. We're going into the ship's hold now. We're going to enter the man cage. Hopefully not like that. Maybe. Yeah, I'm going in that one. <laughs> there you go. Does that, does that fill you? Does that fill you with confidence? Just to take us into the vessel ship. It's far quicker than using the ladders. It's far safer. We'll just get ourselves in. Definitely, this is one. This is one to test your little nerve out a little bit now. That's it. Bit of an experience, isn't it? Eh? <laughs> Every day. Terrific view. You can see over the top of the whole harbour now. That's it. Just get ready for a slight jolt as we hit the bottom. There you go. That's lovely. Right, we let ourselves out. <coughs> if I can. There we go. And now we're in the, the hold of the vessel. Basically, most of the hold of the ship is empty now. Most of the rock wall's out. But what we're going to do now is we're going to bring the bobcat in and it's just going to sweep up the bits on the edge of the ship now. This along the edge here, this is where the crane, the grab can't reach, whereas the bobcat with a small bucket can reach. So he's going to push it up and down the side of it into piles so the crane can remove it. Luckily, he doesn't have to do it by hand. A three-ton Bobcat skid steer loader with a 46-horsepower engine is the only way they can clear the hold in the three hours they have left. Here we go. We're just going to stand back and let him do his thing now. Push the cargo up to this side of the hold so we can take it out with a grab. So he's just going to start moving it up a bit at a time. And we're just going to stand clear. The Bobcat's perfect for this job. It's a small, nimble piece of machinery, which is able to get right to the sides of the ship and push it all up. It, sa it saves a lot of time and effort by hand, having to sweep by hand. Driver Jay Collins has limited room for manoeuvre and only a couple of hours to stack the remaining compost for the crane. It's all driven with by the hand. It's got nothing to do with the feet, not like a car where you got your gas and your brake. It's just literally the same controls as a tank. So you lose control with the, uh, with the slidiness, but you just got to try and catch it a little bit. Oh, there we go. All right. Get down. Shove them in quickly. Can be a bumpy job, but it's all right. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. I like that bit. That bit's bumpy. Don't like bumpy bits. The hold must be completely emptied before the ship leaves in two hours, and the crew have to pitch in with shovels. But there's an issue. Right, slight problem we got in a minute. Slight issue is, I say, the height of the, the height of the cargo going up the side of the ship is caught in, sort inside some of the ruts of the ship, and we can't clear it. It's way beyond our height of working. Far too dangerous. So we're going to liaise with the guys in the ship and the captain and see if we can come to the solution. They've got any equipment to help us. We can't get it. They'd have to come and have a go. A quick solution. A pole, some gaffer tape and a trowel. All this multi-million pound equipment, two sticks have arrived and we're back in business. With the improvised tools, the hold will be properly cleared out and the team can finish the job. A really successful day. We're on the last couple of grabs out of the ship now. The ship's going to be away on time. That's the main thing. Spot on, no, no delays whatsoever and everyone's safe and well, and we'll be home for dinner in about the next 20 minutes. Quayside, the lorries are already rolling through to take 30 tonnes at a time to the brick factory, 100 miles down the coast. Yeah, it's great to see, isn't it? It's great to see. This, this is what this world's about now. Recycling is what this is all about. We need to look after our planet. Over the last hour, before high tide, the hold is completely cleared out. All 2,700 tonnes discharged in 12 hours. But this isn't a one-off event. By nightfall, the Wilson Garston returns to the Netherlands to collect more soil to be recycled into bricks for a greener construction industry in Britain. This time on Megashippers. In Redcar on England's northeast coast, 
Ukraine driver Simon Swan has just three days to unload 75,000 tonnes of coal in 40 mile an hour winds. When you first start coming up the crane and you can feel the cab shake and you think, oh my God, it's going to drop off into the ship. In Southampton, loadmaster Shane Brearley's battling choppy waters as he lifts a 15 million pound super yacht onto a transport ship. It's choppy, the, the tide is actually pushing in the belt, everyone's pushing up against the boat. And also on England's south coast, in Shoreham Port, diver Ryan Baker braves sub-zero water temperatures to urgently find the cause of an expanding hole in the lock. <laughs> Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume. One miscalculation... No, 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 no. I've got 10 metres to go ahead! ..one change in conditions... It started to completely fell down. ..put spell disaster... Mother Nature stamped her feet... ..with reputations... ..and lives on the line. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the mega shippers. Redcar Bulk Terminal on the banks of the River Tees near Middlesbrough. Dockside supervisor Neil Young and his team unload up to 4 million tonnes of loose bulk material every year from salt to iron ore. In the next few hours, a huge delivery of coal is arriving from Louisiana, USA. Today we're expecting 75,000 tonnes of coal to come in from the US on the ship Antonio. And that's due in uh, Old Bay about 12 o'clock today and then we'll berth in about 4 o'clock when we get the pilots and the tides right for the ship to come in. As dockside supervisor, it's down to Neil to get the cargo vessel berthed next to the two 70-metre-tall gantry cranes his team will use to unload the coal. The cranes are rail-mounted gantry grab cranes. We've both got a grab on each. Well, the grabs they can do about well, 1,000 tonne an hour, free range grabbing, been here forever. They've basically been the workhorse of the entire plant. If it could come in a bulk form, we can grab it and they will just work and work and work. They have a bit of a niggle soon because they are a bit old, but they're, they do the job, they do the job really well, to be honest. They go in and just grab the stuff. After a 12-day trip from America, the Antonia, a 230-metre-long bulk cargo vessel carrying 75,000 tonnes of coal destined for the northeast power plants that must be unloaded in just three days. The winter means there's more demand on power stations, so they need additional fuel. On board, an international crew, unfamiliar with the waters surrounding the port at Redcar. So they'll be guided into the bulk terminal by a local navigation pilot. Red bridge, red bridge. All ease on the bow now, sir, all ease. Oh, they're, they're huge, these ships. For, me, for a fire, it doesn't look as good. But when it gets closer, you don't realise how big they are. And then when you get on board, they're even bigger. She's been pulled in with three tugs. We've got one on the, on the front, we've got two in the aft there. And then there can be moved over it to push the, push the board in towards the quay. It amazes me, they're made out of steel and they're full of 75,000 tonnes of coal. I don't know what to do. What happens when you put something metal in the bath? It sinks. I don't understand how it works, but it does. Three 4,000 horsepower tugs, directed by the pilot, must control the Antonia's speed and direction to get her berthed. The tugs are uh, putting it into position more than anything else. There's still a lot of power that's in the ship and that's been slowed down now. And then when it gets a bit closer, which it is now, the tugs will move along to the other side and start pushing it in this way. They need to get the Antonia quayside as quickly as possible as the wind is picking up and forcing the ship away from shore. So what I was looking about is there, so it must be, it's difficult for like, the tugs to uh, go against the waves that are coming in. Ah, good afternoon, Q8. But once the tugs have pulled the vessel close enough, 
they hand off the mooring ropes to the team on the dock. Uh, she's doing fine. She's a couple of minutes off the berth now. She's getting the main ropes out and tighten her up. She's, she's my well, wasn't it? She'll do. I'm happy with it. It's a lot bigger when it gets up close. It's quite impressive, the size of it. They've got just 72 hours to unload 75,000 tonnes of coal. And the key to a successful operation is communication. The language barrier doesn't really make, make that much of an issue. You, you get across somehow, but you want. I don't speak any languages, I struggle with English. <laughs> Neil needs to get the gangway attached to get on board and talk through the offload. But there's already some debate about where it should go. If they're late starting, they'll put pressure on the offload team, who only have three days to unload the ship. The port of Southampton, Hampshire, in the middle of the south coast on the English Channel. Since 1843, the Deepwater port has been one of the UK's busiest. Southampton manages more than 200 vessels a day, from oil tankers to roll-on, roll-off ferries to container ships, handling over 14 million tonnes of cargo every year. Jumbo's heavy lift vessel, MV Fairplayer, is in port. 145 metres long, with a 26 metre wide top deck, the ship has been converted to transport super yachts around the world. It's a very complicated job. There's lots of tasks to be done. From 7 o'clock this morning, there's cradles, there's timber, there's the ship to prepare, there's cranes to prepare, there's the, the yachts to prepare, we've got divers to prepare. There's lots of work going on even before I start the job. On the horizon, a brand new Sunseeker, worth nearly £15 million. She's 40 metres of floating luxury, with five bedrooms, three main decks and a top speed of 25 knots weighing in at 220 tonnes. Loadmaster Shane Brearley of Peters and May Yacht Logistics must get it to Greece in perfect condition. As you can see, the yacht is now turning up, now arriving alongside the ship. She's now getting her fendering ready. She's daunting, yes, she's huge, but you've just got to do your job, take one step at a time, take control, and, yeah, now my job starts. To avoid the wear and tear of a long journey, she must be loaded onto the top deck of the fair player and taken on a 12-day trip over three and a half thousand miles to Greece. Morning. Smack bang in the middle. Please. Yes, yes, sir. It's looking after the boat, so the customer gets his boat with the less mileage on it and not wearing out the warranty when it gets to the other end. But first, a diver has to place slings under the yacht so it can be raised 20 metres up from the water in a tandem lift between two cranes. She'll be mounted on a specially made cradle, which will be welded to the deck, alongside other boats in global transit. But the 15 million pound value means the yacht can only be lifted in good weather. And if conditions change, the whole move could be called off. Wind is always an issue, but with a tandem lift, it's not as bad as a single point lift with one crane. So as long as the wind stays fresh like it is now, we should be good for lifting. For now, the weather's holding, but Shane already has a problem. Another one here. What I've noticed is they've got two big sticky up white things. <laughs> At the moment, the belts are going to be very close to these two big aerials. I'll see if these can be dismantled. If they can't, then we'll, we're going to have to work around it. Silly question, but I've got to ask. Them two big sticky up things, can you get rid of them? No, no, they cannot. So if I get a chainsaw, can I cut them off? Only kidding. <laughs> there. First boat, first challenge. Like I said, every day is a challenge, every boat's a challenge, every situation is a challenge. You just adapt and overcome. Did we have divers? No problem. The cranes that'll lift the yacht each have a 12 metre long spreader beam holding two 24 metre straps in a loop. Each pair of slings has a lifting capacity of 160 tonnes. Shane needs to get on board the Sunseeker yacht to ensure each sling is positioned correctly by the dive team. Thank you, lads. The slings must be placed flat against the hull underneath the yacht by diver Ryan Ramage. 
if there's any damage, then yes, my neck's on the line, and that's what the divers are here for. We pay the divers to go down there, and they're all eyes under the water. Up on the deck of the fair player, Captain Paul Van Kintz is in charge of both cranes via operators on wireless remote controls who will move the slings into position. And now we uh, will lower the rigging. If the diver can't get the slings in the right place, the yacht will be off balance as it comes out of the water and could come crashing down. Divers are now under the water. He's going to make sure there's no twists, there's no obstructions in the water. Diver Ryan needs to spread the slings evenly across the hull. But the ones at the back of the yacht are more complicated to get in place. On the aft part of the yacht, it's a little more tricky due to the rudders and the propellers which will be underneath. To make matters worse, weather conditions are deteriorating. As you can see, the wind is horrendous at the back here. It's forcing the belts, it's twisting the belts, it's forcing the boat that way. That's why we've got spring lines on the yacht to stop the yacht moving so the yacht remains safe alongside the ship. Shane and his number two, Ben Watsall, are losing the battle against the worsening weather. As you can see, the back sling is snagged round the back. Above the waterline, the wind's twisting the slings. Below the surface, the tide is also spinning them round. So when the belts are twisting, everything's twisting along with it. But that's the grommets, shackles, and these are the lifting belts. The diver's trying to take the twist out as we speak. Diver Ryan Ramage is doing his best to respond to Shane's instructions. All on you, yeah? Come down! Come down! Diver's earning his money today. As you can see, it's choppy. The, the tide is actually pushing in the belt. The slings must still be safely positioned under the stern of the yacht, away from the cutting edge of the propellers. Divers being pushed, everyone's pushing up against the boat. So at the moment, oh stop! But conditions are delaying the team's schedule. In North Yorkshire, six miles east of Middlesbrough on the River Tees, Redcar Bolt Terminal. The Antonia has arrived from Louisiana and 75,000 tonnes of American coal is destined for power stations in the northeast. It's winter, the demand for electricity is high, and the coal must be unloaded in three days. Foreman Neil Young needs to board the cargo ship so he can run through his discharge plan with the chief officer. But the only way up is on a portable gangway. So we have to put our own gangway on. And we don't have a lot of places to put it without it obstructing our cranes, so we have to have a bit of jiggery pokery. Put it there. Just put that on there. We'll climb over. I'll come talk to you. I'll come talk to you. We'll put it there. The pilots get off and we'll sort it out in a minute. There's a language issue and a difference of opinion about where the gangway should go. I'm not putting it on the bars, just stick it there. Just stick it on the edge. Point is, shower gets you everywhere in this job. If you don't, no one will understand what you're trying to say. So a bit of pointing, a bit of shouting, a bit of, a bit of growling gets you there. With the gangway finally in place, Neil can board and get ready to begin the unload. We average about a thousand tons an hour. So if I give my ship a rear ring, and uh, we'll get started. The wind is already picking up, but 75,000 tons of coal must be discharged in 72 hours. It needs to get to the train loading area so it can be delivered to Egbra Power Station, 80 miles south near Leeds. We're ready to get cracking. It's getting a bit dark now. Put all the lights on the crane. It'll carry on through us through the night. Stockpiles of coal at the power station are limited. Both unload cranes will have to work round the clock to make sure all 75,000 tonnes of coal are offloaded in time to help meet the high demand for electricity in winter. In Southampton docks on the south coast, a brand new 15 million pound yacht needs to be lifted on board the Fairplayer cargo ship 
that'll deliver it to its new owner in Greece. Loadmaster Shane Brearley is overseeing the lift and the diver placing slings under the yacht. But Ryan Ramage is struggling against high winds and a fast-moving tide. Can we come back? Travel back, please! Come up, please! The wind is catching and turning the pair of slings Ryan's trying to get under the rear section of the hull. These back slings are twisted. Can the diver do anything? Well, look at the grommets. They're twisted on both sides. They're... Well, the diver's going to have to do something. He's trying to fight with the I know, mouth. mate, I know. We just, all we can do is ask him. At They're... the moment, the belts just get twisted by the tide, mate, and the wind. He might have to put another diver in. Yeah. Any chance to have another diver in? No. Well, oh. he's going to have to work hard then, isn't he? Ryan's on his own in the water manhandling the slings against the wind and the power of the sea. Each belt needs to be turned about four times each. What, what, it looks a bit worse because before, look at the grommets on the What's top. What's happening? The belts are twisted, so what we've got to do is try and take the twists out. But the poor diver underneath is just working against the tide. Every time he's trying to untwist it, the tide's turning it again. He turns it one way, it blows back the other. It's a bit of a mission. Ah, uh, the belts are twisting underneath. OK. So uh, the divers. Yeah, we need two divers. The fair player is due to leave tomorrow, and the new owners expect their yacht to be in Greece in two weeks' time. I'll tell you what, mate. If you tell him to bring it into the boat, I'll try and tie it to the side. Oh, stop! Stop! Hold it there. Nightmare this is. It is a nightmare, mate. Poor lad. With just the one diver, it's, um, it's near on impossible at the moment in the conditions we're working with today. Shane and Ben need the lone diver, Ryan, to rescue the whole operation. With the water, the tides and everything else and the weight of the slings, there's a lot of, there's a lot of weight there. So one diver in the water trying to work against all that, all them elements, it's hard work down there. He's, he's, work, he's earning his money down there. And that wind's getting worse. Yeah, he's just going to go under now. Soon as he says, we'll take up to stop that spinning. You all right, boss? All right? The lift can't take place in the dark because they need the horizon to check the yacht's level. They're already three hours behind schedule, and unless they lift it out by 6 p.m., the entire operation will have to be postponed. I just want to make sure the boat's in the, in the slings. Do it. We're going to put 10 ton on each hook, get the diver to check, make sure everyone's happy, then we'll get him in the boat. After four hours, the diver's finally happy the slings are flat to the hull. But without any underwater visuals, Shane and Ben are trusting the safety of a 15 million pound yacht to the word of one man. Red Car Bulk Terminal. 50 miles south of Newcastle, on the south bank of the River Tees. Crane driver Simon Swan is part of a team unloading 75,000 tonnes of American coal in just three days. We're about to make our way up on Lord of Three, which is our big crane. My first stint of the day. Uh, yeah, you've got to have a bit of a head for heights when you're walking up here. It doesn't really faze me, to be honest with you. Brace yourself. We're going to come out now. The operator's cab can span out over the ship across 52 metres of boom, supported by the 70-metre upright tower. Well, obviously, uh, like 250 feet in the air, we are hanging off uh, the underneath of a boom. Here we go, first grab of the day. When we get a good grab full, obviously you can feel the weight of it when you pull it, pull the grab up. When you first start coming up the crane and you can feel the cab shake and you think, oh my God, it's gonna drop off into the ship. The bucket can pick up an average of 26 tonnes at a time. With 75,000 tonnes to get on shore in 72 hours, 
they need to be grabbing 60 buckets every hour. Uh, this particular grab right now is picking up, um, you know, 24 to 28 tonnes, somewhere around like that. And obviously when you think that, um, you know, a small car, a small family car would only weighs just over a tonne, you realise just, you know, how, how much weight is in that grab. Once it's safely over the bunker, open it up, drop that in, and then back again. After just 400 bucket loads, Simon is already reaching the bottom of the hold, known as the ceiling. It's a particularly dangerous time of the offload. Obviously, the weight in that grab, um, metal on, on metal, can easily puncture a ship when you're uh, hitting the bottom. Uh, so you've got to be nice and careful and take your time when landing the grab. But when the car goes way down and you're touching the ceiling, obviously that can uh, easily do damage. If the bucket breaks the 25 centimetre thick steel of the hold, it'll cost the red car bulk terminal thousands of pounds to fix. Foreman Neil Young is permanently on watch. Hey, at the moment, I'm going to have a walk on board. Look at the status of the hatches, where we've been, where we need to go, and now we're looking for bottoms, and that's where we start putting our load and shovels and excavators in the hatches. And I can give them visual feedback because I'm a bit close to the action and tell the crane drivers where they can and cannot go during the actions with the grab. It doesn't look much when you're stood quite far away from it, but when you see, see it up close like we are now, you can see the huge, huge metal objects going into a metal thing that shouldn't be floating to pull out all this coal for our power industry. Just 9% of the UK's electricity is now produced in coal-powered fire stations. So the bulk terminal has had to adapt to changing demands, unloading a variety of loose cargo. Since like, this area has been absolutely deprived of its steelworks and ironworks that we used to have here, it's actually nice to see that it's rising from the ashes if, of the steelworks that were here. We've still managed to progress and we've still managed to survive. You used to see flames coming out the stacks, and now that's all gone, and it's hit the community, not just the Red Car, Middlesbrough, Teesside, the whole community had. But dockside at the bulk terminal, they're busy. 40,000 tonnes of coal has been offloaded in the first 24 hours. They need to get the coal off site as quickly as possible. 300 metres of conveyor belt delivering nearly 40,000 tonnes a day to the stack area. Uh, this, this pile here, this represents like the halfway journey that this coal has made on our plant at the moment. It's come from ship, come through our conveyor belts, come through our stack, and now it's getting piled. And this is our halfway journey. It doesn't stop there for it. After it's finished here, we will start loading it on trains, wagons, wherever it needs to go. Five locomotives pulling 23 wagons each arrive in the morning to take the coal to Egbra Power Station, 80 miles south. The power station has limited stockpiles, so the team at Redcar need to ensure there's a constant stream of coal coming in and being unloaded, particularly in winter. Shoreham Port, Sussex, on the south coast of England. A busy harbour processing two million tonnes of timber aggregates and general cargo every year. A tidal port with a lock to keep the water levels constant for offloading operations in the inner basin. The lock is 9 metres deep, 17 metres wide and 106 metres long. A vital channel that must be looked after by the port's underwater maintenance team of four divers and four assistants. But the lock has a problem. As the sea rushes in and out, water, sand and stones are catching in the side of some craters in the floor of the lock. The holes are getting bigger and cracking. Dive supervisor Keith Wadey and his team must investigate urgent repairs. When we get down the other end, this, um, this hole and this crack We know we've got the hole about there. Round right about here. And the other one's about here. 
that's the one which is actually give me more concern. If the holes get any deeper, what could break through and rip up the concrete at the bottom of the lock? It's historic damage by a Russian ship and recorded in the diver's log. In 1979, the Sovietsky Pogranichnik lost power. It had to drop anchor to slow down, but it caught under the lock floor before crashing through the lock gates. Witnessed by Keith Wadey on his second day at work in Shoreham Port. Ship came in, engines um, stuck in full ahead. <coughs> so they potentially they were going to ram the uh, the lock gates. So I'd have dropped the anchor. The anchor fluke got caught underneath um, the scare apron and actually tore a large section out. The scar apron is the concrete floor that runs the length of the lock. Uh, she did actually hit the lock gates, um, caused a fair bit of damage to the gates and obviously to the apron. The apron's been repaired and it sounds like that that repair is now starting to break down. 39 years later, Keith and his team are still dealing with the damage made by the Russian ship and have to make regular repairs. Just check the equipment before we dive. While the diver's kit is hoisted on board the Juno, Luke Walker checks communications One, two, three, four, five. Hi, Jerry. with senior diver Ryan Baker. Change it over to number one. With an average of five boats arriving every day, there's only a short window of opportunity to inspect the damage at the bottom of the lock. There's concern the holes in the lock floor are getting deeper. I've got to take a tape measure down and just measure the depth, the depth of the hole, width, and um, how far away they are from the key edge. Senior diver Ryan Baker goes in search of the problem. Visibility is down to 30 centimetres. Keith Wadey monitors the damage via Ryan's helmet camera. Yeah, can you go back to the deepest part, then uh, just try and keep still a little bit more. Yeah, that's going to stay there. The first concrete crater is unchanged. Yeah, I think we've seen enough of the hole. The second hole is of more concern. Ryan must clear out all the debris. Everything from old ship hooks to bucket loads of mussels. Cleaned up, the damage is revealed. With visibility just 30 centimetres, Ryan's struggling to see, but tries to measure the depth. You can confirm 250 deep. I'll confirm 250 millimetres deep. The hole is getting bigger. They've only got 50 mil cover now. Yeah, With just five centimetres depth between the concrete floor of the lock and the gravel it's built on, the next time she's emptied, fast-flowing seawater could break through the hole, causing major damage. Roger that. Yeah, I'm thinking the only way I can repair this is uh, by putting a big plate over the top of it. Yeah, Roger. Ryan must return to the surface to work out what he can do. Head of the dive team, Keith Wadey, needs to find out more before they can plan the repair. It's a big hole, yeah. and it's deep. One of the problems is where it is. It's right, as you say, it's right in the middle of the, um, the sluice. Yes. The hole is right by the lock gates that control the flow of water in and out. Every cubic meter of water weighs a ton. And just like the bottom of a waterfall, the pressure could deepen the hole and rip the lock floor apart. If it's fractured and it's fracturing back up there, this corner could be could be loose. Yeah. Keith needs a solution, or the harbour's in danger of shutting down, costing the port hundreds of thousands of pounds. What will happen if you if you leave it? Obviously, the hole's going to get bigger. Worst case scenario, we could end up with the with the port shutting because we always classify the gates as their front door.
Redcar Bulk Terminal, North East Yorkshire, on the southern banks of the River Tees. The team are halfway through discharging 75,000 tonnes of coal from the bulk carrier Antonia. Forty thousand tons of coal has already been stacked, but to get it to the power station, foreman Mark Dodds must keep the stack reclaimer operating 24/7. It's a huge bit of kit, with a 65-meter-long boom reaching into the stack. The bucket wheel can rotate up to eight times in 60 seconds, with the conveyor belt taking the coal 260 meters every minute. Basically, the uh, things with the teeth on their buckets, they're on a big, big wheel. The wheel digs into the coal, then it goes up across that conveyor belt, across the boom, drops through a chute onto the conveyor belt, then the conveyor belt follows the system all the way up to the wagon loading station. On a good day, this machine should be, should be able to pick up at least 1,400 tonnes an hour. With the power station's coal stockpiles diminishing by the day, the pressure's on operator John Cairns to get 8,000 tonnes of coal to the loading area to fill the five trains on their way to pick it up. You don't want too much in, because otherwise it goes over the back of the bucket. You don't want too little in, because otherwise it's going to take you a lot longer to fill a train. The idea is to basically put steps in. You put steps all the way up the heap, and that's because if you just reclaim from the bottom of a heap, the material that's on top of the heap would fall down and bury, basically bury the stacker. The coal is also unstable. Internal chemical reactions can cause it to spontaneously combust. There's a lot of heat in a lot of these coals. We, we check them on a regular basis with a, with a temperature gauge and they, they can actually go combust and actually go into flames, so that's another job that we have to keep an eye on. On top of monitoring a flammable cargo, Mark needs to make sure there's enough coal for the trains arriving today. Six bunkers uh, on each side, we've got two sides, so that's 12 bunkers all together, and a total weight of about 3,000 tonne of coal, which is probably enough to load two trains. 24 hours after the bulk carrier arrived, nearly half its load of coal, 36,000 tonnes, has been unloaded and is ready for the next leg of its journey to the power station. Um, I'm just making sure that everything's peaked to the top to make sure we've got enough coal in here. Each locomotive is pulling 23 wagons. Forward, forward, please, driver. Go forward now. Stop, stop, please, driver. Stop, stop. Neil Young must be careful to make sure each one has 70 tonnes of coal. Yes, it can go, go very wrong. You can overload it. You can miss the bunker. You can, you can cause damage to the track. You could derail the train. Train overweight is a big headache for us because we have to unload the train then. Stop, stop, please, driver. Stop, stop. We're in radio contact with the driver at all times for safety reasons and to move him to the position that we want. He moves at a slow place of about two mile an hour, so everything can stop start uh, in an orderly fashion. Yeah, there's a mucky job, yeah. There's uh, it was one of them things, isn't it? Back on the dockside, the last few grabs are coming off the Antonia. All 75,000 tonnes of coal delivered on land inside three days. By five o'clock, 115 wagons have been loaded up across five trains. 8,000 tonnes is heading for Egbra Power Station near Leeds, but the regular shipment won't be carrying on much longer as Egbra shuts down at the end of 2018. Burning coal to make electricity is due to be phased out in the UK by 2025, and Redcar Bulk Terminal will have to find new revenue streams again. Shoreham Port, Sussex. 
the hole in the lock floor is getting bigger. But dive supervisor Keith Wadey has decided another survey is required before it can be repaired. If you look at the granite, granite seal, I mean, they only look, I mean, that's, um, that's three feet. Without uh, a scale rule, I mean, they only look about two foot six. The plan is to drill four holes around the damaged area and insert an underwater chemical glue for four metal threads. A steel plate will be put on top, bolted down, and resin pumped through a hole in the middle. Finally, a second plate will go on top. The work scheduled for late 2018. Meanwhile, Keith and his team of two divers and two attendants must check out another problem. An access road at the back of the quay is collapsing, and they need to check whether subsidence is also causing problems under the dock. It's been reported that um, uh, part of the quay has sunk, where we've got cranes and faultless working. Um, so, but it could be anything, it could be a hole, it might be an old drain uh, that's been there that um, hasn't, been, hasn't been covered up, uh, that could have collapsed, so straight away you've got to avoid. To see if the subsidence is also affecting the dock, senior diver Ryan Baker must take a look. Visibility is just 30 centimetres and night is closing in. Underwater lights and a helmet camera help the team above water assess the damage. Any significant problem could bring cargo operations to a complete halt. They look pretty good, they do. The steel piles were installed in the 1950s. But on closer inspection, the key wall is secure. Roger that, like? return to the boat. Return to the boat. Diver coming back in, Owen. Luckily, the subsidence in the quayside road is not affecting operations. For now. Oh, this was great. Yeah, this was yeah. great. Oh, yeah, right. I think that is literally just a localised. Yeah, yeah, they're doing their job as well, aren't they? After a busy day of diving, the team returned to base. Plans are in place to repair the hole in the lock floor and to stabilise the quay. With five ships a day going through Shoreham, turning over two million tonnes of cargo a year, the dive team must be constantly vigilant for any potential problems. Southampton Port on the south coast of England. A brand new 15 million pound super yacht is about to set sail for Greece. But before it does, it has to be lifted on board the deck of the Fair Player heavy lift vessel, transporting it to the Mediterranean. Okay. Uh, I'll let this one go. The new the owner place. is spending a small fortune to have her delivered three and a half thousand miles to make sure she arrives in pristine condition and avoids the wear and tear of the sea mileage. Let's get it done, safe and secure, and the customer's happy. That's the main thing. But the transport's not without risk, and she'll soon be hanging by two pairs of boat slings in the hands of loadmaster Shane Brill. <laughs> it's just seeing how much tension we've got on the belts. Yo! One five? It's a complex, high-risk lift involving two independent cranes. Each one has a 12-metre-long spreader beam, which holds two pairs of 24-metre-long looped boat slings. The super yacht will be lowered down onto a specially designed 12-piece cradle, which will be welded in place on the deck. She's secure, she's in the belts, crane's ready, basically the ship now has the yacht. The ship has the yacht. The captain's ready to lift. We're just getting rid of all the crew, making sure everybody off the boat. Shane's now relying on the captain of the fair player to instruct the operators balancing the boat between two remotely operated cranes. And uh, give me a blast with three quarters. 
Assistant Loadmaster Ben Watzel is watching the delicate manoeuvre from the diver's boat to make sure the super yachts level and not in danger of sliding out of the slings. A little bit more on the front. But as soon as she takes to the air, she's off balance. A little bit more on number one. Shit, Captain. She's stern down. She's stern down. How much? The stern up, the bow up. The bow needs to come up, Captain. Easier, bowly on the fly. She's level, Captain, she's level. Upright, upper gloves remain the same. Can we bring the nose a bit more? OK. The new owner in Greece is expecting it to arrive in perfect condition. To be safely raised up on the deck of the cargo ship, she must come out of the water perfectly horizontal. 110 tonnes of weight suspended on each crane at exactly the same height. See, the kill's just come clear. Uh, our job now is to make sure the kill stays dead level as we get up to deck level. Come up on the back a little bit! If she's not perfectly level, 15 million pounds worth of yacht could come sliding out of the belts and crash back into the water. Bring the stern up! Stop! Each crane operator easing the yacht higher in the air. OK, that's good. She's level, Captain! There's just a metre between the super yacht and the solid steel hull of the heavy lift carrier. One gust of wind could cause millions of pounds worth of damage. Well, aft crane only, swing to the right. Yeah, if you look on the horizon, she's turned down a little bit, Captain. I'll stop on the crane. She must be level to land safely on the deck. Yeah, she's turned down. She's level with the horizon. 220 tonnes of super yacht must now be safely lowered towards a specially designed cradle. 12 steel stands, height adjustable and padded, need to be slotted underneath the hull. And forward right, swing to the right, easy on the aft. All right, we're just going to start getting all the timber in the right position, then we're going to lower the boat onto the timber. Once the boat's on the timber, we're going to push all the stands under, marry it up to the hull of the boat, and then start welding all in position. Coming down! Two, three! Wooden blocks take the weight, but the bilge keel, designed to stabilise the yacht sailing in rough weather, is dangerously close to the deck. At this level, you can see all the levels and you can see the stabiliser. You can get, you get ground level so you can see exactly what's happening. So I'm not relaxing, honestly. <laughs> 28 centimetres. 28 centimetres. So we're going to have to get our blocks up here and go 18 centimetres. With all 40 metres of yacht in position, the individual sections of cradle are pushed into place. Two, three. That'll do. At the moment, I'm getting the cradle, which she's going to sit, basically that's her bed, she's going to be sitting in that all the way through the journey, so we're making sure this is snug to the boat. The cradle will be welded into place, then both the yacht and supporting frame lash down to the deck to survive the three and a half thousand mile journey to Greece. Without the cradle system, she's got no, she's got no stability. We've got to have cradle for, to stop it, the movement, side to side, the rocking at sea, and then the lashings will hold it down as well into the cradle. The cradle system is massively heavy. Yeah. It's a two or three man job every time on these cradles. It's just heavy manual work, because she's, she's holding 200 tons yeah. of boat, so everything's got to be well manufactured, ready for shipment. Well, let's get in, let's get it in. Ready this one? Let's get this one in. Ready, one, two, three. That'll do, Captain, thank you. <laughs> Each stand is welded to the deck, ready to take 220 tonnes of super yacht as it's finally lowered into place off the crane. What we're doing now is lowering the boat more on the keel now, so the weight's going onto the keel. We're just going to sit her down, make sure all the pads are correctly in position, enough pressure on each of the pads. Once that's done, we'll then start lashing the boat to the ship. We'll get a D-ring there. These ones can go from here to there and there. 
the super yacht is safely lashed to the deck. But the job has run four hours over schedule. Time's crept up on us. That's how shipping is. That's, you know, that's how it is. So we have to deal with the situation, adapt and just crack on and do it. Unfortunately for me, I won't be home for tea. The, the dinner will be in the dog and I'll, I'll be on a takeaway again tonight. Job done. After a 12-day trip, they'll have to get her off the cradle and down into the warmer waters of the Mediterranean. But the multi-millionaire will have their super yacht in pristine condition. This time on Mega Shippers. In Southampton, 280 brand new minis are stuck dockside after the worst snowfall in 10 years. And terminal supervisor Pete Lavelle has to work out how to get the cars to China. This is just a block of ice. The conditions are, are treacherous, it's far too dangerous. In Immingham, on the northeast coast of England, high winds leave crane driver Mark Allen struggling to control 40 tons of frozen fish on the end of the lifting chain. There we go, there's a wind warning. It's getting windy. And in Shoreham, dockside foreman Ricky Brown unloads thousands of tons of steel girders for the construction industry in sub-zero temperatures. Unloading with steel is dangerous. Can fall out the sky, chain can snap. Steel's not forgiving. It can hurt. Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume. One miscalculation... No, 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 no. I've got 10 metres to go ahead! One change in conditions... It started to completely fell down. ..put spell disaster. Mother Nature stamped her feet. ..with reputations... ..and lives on the line. Yeah. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the Mega Shippers. The Mini Factory in Oxford, where the famous British car has been built since 1959. Since the brand relaunched in 2001, it produces a thousand cars a day, and eight out of ten are exported to the likes of America, China, and Europe. Inside, on the production line, General Manager Greg Denton has to ensure every Mini is assembled from scratch in just over five hours. Hello, Dave. Each vehicle has a unique specification, ordered by customers from all over the world. So this is the start of the uh, Mini Adventure in assembly. So this is where the car has come in from our paint shop. And this is really where we start adding all of the parts that the customer's ordered to the vehicle. There's about 220 stations that the car goes through. Uh, we've got about 470 employees. We build about 1,000 cars a day. So over half a million electrical connections we're making every single day. More than 600 people work on the production line fitting up to 4,000 parts. And after final checks... Good car. Ship it. It's ready to leave the plant. Every 67 seconds a car comes off the line here, which equates to over 1,000 cars a day, five days a week, so over 5,000 cars per week. In the last 15 years, nearly 2.5 million Minis have been exported around the world. Good car. Vehicle dispatch manager Martin Harris is responsible for getting the minis to the UK's ports, where they'll be shipped across the globe. There's about 2,000 cars there. That sounds like a huge amount of cars, but because we're producing over 1,000 cars per day here at Mini Plants Oxford, it's actually only a couple of days' worth of cars. Today, Martin and the team must load 280 minis worth millions of pounds onto a train to Southampton Port where they'll be loaded onto roll-on, roll-off ferries and exported to China, Japan and the USA. To oversee a shipment like this, you need an eye for detail. 
Each car has these labels on the car. This is a car for Japan, and this green label here says S-Rail. So S-Rail means Southampton Rail. So this particular car will be loaded on the uh, train to go to Southampton, and from there, it'll be loaded on a ship to Chiba in Japan. With 280 minis due on the train, costing £20,000 each, the load's worth nearly £6 million. There's a lot of responsibility in ensuring that, um, yeah, we look after that uh, value of product um, in the right way. The Oxford plant has its own railway line connected to the national network. The train to Southampton leaves at 3 o'clock and they have just six hours to load 280 vehicles. One car every two minutes and they must be loaded in perfect condition. The cars really are factory fresh, so cars that could be finished in the factory um, this morning could actually be going on the train this afternoon. It can be as quick as that. Out in the dispatch area, there's only enough room for four days' worth of production. So it's vital Martin gets the cars on the train to Southampton as quickly as possible. The flow of cars is absolutely critical. We only have space in total for 4,000 cars here, so we have to keep these cars moving every single day of the year. A team of 12 drivers are loading up the 280 cars. But taking them 70 miles south by train saves more than 1.4 million lorry miles every year. Each train is normally 10 wagons. Each wagon will take about 28 mini vehicles, so around 285 mini vehicles per train. The train is actually 660 metres long. Each wagon has an elevating roof and two decks, but they're only 2.4 metres wide, leaving just 30 centimetres either side of the car. The amount of space here is uh, somewhat limited. So the drivers driving down these decks, they need to concentrate very hard because it's quite easy to go slightly offline. When they get to the correct distance, they will then stop the car and they get out the car and then they'll put some uh, chocks under the tires in order to prevent those cars from moving during transit. After three hours, 140 cars are in the wagons. Half the load is chocked and lashed, but the train must leave at three o'clock. We're under time pressure. We have to get these cars loaded in time for the rail departures, and that's critical. Also, of course, the customers worldwide are waiting for these products. They've got ships to meet in Southampton. But with 90 cars still to be loaded and the train leaving in two hours, it's going to be tight. And there are weather warnings that an extreme cold front is due to hit Britain from the east. We're in for an exceptionally cold week of weather right across the UK. Shoreham, on the south coast of England, an industrial port on the outskirts of Brighton, dealing with 2.1 million tonnes of cargo a year, much of it for the construction industry, from timber to steel. House building and infrastructure projects in Britain are booming. With three million people employed in the sector, there's an increased demand for steel. The 90 metre long general cargo ship Free Stream is quayside. On board, 1,800 tonnes of high quality Spanish steel girders that need to be unloaded in just 48 hours. Quayside supervisor Ricky Brown has been at the port for 10 years. And today he's got just eight hours to unload 1,000 tonnes of the girders and stack them quayside. You have to watch everything. You have to have eyes everywhere. He's leading a crew of five on the boat, three quayside and a crane operator. Yeah, it looks like you've got some sixes to come off. Then you've got some twelves. Down in the hold of the ship, banksman Gary Waterman and his team must distribute the weight of 15 tonnes of steel evenly. The chain's looped and finally balanced to stop the steel sliding out. The job of banks for there is keeping an eye on the lads, not to make sure they're safe, uh, guiding the crane in and out so it's over the lift, not ox, and the lads put the chains around. 
and I'll, I'll make it all make sure it's all safe and think and we'll send it out the boat onto the key edge. The high strength steels are heavy cargo with sharp edges that can cut against the lifting chains. Crane operator Chris Knight must stay focused. Just take a brief second and you can cause a lot of damage, both financially and uh, cost to someone's life, unfortunately. The crane they use, known as a mobile material handler, weighs 181 tonnes. With a 630 horsepower engine that can lift 30 tonnes at a time and turn in a 360 degree circle. To pick up the steel girders, it uses a spreader beam that can expand to 15 metres with two chains that can each lift 10 tonnes. Chris begins at the bow of the ship from the front hold offloading around 15 tonnes of steel in each lift. Up to four bundles at a time that can be over 18 metres long. The key is trying to keep the lift as smooth as possible, uh, because any aggressive movements will make the chain whip around. You hit the guys in the boat, which when you're working at height, you don't want. Each 15 tonne bundle of girders has sharp edges and the weight puts pressure on the 25 millimetre thick chains. Unloading with steel is dangerous. There's so many things that can happen in this, in this job. I mean, the worst way that, that you can fall out the sky, chain can snap, but we regularly check everything. Despite the dangers, the team still need to unload at least 120 tonnes an hour to stay on schedule. Everybody's under pressure, but no, still we have to take at a certain speed. It is all done nice and gentle. It's the best way. Steel's not forgiving. It can hurt. It's crucial Ricky and the team keep the boat balanced. Basically, they try and keep the boat as level as possible. At the worst way, if you did it wrong, you can, what they call it, break the back of the boat, which is, in theory, it snaps the boat. To avoid any possibility of breaking the boat, all 1,000 tonnes of steel will be unloaded evenly down the length of the vessel, from the front or bow, then moving on to the rear or aft. The 1,000 tonnes being unloaded today is just part of the 7 million tonnes of steel Britain imports every year. 80% of it from Europe. We have very few steel mills left in the UK, unfortunately. Um, so it's mainly brought in from Spain. It could be from Brazil. It could even be from Russia. Uh, it can be from varying places. Stock controller Brian Bailing handles 2,000 tonnes a week. Basically, we, we sell to fabricating workshops uh, who fabricate the steel into the fabricated parts that go into buildings, roofing, uh, flooring, etc., etc. It can go into almost anything. Uh, and it can be, it can end up anywhere in the country. But the weather can change everything. Arctic conditions from the east are beginning to affect the whole of Britain. Snow is forecast, and a wind speed of over 50 miles an hour can make the unloading operation significantly more dangerous. We do have some trouble with the wind sometimes. It's, it doesn't take much wind to affect the uh, lift as it's rotating. If you don't lift it square up, it'll um, swing out, hit blows first standing near it, could hit the side of the boat. It's already minus three degrees, and Quayside supervisor Ricky Brown is keeping an eye on the weather. There's a few black clouds, and we meant to have a bit of snow maybe today. I'll try not to think about it, because all it's going to mean is we're going to get a little bit more dangerous. We just have to be a little bit more careful. But let's, let's hope not. After three hours, there's still 700 tonnes of steel to unload. But as snow begins to fall, Ricky needs to work out if it's safe to continue. If it gets too thick, then I'll, I'll have a look at it and see how slippery it is, and then we might have to stop the boat. There's too many sharp edges and things like that you can land on. With 700 tonnes still to get in the yard, Ricky's hoping the heavy snow holds off, or this job will come to a rapid end. Oxford, in the south of England, home of the mini factory, producing a thousand cars a day, with 80% of them sold overseas. They've been exported to more than 100 different countries, and most of them leave by train. Today, 280 are headed for Southampton Port, while they'll leave on cargo ships 
going all over the world. Specialist drivers need to load a car into a wagon every two minutes, and they've got just two hours to get the remaining 90 cars on board the train. All 280 minis are loaded with 30 minutes to spare, and the hydraulic roof can come down on the wagons. The roof is now completely closed, so this wagon's ready to go, and it's always a great feeling. Each car must arrive in perfect condition. The wagon lid provides protection as the train travels at up to 75 miles an hour on the 70-mile journey south to the port of Southampton. All the cars that we wanted on the train are now loaded on the train. Our job's done, we'll come back tomorrow. Train driver Emma Perrett works for the rail freight company DB Cargo and has to take all 10 wagons down to Southampton. She'll be traveling on the main network and has to find a gap between the busy commuter trains. At three o'clock, she's on the move. Uh, the locomotive we've got today is uh, a Class 66. Uh, it's American design and it's got about 3,000 horsepower, maximum speed of 75 miles an hour. Yeah, this particular train is 1,400 tonnes and it's, it's really long, it's 650 metres long, which is it's quite a lot of train to, to get moving and keep moving. We need to build up the momentum to keep our speed going. Uh, obviously, once you're going fast, it's a heavy train and it, it takes even more to stop it. But to get there on schedule, Outside the cities, she needs to pick up speed. Obviously, at that speed, we need to look as far ahead as we can see. We're obviously looking out for the signals, track workers. A train this long would easily take it a mile to stop. With 280 brand new minis in tow, worth around £20,000 each, it's nearly £6 million worth of cargo. Driving this train is a massively responsible job. Uh, you've got obviously a precious cargo behind you, worth millions of pounds. The best thing about driving a train is, I don't know, you're on your own, you see, you're out in the countryside, you see some wildlife, uh, sunrises, sunsets, no one else is around to see that, you know, and, uh, and blowing the horns. <laughs> After two and a half hours, they make it safely to the outskirts of Southampton. Oh, mate. Nothing good, mate. You're good, good. Uh, yeah. Radio test, please, Emma. Loud and clear, Stewie. With the train now in sight, after a journey of two hours and 45 minutes, operations manager Darren Thorne is getting ready to offload the cars. The guys today, they will be discharging the cars uh, off of the train um, and putting them into um, the multi-storey car park. All 280 minis have arrived safely, and Emma's job is done. We made it. We are here. The train is in the correct spot. Yeah, the pressure's off for the day. All the minis are here safe, ready for other people to unload them. All 10 wagons are in position in the offload area, and the ramps can be manoeuvred into place. The responsibility for 280 vehicles custom ordered from America, China and Japan is now in the hands of Darren and his team of 16 drivers. There's just 30 centimetres either side of each Mini in a wagon just 2.4 metres wide. It's very important that it's discharged correctly. If we damage a car during discharge, um, we are then liable for the cost of the repair or vehicle if it's seriously damaged. The train must return to the plant in three hours. To offload all 280 minis, the drivers have just 40 seconds to get each vehicle from the train to the multi-storey car park, just 100 metres away. Every angle is critical to preserve the car in pristine condition for the buyer. As the guys are approaching up the ramp here, they approach each level um, at a diagonal to reduce any risk of uh, underside damage to the vehicles as they're coming up the ramp systems. All 280 cars safely negotiate the ramps and are parked up with 30 minutes to spare. The cars are grouped together in the car park 
according to their destination port and what ship they're leaving on. Uh, it's gone very well today, uh, so everything done, um, everything discharged, no problems, no hiccups, and uh, no reported uh, uh, minor damages or anything, which is always a, a, a mega plus as well. They're all in situ on the multi-storey now, um, awaiting the vessel arrival, where they'll be shipped to their relevant uh, ports all around the world. Most of the minis are due to be loaded onto car-carrying vessels over the next few days. But an extreme weather front of high winds, heavy snow, and freezing temperatures, nicknamed the Beast from the East, is predicted to arrive in Southampton overnight, jeopardising the export of £6 million worth of cars. Sixty miles east, down the coast in Shoreham, Quayside supervisor Ricky Brown and his team of nine are offloading a thousand tons of Spanish steel to the yard on the Quayside. The steel girders are in high demand for roofs, floors and walls in the construction industry in the south of England. Now that's gone cold, isn't it? Yeah. Dockside, snow has started to fall, but so far it's not slowing them down. No, the weather's not been too bad, actually. It's a little bit cold, we had a bit of snow, but nothing laying, so it's just cold, it's winter. Good old English weather, I think. Having removed 500 tonnes, they're halfway through the 1,000 tonnes they need to get on shore today. But the steel is so heavy, it must be evenly offloaded or they'll destabilise the vessel. Yeah, basically what's happening now is that we've uh, completed the forward part of the ship. We're just going to track the crane up to the aft um, and we'll start discharging the steel on that end. The material handler's mobility is essential to unload the steel across all four holds on the vessel. As it crawls its way down to the stern of the ship, Ricky needs to check for any critical damage to the lifting chains, which could cause them to break, dropping up to 20 tonnes of steel onto the dockside. Every now and then when the chains come off, we look for cuts in the chain. You've got a few cuts here. You're allowed a certain amount of cut on it. So when we take them off, I'll just have a quick look to make sure, run my eye down the chain, just have a, have a little look, basically. The lifting chains are strong enough to continue. And for now, the heavy snow that was forecast has held off, and they're back on schedule. It's going extremely well at the moment. We've, uh, we've hit about 850 tonnes. We should hit about 1,000 tonnes today. We normally do 1,000 tonnes in a 10-hour in a period. Stock controller Brian Bailing handles around 90,000 tonnes a year in Shoreham and needs to get the girders processed for the construction industry in the south of England. The steel plant specially built on the dockside has been waiting for the girders from Spain. Now in a specially adapted automated steel yard, it can be picked out by inbuilt cranes and rapidly processed. The steel gets taken into the factory it gets shot blasted, it gets painted, primer, um, it then gets drilled, it gets cut to length, and they use it for all kinds of things. Yeah, it can be for almost anything, almost anything. Some of the steel is turned around in less than 24 hours. Bespoke orders to the individual requirements of each construction project, cut, drilled, painted, and loaded onto the road. 100,000 tonnes of steel passes through Shoreham every year. And today, Ricky and his team have overcome freezing temperatures to get today's delivery on shore safely and satisfy the ever-increasing demand for steel in the construction industry. Yep, it's gone really well today. We've got our 1,000 tonne off, which is what we expected to do. Um, so we're going to wrap it up now and shoot off down the pub for a nice little drink. What a lovely day. What a lovely day. The weather front known as the Beast from the East has arrived. Shipping operations around the coast of Britain are badly affected. In Southampton, a once in a decade snowfall has covered the dockside in two inches of snow. Today we've woken up uh, and as you can see, we've had a bit of a whiteout. The weather's uh, not been kind to us. 
but 280 minis have arrived from Oxford and need to be loaded onto vessels heading for China, America and Japan. I've worked in the docks for 17 years and I can probably remember it being like this twice, uh, where, it's, where it's this bad. Uh, it's, it's very, very unheard of. Terminal manager Pete Lavelle needs to see if the conditions are safe to drive 93 of the minis onto a vessel called the Morning Classic, heading for China. I'm just going up onto the, uh, the upper level, so I'm just going to take a drive round and just to make sure that uh, everything's been treated and it's safe when the vessel gets in, that it's safe to be taking cars out of here. We're five levels up on a multi-storey car park, out in the open, and the wind chill factor is probably minus 10 up here, so it's really, really cold. So I just need to make sure that the route uh, from the multi-storey car park to the vessel is safe. The team of dock workers due to get the minis on board the vessel are known as the car gang, but none of them are going anywhere. A difficult position for team leader Greg Gripper. We're looking at, um, I think, 75 people at the moment. That's drivers, stowers, leading hands, transit drivers, lashes, quite a big, big gang, yeah. But there's so much snow, the local navigation pilots can't get out to any of the vessels in the channel to guide them through Southampton water and into port. Well, at the moment, uh, we're waiting to hear if um, we're going to get a pilot boarding the vessel. It's uh, blowing a gale up by the NAB, where the pilot station is, and it's unsafe for the pilot to board at the moment. Terminal manager Pete Lavelle is still hopeful the cargo ship Morning Classic, due to take the minis to China, will get into port. We've got the Morning Classic there and uh, he'll come over into this area to pick up the pilot when the pilot launch comes out. So he's literally with these other three vessels, they'll just be going round and round in, in circles just to, to stop them drifting. Unless they can get the navigation pilot on board, the vessel will be stuck in the English Channel. The conditions are, are, are pretty steady for the next hour, and then there's, they think there's going to be a break in the weather for about an hour. So the Port Authority are going to take the opportunity to send a launch out there and see if there's any possibility of boarding any of the vessels that are out there. And hopefully it'll be safe enough out there for the pilots to board within that uh, break in the weather. But temperatures are dropping, and the weather front is not letting up. The temperature inland, we're looking at uh, temperatures of minus two. So actually out in the open, there's, there's no, uh, no temperature gauge out there, but it's certainly going to be a lot lower than minus two with the wind chill. Snow continues to fall across the vehicle loading area. All the car gang and their team leader, Greg Gripper, can do is wait and see if they'll be working today. Yeah. Okay, Mark, right up, job, job. Okay, chaps, uh, decision's been taken that um, we're going to go home. Uh, allocations will let you know when you back in. I probably don't think it's going to be this afternoon, but we'll have a, the allocations will let you know. The team will still get paid while enjoying the warmth of their own homes. Okay. All right. The temperatures out at sea are dramatically lower than on land and the navigation pilots have been unable to climb up the rope ladder normally used to board vessels out at sea. Yeah, pilot boat's not going out now. Pilot boat's not going out, given up. The wind chill has actually frozen the ladder that the pilot has to climb up, and the pilots have decided that it's not safe to board the vessel. Very, very unusual for the pilot ladders to be frozen, so it just goes to show the beast from the east has, uh, has really hit the south. Southampton Port is shut down for the day. The minis remain in the car park. But this isn't the end of the bad weather. Behind the beast from the east, Storm Emma is due, bringing 70 mile an hour winds and a wind chill factor of minus 15. The Port of Immingham, on the UK's east coast, near Grimsby. The snow that's hit Southampton has stayed away for now, and up to 40 vessels a day from Scandinavia and Europe continue to arrive across the North Sea. Dockside, the Helgafell, a container ship from Iceland, 137 metres long, with the capacity to carry 11,000 tonnes of goods. Much of the cargo is fish, 
caught in the North Atlantic and transported in white refrigerated units. With just five hours to take 54 containers off the ship and load another 50 back on board, operations manager Darren Bailey must move a container every three minutes. It's quite a large vessel does do a lot of fresh fish, that's, I'd say that's a good 80% of its cargo. So if it doesn't reach the market by Thursday night, all of a sudden the value of that fish goes down, so the customer in the shipping line lose a lot of money. So we have to get the vessel turned round in a set amount of time. For 30 years, the UK's imported more fish than it catches. 730,000 tonnes a year comes in from abroad. Unlike some of its neighbours that began as fishing ports, Immingham has always been an industrial port. But now it plays a vital role in landing and distributing valuable, fresh and frozen seafood in refrigerated containers known as reefers. The priority of that is to get it off because obviously there's, there's fresh fish in there, so it needs to get to market ASAP. The Helgefell must leave at 2pm, and for now it's a race against the clock to get all 54 containers off the ship. Nathan, that one that's just come off, offside left, there's uh, no pin in it, mate. Each vessel has a limited time on the quay. Assistant Dockmaster Dave Wood in the Marine Control Centre must make sure the Helgefell doesn't overstay its slot before it heads back towards Iceland. We try and plan a shipping programme around the vessel we have. If one is loses one hour or even 30 minutes, it can throw the entire programme completely off sync. And of course, these vessels have schedules to keep. The rail-mounted gantry crane will offload the containers. It's 70 metres tall and reaches out over the container ships with a boom that can extend to 47 metres and has a maximum lifting capacity of 40 tonnes. The priority is the refrigerated containers. Basically, it just has a refrigeration engine in the front and it's for temperature sensitive goods. I think they can go down to minus 25. It's a really specialised bit of kit. Crane driver Mark Allen has the responsibility to get the 40 tonne, 12 metre long refrigerated units unloaded as quickly as possible. If you're scared of heights, then obviously this isn't the job for you. This is all done by eye, not with computers. Most of these containers weigh around about 35 tonne. Once I've picked a box, you can feel it pulling down the crane. Uh, it shakes a little bit. It's all about being smooth and steady. If you start rushing and slamming the spreader about, you're just going to lose control of it. You're going to do, could do damage. And you're just making it hard for yourself. So it's all about being smooth and gentle. Each refrigerated container is lowered onto a specially adapted trailer with four corner pins. Safely locked in place, the lorry can take it to the storage area. With four hours to go, the team are under pressure to move 20 containers an hour. On board, operations manager Darren Bailey must make sure all the refrigerated units are safe to unload. We're under an EFA reefer unit here. The only thing we need to be aware of is that it's actually unplugged. If this is still plugged in, there's such high voltage going through. If this was to get uh, split or damaged in any way, it could electrify the actual ship. But safely unplugging the refrigerated fish containers is not the biggest problem. 70 metres up in the air, Mark Allen has noticed the wind speed is picking up. When it's windy and blowing, uh, it does alter it, uh, especially with the empty containers. It swings them about a lot more. For now, wind speeds are just on the cusp of acceptable at 33 miles per hour. Currently, the wind at the minute is uh, about 15 metres per second, so it's all right to carry on working at the moment, but it is expected to get worse. After three hours of unloading, most of the 54 containers have been discharged but the wind speed has increased beyond 40 miles per hour. We're trying to get the cargo off, but with this wind, that'll be it. Well, it would be nice to get some cargo on as well. And just as they're about to finish the offload, there's a problem. 
There we go, there's a wind warning. It's getting windy. With just half the containers offloaded, and each one now swinging in mid-air, the whole operation could be delayed. With hundreds of tons of fresh fish still on board, there's a danger it could all go to waste. In the port of Southampton, the weather is causing major problems. It's early March, but more snow overnight has given terminal supervisor Pete Lavelle more problems. As you can see, the, the, the area of winds not had much traffic uh, running through it, and uh, you can see there's been a, a, a good falling of snow. It's probably, it's probably an inch and a half deep now, and it's, and it's not going to get any better with what's dropping down out the sky. The minis are frozen in the car park, and the vessel due to pick them up is stuck out in the English Channel. Still not safe to get a pilot on board. Uh, the problem we have now is all the spray that's been going onto the pilot launches has now frozen. So they can't actually get a pilot onto the pilot launch to get the launch out to the vessel to bring, bring the vessel up. And even if the navigation pilots could get the cargo vessel berthed, working conditions dockside are hazardous. This is just a block of ice, so you couldn't expect someone to stand on the edge of the quay and, and, and take a mooring line and, and, and heave it in because he's just going to slip up and it's just, you can see the conditions are, are treacherous. It's far too dangerous uh, to, to have people mooring. Uh, the vessels, let alone driving in these conditions. Every day's delay costs the shipping companies $25,000 per ship. In Southampton docks, the freight handlers are also losing money. The port normally exports almost a million vehicles a year, but all operations have been put on ice. If we can just look at this, this just looks like it's double glazed. This is just, the ice has just formed on the window screen. And the cars are going to be the same as that up in the multi-storey car park. Never, ever seen conditions like this. The temperature's been so cold with the wind chill factor that as soon as anything's hit this windscreen, it's just gone into a block of ice. The port is completely closed. Nothing coming in, nothing going out. Mother Nature stamped her feet, and uh, there's nothing we can do about that. Customers who've bought a new Mini across China, the USA and Japan are still waiting for their new car. There's nothing we can do. As you can see, it's uh, started snowing again. There's no ships coming in. There's no cargo going out. There's no deliveries. The port's in complete uh, shutdown. And for the moment, these minis are going nowhere. The port of Immingham, on the east coast of England near Grimsby, may have escaped the snow for now. But the same can't be said for the beast's winds. Weather's a, a massive influence on our operation, uh, especially in the winter months. At the minute, I think this afternoon, we're looking at 50 mile per hour gusts. The dockside crew are trying to finish offloading 54 mixed containers, including frozen fish, from the Icelandic cargo ship Helgafell. Crane operator Mark Allen is working in difficult windy conditions. But this afternoon, the wind is forecast to get worse and operations manager Darren Bailey must keep the crew safe. So we're under pressure to get the operation done as quickly as we can because in them sort of conditions, we, we just can't work safely. If it hits 50 mile per hour, we should have had our cranes up and in a safe position well before then. 70 metres up in the air, crane operator Mark Allen must offload the rest of the cargo before the wind picks up again. We've got to get the cargo off. Uh, obviously, we can't let the ship sail with the cargo on, but we won't have a choice if, if the wind carries on as it is like, so. As the wind remains just below dangerous levels, Mark tries to unload the last of the 50 containers. Yeah, it's looking good. Uh, to get in, for getting the cargo off, but it's not looking good for the chief for getting some cargo back on. This is the last uh, container coming off the ship. The unloading of the Helga Fell is complete, and the Icelandic fish can head out to all corners of Britain. But Darren is still due to load 50 containers back on board, and there's less than an hour before she must set sail at 2 o'clock. 
Now the vessel's discharged, we, we've only got an hour to backload the vessel because of shaling schedules. So now we've just got to get as much cargo on basically as we can. I'd like to get 40 pieces on, but I think that's, that's going to be a little bit optimistic. I'm, I'd be happy if we get 30 units on, which are the, uh, the most important cargo. The team are under pressure. To get 30 containers on board, Mark will have to lift each one off the back of a lorry and keep an eye on this wind speed. Raise it up to 20 metres before lowering down again into position in just two minutes. In the crane cab, Mark will have to work fast and it's man and machine against nature. The wind is challenging the team and they're running out of time. If they can't finish on schedule, the ship will have to leave without some of its cargo. The high winds don't change the fact that Dave Wood must get the Helgefell off the quay in an hour. Well, the Helgefell this afternoon, he's got an awful long journey to get to Iceland. Obviously, if we can get him out on time, he will arrive at his next point on time. If he's delayed, then he may have to speed up. Of course, he will burn more fuel and incur more costs to get to his destination on time. But the wind continues to slow the team down. And with 10 minutes to go, the Helga Fell is still 10 containers short. Unfortunately, Mother Nature's beaten us today. <laughs> We've loaded approximately 20, 20 containers on. It's not ideal, but it's just no, it's not safe to continue this uh, uh, ship anymore. So on the plus side, the ship's still getting away on time. It'll still get to its net port. So uh, we'll just do better on the next one. At precisely two o'clock, the Helgefell heads back towards Iceland to pick up more fish to be exported to Britain. For us, these are quite big ships. I don't think you'll ever get used to the, uh, the size and the scale of the operation. It's because of these vessels that uh, goods are getting onto the, uh, the, the store shelves every day. So if, if we don't do the best job we can do, not just us will suffer, but down the, the road, someone might not get the, the toys for Christmas or the Easter eggs for, for Easter. But for now, the supermarkets of England will have Icelandic fish on Friday. And the port of Immingham continues to play its part in processing its share of the 730,000 tonnes of fish imported into the UK every year. In Southampton port, the snow has finally melted. The minis have survived the big freeze and the UK shipping line's morning cello has managed to get Quayside to pick them up. She's a huge roll-on, roll-off vessel running between Southampton and China. 200 meters long, 32 meters wide, and can carry up to 8,500 vehicles. So, as you can see, conditions have changed over the last couple of days. The snow that we had that uh, caused major disruption to the port has now cleared. Uh, we've managed to get the vessel in alongside and we're planning for operations to start uh, pretty much immediately so that we can start getting some of these BMW Minis that have been delayed over to their customers in Shanghai. Terminal supervisor Pete Lavelle has a two-hour time slot to get 93 of the Minis on board the morning cello. Their destination, Shanghai, China's biggest city where an economic boom has driven the demand for European cars sky high. A team of 16 drivers carefully negotiate the journey from the multi-storey car park to the ship. Southampton resident Bernice McCann has only been in the job for a couple of months. So we're just driving from the car park compound uh, down to the ship, ready for exportation. So where they're going to be shipped off all around the world. I don't know where this one's going then. There's a bit of pressure to not crash the car, but no, it's very exciting. Um, you just got to be careful, go slow, stick to the rules really. But no, it is very nice when you jump into a, a shiny brand new car. <laughs> I like it. Each car has a barcode identifying its unique specification as ordered by the customer in China. Hello. <laughs> There we are, thank you. But it's quite tricky on this ramp because obviously the, the low cars are quite low down, so you don't want to scuff the bottom bit. So you've kind of got to go on at an angle. 
Some of the decks on board can be as low as 1.8 metres. So, as you can see, this is a nice open deck at the moment, but soon it'll be packed tight full of cars, completely from deck to roof. And they're parked really close together, all the cars. They leave no space in between, only a tiny little bit between the wing mirrors. So you have to get out of the car before the next car is pulled up because there's no space to open your door otherwise. Each Mini loaded according to the detailed stowage plan with a specific location for every car. Tightly packed with strict rules about how close they can be. We need to fully utilise the vessel. As you can see, there are standards. BMW have their standards, and we have to adhere to those standards. So in between each car, bumper to bumper, there is a minimum distance of 50 centimetres, and in between the cars, 15 centimetres. Cars have to be secured when the vessel's at sea in case we come across any bad weather. So as you can see, uh, the cars are strapped down to the deck by, by means of these lashing straps. We have uh, two on the front of the car, and of course, there's two on the rear. So each car, no matter where it's placed on the vessel, will have two of these either end to keep it fully secure while at sea. The team must get all 93 Minis safely on board the morning cello, ahead of the other, bigger cargo, heading for Shanghai. But with just a few minutes to spare, all the vehicles are in position and lashed. So it's been a tough day, but I'm happy to say that the operation has gone really smoothly without any hitches. We've managed to catch up on the time that we lost for the severe weather we had a couple of days ago, and the mini operation is now complete. So in 30 days' time, there are going to be people in Shanghai that are receiving their mini product to their front door, and yet again, a great British product has been exported from the UK. The morning cello finally leaves at four in the morning. But thanks to an army of workers from Oxford to Southampton, a car enthusiast in Shanghai will soon be driving a British motoring icon. This time on Mega Shippers, in Shoreham on England's south coast, thousands of tons of wood chip biomass creates a cloud of hazardous dust. And supervisor Robin Merry must bring it under control. We can't afford to let any of this get into the open air. We've got too many local residents and too many people in this area. In Kings Lynn, Norfolk, project manager Dan Tika tries to unload a brand new £40 million generator without damaging the ship or the dock workers. I wouldn't stand there, mate. And in the Orkney Isles, north of Scotland, freight manager Chris Bevan must load almost 700 cattle in just 10 hours. Agriculture is the biggest industry in Orkney, and without this service, then the, the sector just wouldn't survive. Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume. One miscalculation... No, 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 no. I've got 10 metres to go ahead! One change in conditions... It started to completely fell down. Could spell disaster. Mother Nature stamped her feet. With reputations and lives on the line. Yeah. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the mega shippers. Shoreham Port, East Sussex, on the English Channel. Handling two million tonnes of cargo a year, from food to building materials. Dockside, over 5,000 tonnes of wood chips, known as biomass, ready to be shipped to power stations in Sweden, where it will be burnt to make electricity. Old wood is now sourced from demolition sites and recycling centres and made into new fuel rather than being burnt on location or sent to landfill. An increasingly significant bulk material for sure and port and dockside supervisor Robin Merry. Today we're loading biomass, which is a chip wood product. Uh, basically it's all from the old building industry. It's had all the pieces of metal and all the plastic stripped out of it. So basically left with the, now the raw wood. 
it looks like a pile of old rubbish to, to every day, me and you, doesn't it? But again, this cargo, in the old days, again, would have been landfill, just would have been a dead cargo, but now it's worth good money. Two miles offshore, waiting to be loaded with the biomass, is the bulk cargo vessel Camellia. 95 metres long, and able to carry up to 5,000 tonnes of cargo. But to get the Camellia to the biomass loading area, navigation pilot Paul Chalmers must get on board. He needs to help the captain of the Maltese registered ship navigate the approach to port and the sharp right-hand turn into the narrow lock at Shoreham. Uh, today we've got the Camellia coming in. She's a, a 3,000 gross tonne Bolka. She's just come round from Ipswich. Uh, we'll go out and board her shortly and uh, bring her in. We're going to bring the ship in through the entrance, which is 110 metres wide, bring it round the corner, which is a very sharp turn, more or less a right angle turn. Then we've got to come up here to the lock. So what I've got to do is make sure that the ship is coming in at an angle and we don't bang anything, don't catch anything, don't do any damage to our lock or the uh, ship itself. Shore and port is tidal, with the water level rising from two to five metres. The lock keeps the water in the inner basin at a constant height, so ships always remain level for loading. Uh, the lock is 106 metres long and 17.4 metres wide. The ship is 96 metres long and 16 metres wide, so we've only got 10 metres clearance in length and uh, a metre's clearance, metre point four clearance in beam. So it means we've got to be fairly precise in control of the ship. I've never been on this ship before. This ship's never been into this port before. I don't know how the company maintains its vessels. Anything can happen. It's like parking a car with no brake. And all you've got is the reverse. If you have to put your car into reverse to stop it, that's what you're doing with the ship. The Camellia is on a tight schedule. It has to be back in Sodotage in Sweden in 48 hours. Navigation pilot Paul needs to get on board to help guide her into Shoreham. Yes, sir, we'll be with you in approximately 20 minutes' time. If we can have a pilot ladder, please, on the starboard side, one and a half metres above the water. The pilot launch is uniquely designed to meet big ships, with a black rubber fender ready to pull alongside the Camellia so Paul can board and get a berth next to the biomass loading area. Um, she's pretty big for this port, sort of uh, two thirds of our absolute maximum. It's very, very tidal. There's a very strong tidal flow across the entrance and in this area we're in at the moment. So you've got to allow for that. A lot of sideways movement and lateral movement once you get through the pier heads. And the, the, the other factor with this port is there's nowhere else to go. You can't sort of come racing in and you've got a big river to go up. We're straight into the lock as soon as we get in and around the corner. It's going to be a tough manoeuvre. It's the first time Paul has taken charge of the Camellia and he still needs to jump from one boat to another to get on board. We take a good look at things before we, we, we make that final step from the, uh, from the boat to the ladder. So if the, the conditions are really, really rough. We don't do it because it is just too dangerous. In the middle of England's east coast, the port of Kings Lynn, Norfolk. In the 13th century, one of England's most important ports. In 1997, a natural gas power station was opened. But after just 15 years, it was mothballed in 2012. Old machinery and high gas prices made it too costly to run. But an important shipment is about to help breathe new life into the old power station. A 315 tonne gas turbine worth nearly 40 million pounds, made by the German engineering firm Siemens. Overnight, the generator has arrived from Hamburg aboard the Eastern Vanquish, an 89 metre long, 12 metre wide general cargo ship. The gas turbine is the sole cargo on board. It's an important landmark for the head of electricity generation at Kings Lynn Power Station, 
Adam Kennard. Uh, yes, it's taken us somewhere in the region of six years to plan this and we're extremely excited to see it arrive today. Uh, it's been a long time in the planning and uh, finally come to fruition here. The generator makes electricity by mixing and igniting air and natural gas. The gas turbine is the, the prime mover in a, in a modern power plant. The gas turbine itself is the primary source of power. Uh, it connects to a generator directly and provides about 300 megawatts of that power. This exhaust is fed through to a large boiler which creates steam, which then goes into a steam turbine and adds to the power feed from there. Uh, this particular power turbine, when it's configured in the combined cycle plant we have, will power 370,000 homes in this area. The man responsible for moving the £40 million generator without any damage, 28-year-old project manager, Garno Tika. Today, we're here to oversee the lifting operation, uh, so getting it off the vessel. It's a big lift, uh, so there's a lot involved. It's a massive project for us. Lifting the gas turbine out of the hold will be a mobile crane with a reach of 136 metres and the ability to lift 750 tonnes. It's already been set up quayside, but the team want a decision on whether the 315-tonne turbine will be landed on the left or right-hand side of the crane. Garno needs to call the engineering team in the office. Hi, Matt. We seem to have a bit of um, an issue in terms of where the crane is positioned. So, on the drawings, we've got a slew on the right hand side and then getting the trailer next to the crane. What it looks like on the right hand side, there's not enough space there to slew on the right hand side. There is, there is a left hand side where there's, uh, there's, it looks like there's, there's enough space there where they can slew left. Showing you where you're loading it on your trailer. Yeah. You haven't got it, you haven't got it uh, position for there or there. Whether they land the generator left or right of the crane, they must leave enough room for the 95 metre long trailer that'll take it to the power station. That's the, uh, that's what I've marked out. I've marked so that's the where the ends. That's where the trail will be ending up. If you, if you if it, temporarily put it at the front, yeah. the centre of the trail's going to be on that, that way across there. With just six hours of daylight left, Garno must make a decision. Well, the plan is to, to end it up here, but obviously that's not what it's been, uh, it's been drawn up, um, already engineered. Right, so we've got, well, we've got a slew um, left now, are we? Yeah. Right. With the decision made to land the turbine on the left of the crane, the crew must prepare the steel landing mats to spread the weight of the 315 tonne turbine before it's loaded into the cradle. Yeah, so we're committed now, because obviously we're trying to uh, gain time now on the whole job. So uh, once all the mats are set, we, the crane's going to lift it off the vessel and place uh, the gas turbine onto uh, the set of mats. But under Garno's plan, when the crane swings round to the left carrying the turbine, the ship's 18-metre high bridge and gantry will be in the way. It looks like they'll now have to move this ship, and the change of plan needs to be approved. The ship has to move forward nine metres um, to get in line with where the crane is. Halfway through the lift, the ship will have to pull backwards, otherwise the team will be risking catastrophic damage to the £40 million gas turbine and the ship. You've got the gantry of the, sh of the ship there, so the idea is to move um, the ship roughly nine or ten metres uh, back. It's a huge test for Garno, in the biggest project of his career. It's the most expensive item he's ever moved, and the power station in Kings Lynn is relying on him to safely deliver the generator, which will bring the power plant online after six years of planning. Shoreham Port on the English Channel. 2,000 tonnes of wood chip biomass fuel is waiting to be loaded onto the cargo ship Camellia and delivered to a power station in Sweden. But first, navigation pilot Paul Chalmers has to guide the bulk cargo vessel into the harbour. Yes, sir, we've just left the port and we're on our way to you now. If you'd like to keep closing towards the port, please, sir. Maintain a speed of about six knots for boarding. With the Camellia and the pilot launch both headed towards port at six miles an hour, Paul pulls alongside. 
and as a seasoned expert, swiftly climbs aboard. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Paul's first priority is to contact the lockmaster at Shoreham, Dave Smith, so he can prepare the lock for the camellia's arrival. Current Paul, two miles off now, uh, six metres, uh, anchor's clear, no defects. Yeah, they're all copied, sir. Yeah, 6.1 metres are on the gate, sir. If I could have the steering, please. So the pilot's boarded the vessel. Uh, he's confirmed he's on board. Uh, the ship is safe to actually be able to make its approach to the port. Like every other ship across the globe, the Camellia broadcasts its global position through very high frequency radio waves. Any other ship in the vessel tracking network can pick them up in the Automated Identification System, or AIS. See, up here I can see we have our AIS and radar system, which gives me a good in indication of all vessels that are in the area, and also their speed. There's our boat there, that's the Camellia. She's on the way in. As you can see at the moment, her direction of travel is that way, but the entrance to the port is there. And it looks as if it's gonna be hitting the land. With the wind and tidal surge pushing the Camellia offshore, they need to carefully adjust the power of the engines to enter Shoreham safely. Ready to turn hard to the right and slow down to enter the lock. Shoreham, Camellia. Yeah, just to confirm, we have uh, 6.2 on the gauge uh, now, Paul. Do it, coming through the entrance now. Aye, aye. The gates are open, and she approaches at just two miles an hour. Cap, because it's sunny. The lock is just 17 metres wide. The Camellia is nearly 14 metres from port to starboard. One wrong move negotiating the narrowest stretch of the harbour could cause catastrophic damage to both the ship and the lock. There's just a 150 centimetre gap between her steel hull and the concrete wall. The port of Kings Lynn, Norfolk. The Eastern Vanquish is quayside carrying a 315-tonne electricity generator destined for a brand new combined gas power station in nearby Kings Lynn. It'll be built on the same site as the old mothballed facility and produce 1,700 megawatts of power, more than five times the output of the 1990s power plant. Now I'm just going to shadow uh, from the top, yeah. Project manager Garno Tika and the team must get the gas turbine out of the hold and onto the quayside before it gets dark. But it's already half past two, and he has to make sure the ship moves out of the way once the lift has started. So once, you, once it's lifted, you guys move this way, and, and then obviously the, crew, the crane will slew this way, yeah? yeah? The mobile crane rotates on a central circular axis known as slewing. The crane's fixed boom length means the ship has to move backwards or the turbine could crash into the gantry in front of the bridge. We've got to move the ship because of, uh, you've got the overhead uh, gantry there of the ship, so obviously that'd be the way where you'd be slewing to, to, to the left. Two steel rope slings are attached to four points on the frame that protects the gas turbine. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, the lift can finally get going. But not before some of the team are repositioned. I wouldn't stand there, mate. He's gonna get the I tag, stand he's there. gonna grab the tag line. Have you got no one to do it? Huh? Have you got no one else to do it? Well, I've got him on one on the floor and the other lad's in the ship. Right. Keep hoisting, mate, and you can start nudging to your left steady. With the generator now off the floor of the hold, the Eastern Vanquish can motor back 10 metres. The crane now has room to swing round and land all 315 tonnes on the quayside without hitting the ship. Keep it going, Link. 
And bring your slew to a steady stop there, mate. Just hoist down for a minute, hoisting down only. Hoisting down only, mate. Keep coming down. We've got to position these stands before you can land it, mate. The team on the ground are manning guide ropes to ensure the 315 ton generator hits its landing position at the correct Stop angle. And then we can move it to where it needs to be. Can you go over onto that one? Because I'm going to need to put John on the tray in a minute. Lift supervisor Tony Wilson needs to carefully land the 40 million pound turbine on four independent steel platforms known as drum stands. Hoisting down steady, mate. Keep coming, Lee. Keep coming down. Keep coming down. Keep coming down. And hold that, hold that. And bring that to a stop there, mate. Just have to wait now. They've got a German to confirm where it's got to go. An engineer from the manufacturer Siemens, Wachim Gusto, needs to make sure the gas turbine has been unloaded in perfect condition and will be safely positioned where it will be stored overnight. And then put timber. Yes, I do. Say, say what he decides anyway. Although the team is satisfied with its location, Joachim thinks that without more stability, the 40 million pound turbine might fall off. Garno must break the news to the office. It's got a concern that uh, if, if, you leave, if, if we leave the drum stands there, the, the piece might tip over. It's a major test of Garno's ability to adapt the plans to suit the client. And I uh, just need to make some more alterations to how it's sat now. Yes, it means get the, dr get the drum stands um, out and then lower it down again onto the mats. But yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. Well, pick, it, pick it up there. There's just an hour left of daylight and it's a change of plan that involves lifting the crane back up in the air so the drum stands can be discarded and the gas turbine lowered back down onto the new flatter setup. Hoisting down, mate. Hoisting down. Front end's landed. We'll reconvene tomorrow and then start the work and uh, lift it onto our trailer. Day two, and the 95 metre long trailer arrives quayside to take the generator four miles by road to the power station. A 48 ton Trojan truck will pull a 200 ton trailer. The gas turbine will sit in a central cradle between two 14 axle hydraulic platform modular trailers. It's 95 metres long and five metres wide. Although it's been planned months in advance, they need to double check the dimensions of the steel framework surrounding the gas turbine. And on closer inspection, there's a problem. It was never going to go in. The whole unit is 30 centimetres wider than they expected, and the cradle on the trailer is too small. It's a major setback for Garno. We just um, realised there's a bit of a discrepancy in terms of information we've drawn up and also what we currently have on site. So there's a bit of a rejigger to do in terms of the trailer. Obviously that delays things by um, two or three hours, but we're still hopefully going to be loaded in today. The whole transport cradle must be taken apart to make it bigger. It's put the operation back another three hours. Is that threaded, that one, or not? If they can't fix it, there'll be no lift today. The generator will be stuck quayside, and the power station in Kings Lynn will be facing more delays. Shoreham Port Sussex, on England's south coast. The Camellia, a 96-metre-long bulk carrier is squeezing through the port's lock on a way to pick up 2,000 tonnes of wood chip biomass fuel for an electricity power station in Sweden. Lockmaster Dave Smith must make sure she gets safely through. When you're up there, looking at the soles of this coming into that lock, it can be a little bit deceiving. It does fit, honestly. The Camellia is almost 14 metres wide 
leaving just 150 centimeters each side. She enters the lock at just two miles an hour. The team dockside are ready to hold her in place with mooring ropes whenever she stops. The lock gates are here in front of you there, and I've obviously got to make sure that she's in, in steady and slowly. Camellia Shoreham, you've got 10 metres, Paul. 10 metres, thanks, Dave. So that's, we've got 10 metres to clear the lock gates at the moment. Up on the bridge, navigation pilot Paul Chalmers must use all his local knowledge to park the 3,000-ton ship inside the lock using reverse thrust. So at the moment, they're using, they've got the uh, brake rope at the front on the spring and they're still pulling in the stern light mount to get it clear of the gates. Once she's clear, I can give him the pilot the indication. You're inside and clear, sir. Inside and clear, thanks. The lock holds three million cubic gallons of water, and with the camellia in place, they shut the gates. But they need to add another 750,000 gallons to bring a level with the inner canal so she can be loaded. Right, what's happening now is I've opened the sluices at the east end of the lock. Water is now coming from the canal into the lock, bringing the camellia level, water level up. Once she's level, with the level in the canal, we can open the gates and she can go off to her berth. 30 minutes after she entered the lock, the water's level with the inner basin. She's clear to head for a berth where she'll be loaded with the biomass. But in the inner basin, there's limited room for maneuver. And it's a challenge for navigation pilot Paul Chalmers to get round the other vessels on the quayside. Drop it on now. It's closer than he'd like. But get me a stern line as soon as you can. I've got 10 metres to go ahead. I need a stern line, quickly, please. The ship isn't responding as quickly as he'd like, and he has to think on his feet. Yeah, drop the spring on. Finally, he gets her alongside, but not exactly a textbook berthing. It was a little bit tricky, uh, the ship. When well, it was supposed to be in neutral, wasn't in neutral. It was tickling ahead all the time. And uh, every time I put any power on, she shot ahead. And I would try to berth a, a right-handed ship, left-handed, and uh, that ship there, I just had to just cut in behind there, and I got sucked in as I came in. We nearly clipped it there. Uh, it was quite interesting. The camellias safely berthed, but the dockside team have got just 24 hours to get 2,000 tonnes of biomass loaded before she has to leave for Skodatage. And the Swedish power station is relying on the delivery. The Orkneys, a group of 70 islands 10 miles off the northeast coast of Scotland. At the heart of the island's economy is agriculture. A vital lifeline is the freight ferry that transports live animals between Kirkwall, Orkney's biggest town, and the Scottish mainland. Freight manager Chris Bevan is preparing to transport up to 700 cattle to Aberdeen on board the Hildesay roll-on, roll-off cargo ferry. We ship these seven or 800 live animals out um, on a weekly basis down to get uh, fattened up on the Scottish mainland or onward to the abattoir to go into the food chain. We've been shipping live animals off the islands for generations, if not hundreds of years, um, but not in such volume um, as it is today. Without this service, the sector just wouldn't survive. 12 miles east of the port in Kirkwall are the rich pastures of DNS. For 16 years, Keith Yunsen has been rearing the much sought after continental breed, Limousine Cross Belgian Blue. Because they're large animals, the only way the cattle can get to the Scottish mainland as a live export is by sea. This ferry service is a lifeline service. So the majority of the cattle that's bred in Orkney will go down to the mainland of Scotland for fattening. So it's better to take the cattle to where the grain is. Keith makes more profit selling his one-year-old cattle to farmers on the mainland than he would if he fattened them up on Orkney with expensive imported grain. But before he can ship them, he has to sell them at auction. Taking 15 to market tomorrow. 
10 years and 5 heifers. I would like to probably get 1,100 to 1,200 pounds for this one year old steers at market tomorrow. We'll just have to wait and see. Hopefully we'll get them sold. Don't have to take any of them home again. Of the 50,000 beef cattle on the islands, every year half of them are exported live to be fattened up by other farmers on the Scottish mainland. The cattle here, we're taking them in to load them in the trailer to put them into the mart. Keith must sell all 15 young cattle to keep his farm going. The Hilda Say roll-on roll-off ferry is dockside in Kirkwall. Chris Bevan is preparing specially built livestock containers to make sure the cattle have enough food and water for the seven hour journey to Aberdeen. We've got hay in the racks here for uh, feeding them during the voyage. And you can see that they've got uh, what we call nipple drinkers here and those are the ones that connect up to the, the ship's water supply to ensure they get fresh water during the voyage. So this is very much first class travel for animals. If you can fit 35 in each vessel, you're talking, you know, between eight, 900 uh, cattle per, per, per sailing. The Hilda Say Ferry is scheduled to leave at 8 p.m. But if Keith's to get his cattle on board, he needs to sell them at the auction house in Kirkwall. Buyers from the Scottish mainland have arrived on Orkney and are eager to get their hands on the breed. Oh, look at that, there's a nice ever stand on. 230, bay, 230, bay, 23, 4, that's 25. That's 31, that's 32, that's 33, that's 34, that's number 5, 605, right? Oh, here's a good Keith's livestock must sell today. If they don't, not only will his farming business be under pressure, but the cattle won't be going on the ferry. A thousand pound to go. The port of Kings Lynn, Norfolk, on the east coast of England. A 315-tonne electricity generator needs to be lifted onto a 5-metre-wide metal cradle so it can be taken by road to the power station under construction nearby. It's the key piece of machinery at the heart of the facility, which will reopen in 2019. But even after months of planning, the cradle is too narrow by 30 centimetres. The team from ALE need to make it wider by adding length to the cross beams. It's already one o'clock on the second day of the operation and the generator should already have been inside the cradle. There's obviously been a discrepancy in terms of uh, the measurements we've uh, received on the drawing and um, what we've set the trailer today. So it looks like we'll have to um, widen the trailer. Uh, we're talking about uh, 300 to 400 mil, um, which is obviously it's, uh, it's quite a, a massive difference. Quite good we find out quite early. By four o'clock in the afternoon, Garno Tika and the team have widened the cradle enough to accommodate the generator and its frame. Just keep going, mate. The operation's also being supervised by Wakim Gusto from the generator's manufacturer. He has to make sure Garno and the team deliver the generator to the power station in perfect condition. Right, Lee, take it up to 320, please. Up to 320 tonne. But just as the generator is about to get clear of the matting it was resting on, there's a snag. Stop. One of the straps that was securing it in place is still attached. OK, Lee, up on your hind, up on your line. Keep hoisting, pal, keep hoisting. With the 315-tonne gas turbine free... Keep it going like that. All the members of the team are on hand to stop it spinning around. Nice and steady, come down on your line. As it drops into the frame of the cradle, there's just 30 centimetres to play with on either side. Right, that'll do that. But when it's just 10 centimetres off the bottom of the cradle, the inspector from Siemens isn't satisfied with the position of the steel plates 
it'll be sitting on during the road trip. What's the situation now? He wants his plate moving to here. Because the whole weight's coming down here. It's another change of plan. Garno needs to inform his boss back at base. Uh, the Seagulls guys are not happy with the match we've got uh, on the um, crossbeams. It's yet another delay for Garno, and the plates must be winched wider on the crossbeams. But Wakim has the authority to alter the engineering specification as he sees fit to guarantee the turbine's safe arrival, no matter how much it delays the job. He's from logistics team. Yeah. He knows his stuff. All right. So, yeah, no, that's one. I checked already yesterday that yeah. he's in a position to change our yeah. coins. He's, he's OK. Right. Checked already. OK. It's almost in position. But now the padding between the gas turbine and the cradle must be inspected. You've got, you've got rubber there. Yeah. Well, you just need more, or...? Yes. You need more rubber? Yeah. Even with 315 tonnes of weight on top, the inspector from Siemens wants more grip. So once again, the team have to alter the plan. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you, you want to rub it underneath these, yeah? Yes, 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 yes. It's better, yeah. Right. The search for perfection is delaying the team. We'll have to get extra rubber. It's nearly five o'clock, and Garno needs to call into the office again and update the engineering team on how the lift is going. Ah, uh, been experienced, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, OK. I've got an, an hour left. With the safety of a £40 million generator at stake, Inspector Joachim Gusto won't sign off the setup unless he's 100% satisfied it's safe for road transport. What do you think is the uh, issue? I don't know yet. No, <laughs> all right. He's thinking long enough. Oh, uh, yeah. Garno needs an answer. So are we all right to carry on then? Yeah? Right. <clears throat> but as the gas turbine's lowered into position, the padding is still not yeah, right. I think we have too much wood. On where? In the side. Joachim takes matters into his own hands. All that rubber was all across there. Yeah, when they're in. With Siemens representative in Kings Lynn now satisfied, a twenty to six the gas turbine can be lowered the last few centimetres. Right, Lee, just lose all the weight, mate. Lose all the weight. Bring down the zero and see how it lies. Finally, at six o'clock, only three hours behind their planned schedule, the generator is in the transport cradle. Is he happy? Yeah. Sure. Okay. It's been a test of all the team's engineering skills but the generator is now ready for road transit. We've had a few alterations, but she's landing now, and uh, been a busy day, but, you know, job done now, so, yeah, ready to go now. With the last lashings in place between the generator and the trailer, the slings attached to the crane hook can finally be removed. It's half past six at night, but nestled between two modular trailers, the gas turbine is safe in its cradle, ready to be taken four miles to the power station. Despite the delays, on its way within the time frame. Cheers, mate. See ya. Have a good one. The generator will be installed in a brand new facility, ready by 2019, to provide electricity to up to 370,000 households, nearly all the homes in Norfolk. Shoreham Port, on the south coast of England, near Brighton. The bulk cargo ship the Camellia is berthed, 
and Quayside supervisor Robin Merry must get her loaded with 2,000 tonnes of wood chip biomass fuel for a power station in Sweden. We're looking for 2,000 tonnes on this ship, so a good 24-hour uh, production, I'd say, that would take us to get it done. To get 2,000 tonnes on board in 24 hours, Robin needs Shoreham's 181-tonne mobile crane, fitted with a three-tonne orange peel grab. It's like, like the Death Star above us, basically, a huge grab. Puts in large amounts of the, the commodity without spilling is the main thing about this. But 2,000 tonnes of wood chips will only fit in the hold if they're compacted by a machine called a telehandler. These are powerful machines. They push hard and they, they flatten the cargo out for us using the bucket. And then we use the tars, which have been adapted. They're not air tars anymore, they're filled with a gel. So they add a little bit more weight to the cargo and it means you can, you can flatten it out as you go. So one, car, one telly around will be at the front using this bucket, the second telly around will be behind it using the wheels to flatten it down again. But before the biomass is craned in, the telehandler has to be lifted into the hold to start flattening the wood chips layer by layer. But biomass sawdust can be dangerous. Fine particles in the air can cause irritation and need to be carefully controlled. We have to be a little bit careful of the dust, so we will should be using water suppression systems to keep the dust down. We can't afford to let any of this get into the open air. We've got too many local residents and too many people in this area. And the dust is not just a threat to people. As the biomass begins to get loaded, crane driver Ken Feeney's worried about his engine. The main problem with this cargo, if I'm honest, is it's a machine killer. Um, it's very, very dusty, hence the reason for all the water sprays, but it still gets into all the radiators of the machines, crane will start to overheat. Um, it may be called biomass, but it's, uh, it's not machine friendly, let's put it that way. With the dust in control for now, Ken can begin loading the biomass for the handlers in the hold. Each orange peel grab contains 10 cubic metres, around eight tonnes of biomass. It's designed to dig in to the material. It makes a seal. And then, as long as you don't have too much on top that can spill over or blow out if it's a windy day, um, you know you're not going to lose any on the way into the boat. Down in the hold, telehandler operator Mark Henderson is spreading and compacting the biomass into every corner and directing Ken in the crane. Uh, straight down there, Ken. The team are under pressure to get a 1,000 tonnes on board in the first 12 hours. Quite do it. Very level. You'll end up having buttholes, and when you drive into them, it hurts like hell. You sort of fall into them, smash the telly and then into the side. Damage the telly handler, smash glass. It's been done before, it can always be done again. I just try and avoid it. After 12 hours, a thousand tonnes is on board safely, and the Camellia is on her way to a full 2,000 tonne load. Fantastic today. We're about halfway through the operation. We have a thousand tonnes on the ship now. You know, it looks like we're going to hit our targets. The ship's going to make it on time. You know, everything's going really well. It's been a terrific day. The following day, the Camellia is fully loaded on time and can set sail for Sodatage, where the recycled wood from Britain will be providing electricity for the people of Sweden. Kirkwall on the Orkney Islands, northeast Scotland. A vital port for a group of islands with a population of 21,000. Farmer Keith Yunson is selling 15 one-year-old steers and heifers. In just over an hour, all 15 are sold. Bought by farmers who fatten them up for market on the Scottish mainland. The cattle will leave tonight on a freight ferry called the Hildesay travelling in specially designed containers for the export of live animals. Lorry driver Colin Scott must get the cattle Keith sold to the port. In all, he needs to get 668 steers and heifers to the quayside 
to be loaded onto the Hildesay before she set sail at 8 p.m. It's a long day for the cattle. Like the first ones we picked up this morning, it's five o'clock in the morning, you know, so yeah. a long day standing about in the wind and rain and whatnot. Dockside, the port has an area known as a lairage, where the cattle can rest up before the sea crossing to Aberdeen. That's 13 arrived, so we've only got another 600 and something to go now. <laughs> It's a labour of love for Colin, despite his conflicting emotions. I'm an animal lover for sure, yeah. And I go out my way to help animals and look after them and I don't want to hurt them. But they're just so damn tasty, you know. <laughs> steak is my favourite meal of the day. Steak and chips, you can't beat it. Each livestock container is supplied with bedding, food and water for the journey, with room for 20 cattle. 36 12-metre-long transporters must be loaded on board the Hildesay ferry and be ready for an 8 o'clock departure to Aberdeen. It's a treacherous sea route between Orkney and the Scottish mainland. In winter, high winds can create huge swells and tough sailing conditions for the cattle. Chief Officer Marius Evich is under pressure to get the containers on board and transport the cattle safely so they arrive in Aberdeen fit and healthy. The sailing time for today will be uh, 20, 20 hundred, eight o'clock. So I hope for that time we'll be ready to sail. Okay, we'll be, we'll be on board. <laughs> Maneuvered into position by Orcanian Ian Spence and his four-wheel drive, 280 horsepower tractor. Today we are loading a livestock container onto the hill to say. This one has cattle and they are going to Aberdeen. Marius must make sure the cattle will be safe and secure for the seven hour crossing to Aberdeen. This one is the latching system for the trailer. Strict guidelines insist the animals are regularly checked and have fresh food and water. Fresh water system, which one connect to the first trailer, and after that, one by one, all trailers connected to the fresh water. With two hours to go ahead of sailing, the last of the transporters gets on board. Finished for the day. Happy man. Loading is completed, ready for sailing. All 668 cattle are on board with hay bedding, food and fresh water, heading for Aberdeen. The weather forecast is for a calm overnight crossing. No reported traffic at this time. Right? Yeah, Gopi, no reported traffic, thank you. The journey from Kirkwall to the mainland is 150 miles and takes seven hours. Forward all lines on board, very good. At half past five in the morning, they make it to Aberdeen on the Scottish mainland. All 36 livestock containers, known as LCs, can be offloaded. One by one, all LCs will be transferred to the yard. Thanks to the work of the animal transporters, the farmers of Orkney can continue their long tradition of rearing cattle for the mainland, and the ferries can continue to be a lifeline for the economy of the islands. This time on Mega Shippers. In Glasgow, the weather causes problems for naval architect Heather Crockett, who's moving a 100 million pound ship down river. The winds unexpectedly picked up. Our limit for the move is uh, 21 to gusting 25 knots. So we're just over the limits. In Southampton, Barry Goshawk is loading urgent supplies for the Channel Islands, but a broken fuel pump means the cargo ship is stuck dockside. This is a high-pressure situation and there is never a dull moment here. 
and in Leicestershire, half a million pounds worth of locomotive needs to be driven 180 miles to Somerset. But engineer Steve Moss has a big mechanical problem. So if you haven't got that steering arm in, you won't have any steer on the back. Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume. One miscalculation... No, 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 no. I've got ten metres to go ahead! One change in conditions... It started to completely fell down. Put spell disaster... Mother Nature stamped her feet. ..with reputations... And lives on the line. Yeah! They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the mega shippers. Govan Glasgow, in the west of Scotland. A shipyard with a 150-year history of building warships for the Royal Navy through the First and Second World Wars. For the last 20 years, the yard has been part of BAE Systems, who specialise in military craft. Their latest cutting-edge project? The 19-metre offshore patrol vessel known as an OPV. The newest version has taken two and a half years to build and is for the British Royal Navy. HMS Trent is part of a £635 million project for five new ships and their support. When complete, it will operate around Britain, undertaking maritime security, border control, counter-terrorism and fishery protection. Over the next five days, naval architect Heather Crockett is in charge of a complex move to get the vessel worth over £100 million safely from the build shed and floated for the first time. We are going to be launching the Royal Navy's new offshore patrol vessel. Um, rather than launching it down a slipway, we are going to be rolling it onto a barge and then we're going to take the barge downriver to a deep berth and we'll submerge the barge and then the ship will float off in a nice controlled fashion. Although it made for a great spectacle, the days of launching newly built ships down a steep slipway are in the past. One of the main reasons we don't tend to take them down the slipway anymore is there's a lot of uncontrolled factors for a dynamic launch. You don't know what your coefficient of friction is actually on the day. It can be quite risky. With a dynamic launch, once it goes, it goes. Instead of a slipway, the team have already loaded the vessel onto self-propelled modular trailers to get the 2,000-tonne ship onto a semi-submersible barge, which will carry it downriver where it will submerge and the OPV will float free. So to move the ship, we've got 80 axles, that means uh, 80 rows of wheels, four rows wide, and they are moving on CAMAG SPMTs, self-propelled modular trailers. And the trailers can rise and fall as well. So while we're driving over the bridge that takes us onto the barge, the trailers kind of compensate and keep the barge all nice and level. They might look small, but each axle can take 30 tonnes. So, I mean, we've got well enough capacity to, to lift the ship today. HMS Trent is 13 metres wide and 90 metres long, sitting on 12 custom-built stands, each capable of holding around 200 tonnes. What's different to usual is that uh, the ship isn't actually in any sort of way welded or secured to the cradle. She's literally just sitting there and the shape of the cradle is kind of stopping or tipping out um, and sliding off uh, forward or aft. Heather must get the 2,000 tonne vessel safely onto the barge without it slipping off its stands. The SPMT transporters must get across a narrow temporary bridge known as a link span, which must be as flat as possible. The link spans might look quite small. Um, they are just, you know, essentially the width of the trailer and they're not very thick. They're only about 200 mil thick. The Clyde estuary is tidal, with water levels varying by up to five metres. But the tide is rising faster than expected, lifting the barge higher and making the temporary metal bridge too steep to get the vessel on board. 
at the moment, the deck edge of the barge is supposed to only be about 20, 30 centimetres above the key level, but actually we're more like half a metre because uh, the tides come out a bit faster. Um, so the problem that it might cause is, is the ramps are quite steep now um, and the trailers need them a little bit more flat to, to roll over. Seawater must be pumped on board to lower it down and transport supervisor George Hill needs to be on standby to move the trailers as soon as the barge is low enough. The tide's starting to surge at the minute, which means for us we'll just start to roll on a little bit earlier than expected. The transporter is 67 metres long, and all four sections need to communicate with each other for remote control steering. But there's a problem with the hydraulic power pack which drives the transporters. The tide is continuing to rise rapidly. If George and his team don't find the problem soon, the 2,000-ton ship won't get on the barge, and the launch of the Royal Navy's newest addition will be in jeopardy. 430 miles south on the southern coast of England, Southampton, the UK's number one export port, handling 14 million tonnes of cargo a year, worth 40 billion pounds. It's also a vital link between Britain and the Channel Islands. 130 miles away, Guernsey and Jersey are heavily dependent on imports of food and essential goods from the UK. The Channel Islands are obviously totally reliant on the UK for supplying everything that we take for granted over here. They're on an island, it has to be shipped out there. General Manager Barry Goshawk is preparing to load 600 tonnes of vital supplies for the 165,000 people living on Jersey and Guernsey. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure this is it. It's on flat 295. At the heart of the service, the Channel Island Line's Hewlin Dispatch, an 89-metre-long, 2,600-tonne bulk cargo vessel sailing across the English Channel three times a week. So this is the dockside. Our vessel is due in in about an hour. Uh, so she'll, she'll moor up here and be tied up here. Obviously, you've got both cranes there. One end does Jersey, the other end does Guernsey. The Hewland Dispatch operates 24 hours a day, but a fuel pump problem has delayed her arrival. Unfortunately, today the vessel's running a little bit late. Uh, she had some engine problems yesterday, so we're going to be a bit under pressure. Whereas she's normally in at 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, she's arriving at 10 o'clock today, and we need to get her over at 5 o'clock. She needs to be into Jersey at uh, 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, so we're under a bit of pressure to get her away, get her loaded on the way very quickly. A dockside team of forklift drivers, crane operators and slingers need to load 120 containers and flatbeds across three decks in just seven hours. There is a lot of riding on this because people could be sitting in the islands waiting for these, these goods. There could be a building under construction which they, they has to halt because of this. Obviously there, there are repercussions if we don't ship on time, there could be costs involved in that. There is a pressure to, to produce the goods at the end of the day. At 10 o'clock, the Hewlin Dispatch arrives in Southampton three hours late. All right, so the boat's just arrived. It's just been uh, tied up. The cranes will now come into action. They'll take out all the empty units which will come back, empty containers and flatbeds, which possibly we need now to load freight onto to ship them back out again. they have got uh, oxygen and uh, gases ready for the hospitals. Obviously that, that's a, quite a priority because that's uh, quite important. Tanks are just coming down here, which is a tank of fuel. That'll be an empty coming down now, but we ship the uh, you know, diesel and all the fuel for the planes over there for the airport. With 120 empty units back on shore, they can begin to load the bottom deck with the flatbeds and six tanks of highly inflammable aviation fuel. We uh, ship some fuel tanks out as well from very heavy. Uh, the uh, weight of the fuel tanks is quite relevant because they have to balance the boat. The ship's been specially adapted by owner and captain Frank Allen to carry such a dangerous cargo. 
we have a contract for the aviation fuel for Jersey Airport because this ship has CO2 fitted in the hold. Uh, she specialises in carrying these hazardous cargoes. Onboard tanks pump out carbon dioxide that make a layer of inert gas to prevent fire or explosion. This is the container plan and you can input the various decks on the ship and move in all the weights and the weights will come from the tally man and the second mate will input all the information to you. And when that's complete, they'll work out the stability of the vessel and make sure she's safe to go to sea. In the hold, the flat packs are pinned to the deck and they're relying on crane driver Craig Berry to get them tightly packed. You've got to be obviously aware of the other crane and uh, there's a lot of fork work on the floor now. You've got to be always a bit vigilant on this, but you've just got to be on the ball. With the bottom deck nearly full, the middle tween deck is built on top with steel pontoons, which must be secure to provide a safe platform for the aviation fuel known dockside as Avgas. I've got to move this uh, pontoon, because when I put the half gas down, it pontoon like moved a little bit. So obviously why these cleats that hold them up is out a little bit. Perfect. But the engine trouble that delayed the ship from the Channel Islands overnight has not gone away. We just found out from the boat that they've got a problem with a fuel pump. Unfortunately, the tank that actually powers the engine is the one that we haven't got the fuel in at the moment. Uh, the quick fix to this is to get more fuel. If the ship's to leave on time, they need 3,000 litres of marine gas oil for the second tank or a rapid repair of the fuel pump. OK, so that was the uh, fuel supply company. Uh, they can't get the fuel to us before 5 o'clock, uh, so that could be an issue. So I'm going to have a chat with the boat, uh, see where we are, the repairs. A late fuel delivery will put the Hewland dispatch even further behind schedule. I've spoken to the fuel people. OK. Uh, they probably aren't going to get here by five o'clock. Yeah. They say more like half past six. Whatever. Is the well, fault might, not fixable? Be. We're on it. Barry needs a solution fast, or the whole shipment to the Channel Islands is in jeopardy. What we're going to do, they're obviously working on the problem and hopefully going to fix it, which will be the number one scenario. As a backup, we need to put that in place. So we've, we've ordered the fuel. You know, if, if it turns out we don't need it, it's a risk we're going to have to take. It's a high pressure situation, and uh, there is never a dull moment here. In West Scotland, at the Govan shipyard in Glasgow, the Royal Navy's latest offshore patrol vessel is waiting to be launched. The 2,000 ton ship has taken over two and a half years to build and needs to be moved onto a semi-submersible barge and taken down the Clyde River to the deep water dock where it'll be floated for the first time. In active service, it'll patrol British borders and conduct counter-terrorism activities. You got it. Lift supervisor George Hill has already pulled HMS Trent out of the build shed using an 80-axle self-propelled modular trailer. But today, the high-tech units aren't talking to each other, so it won't start. Just putting the coordinates in for each trailer so it knows uh, where each one of the four's at in a uh, configuration. 2240 is front and right, innit? Yeah. Happy George. All working now, we uh, Smile on the face, you see. No panic. Thanks to George manually programming the trailers, he and operator Dave Hathaway can now attempt to get the 2,000 ton ship across the metal ramps connecting the barge to the quay. Go for diagonal, mate, and stay to your left. One metre to the ramp now. Start coming up at the front a little bit, mate. Come up at the front. Going to normal, mate, and steer a touch to your right. Right, oh, mate, keep coming as you are now. But the tide is still rising rapidly, and the rollout stopped while naval architect Heather Crockett adjusts the amount of seawater on the barge to keep it level with the quay. 
Righto, Dave, hold it there, mate. Pull a bit of service brake on. The Dina Launcher is a 91-metre-long, 28-metre-wide semi-submersible barge. Below deck, it has empty ballast tanks that can be filled with seawater to adjust its height and allow it to totally submerge and float HMS Trent when she arrives at the deep water dock. The SPMT trailers will need to land the vessel millimetre perfect on the specially designed grillage beams. We've got our grillage beams, so as the trailers drive on, they will kind of duck down and leave the ship sitting on top of these beams. The SPMT has computer-controlled axles, each with hydraulic suspension and the ability to turn 270 degrees, driven by one operator using a remote control. Come up on your front left to touch, mate, up on your front left. It's a crucial stage of the operation. With just 10 centimetres either side of the transporter, oh, mate, hold that. George has minimal margin for error. It's up to make sure the barge stays left with the key. Just checking the grid, it's quite tight on the side. Got 100 mil to play with. But as the vessel and trailer add weight to the back of the Dina launcher, seawater must be pumped into the ballast tanks at the front of the barge. Right, cheers, mate. Just come down a little bit at the back end. The horizontal beams at the base of the cradles running left to right must be lined up perfectly with the landing points on the grillage beams. I've got to watch everything. There's 80 axles in the combination. There's not a lot of room on the sides. I've got to check the level between the grillage uh, and the other side of the ship. So, yeah, busy job. Yeah. You can never sort of turn your back. When you turn your back, that's when something's going to catch you. But um, obviously, when you're moving things like this, there's not a lot of room and there's a lot going on. You've got to keep on top of everything and, uh, and look, because the slightest thing could ruin a big operation like this. So it's important to keep on top of it. After two and a half hours, just before 11 o'clock, the 2,000-ton vessel is hovering just millimetres above the landing points. So that's our mark there, that one the edge of this beam to line up with. And that's the mark there, that one that edge to line up with. So we'll take it a little bit closer and then we'll do a quick walk just to make sure all the corners match and then we'll put it down. OK, mate, hold it there, hold it there. Go straight. Right, now hold that. HMS Trent is now just five millimetres off landing on the barge. But Heather needs to pack out any final gaps with plywood, known as shimming, so there's no steel-on-steel -steel contact to avoid slipping. We're just walking round and looking to see if there's any gaps, just so that when it eventually goes out to sea, there's all good contact at all points. It's looking good. Just, uh, just a few to shim in. By 12 o'clock, the HMS Trent is in place. She'll sit here for another day or so, where we'll install some sea fastening so that she can go to sea and just holds the, the ship in place. Then we will tour down river and we tour through a deep water berth. And that's where we then submerge the barge down and the ship will float up. The float off operation is a real biggie. Um, it's the one everyone wants to watch. Um, so when everyone panics about. In two days, the Dina launcher and a 100 million pound cargo will be towed down the River Clyde. But the Scottish weather is unpredictable and high winds could jeopardize the move. In Southampton, the Hewland dispatch cargo ship is due to leave at five o'clock and head out to the Channel Islands with vital supplies. General Manager Barry Goshawk is under pressure to get 120 containers and flatbed loads on board. The clock is always ticking. I'm not panicking yet. If in two hours this is all sitting there exactly like this, then yes, I will be getting anxious. With the middle tween deck now full, the concertina top deck can be spread out into position ready to take the last containers. But a pump that transfers fuel between tanks on the ship is not working. She can't leave unless it's fixed or she gets more fuel in her reserve tank. 
While the repair team assess the problem, the loading of the top deck continues. And by mid-afternoon, the mechanics have made a breakthrough. Uh, so it's now uh, half past three. Uh, thankfully, they've managed to repair the, the problem on the boat. We've cancelled the fuel delivery, uh, so we're still on target now to get her away for five o'clock. With the fuel pump fixed, it's down to first mate Alistair Ellis to plot their course for the challenging 12-hour, 130-mile crossing to the Channel Islands. So this is the route we take across. You can see and this is the northeastbound lane and this is the southwestbound lane. Crossing that shipping lane, it, it can be very busy. By five o'clock, the dockside team have completed the load-up. 120 containers on board across three decks in seven hours. All loaded, ready to go. I have clearance outbound, the aft line's gone, and we're going to start to pull off the key. Now I'm going to make the signal to let everybody know we're moving astern. Leaving the berth can be one of the most stressful parts, but in the English Channel, it's, it's very much like a motorway. As you approach the, the shipping lane, you'll start to pick up the international regulations for the prevention of collisions at sea, which is what everybody at sea follows. So they, they state that when, as we're crossing the shipping lane, we're essentially crossing two lanes of motorway. By five o'clock, the eight-man crew are on their way with a satisfying 1,000 tonnes of cargo for Captain Frank Allen. You, this lady can feed two islands three times a week with, with their furniture and their dry goods and everything else. It's, it's a way of life, isn't it? Uh, and actually being able to put the whole project together and run it, it gives you a great buzz. Leaving Southampton, it's a 130 mile journey across one of the busiest shipping routes in the world. Up to 500 ships a day sailing east and west must be avoided en route to St. Helier in Jersey. After an 11 hour crossing, the Hewlin Dispatch has made it safely into St. Helier Harbour, an hour ahead of schedule. And from the lower decks, the crucial aviation fuel for the airport is carefully offloaded. Just one of around 15 tanks delivered by the ship every week. That's getting a bit tight down there, mate. Do you want to have both put on top of the furniture so we're all containers? Yes, please, mate. That's fine, Steve. Five hours after they arrived, Alistair can guide his deck crew and the rest of the cargo out of St. Helier Harbour and on towards Guernsey. 165,000 people rely on the Hewlin Dispatch and her crew. A call of duty for Frank Allen, the very last of his kind, who owns and captains his own cargo ship. I'm the last captain owner in the British Isles. My father used to say to me, why did I go into banking? Because I would have made a lot of money. And I said, well, because I, I like ships, and that's the reason I'm in it, you know. It's a kind of a labour of love. That's how I can describe it, as a labour of love. Govan Shipyard, Glasgow. The Royal Navy's latest offshore patrol vessel, HMS Trent, has been loaded and fastened to a semi-submersible barge. It needs to be towed one and a half miles down the river to a deep water berth, so it can be floated and launched for the first time. But it's windier than expected. It's a beautiful day. Who doesn't love working out in the rain and the wind? Heather Crockett spent two years preparing for the move, and the tugs are on standby. But the only element she can't predict is the weather. It's only safe to move the 100 million pound vessel if the wind is below 29 miles an hour. It's quite a fresh day, a bit windier than we would have liked, uh, but it's still within limits. So our limit for moving down river is 25 knots, and we're sitting about 18 gusting 20. But at the last minute, the wind unexpectedly gathers pace to 24 knots, 27 miles an hour. The HMS Trent 
is sitting around 27 meters high and acts like a giant sail, a problem for navigation pilot Gillen Locke. We've got 90 meters of a flat side, so the wind's pushing on that very large surface area is going to push us down onto the other side of the dock, uh, which is where we do not want to end up. Heather needs to assess the risk with the team. I don't think we want to risk damaging the barge or the fact that there's guys working over there. Yeah, the critical bit's getting out of here. There is a risk of damage to the barge. But barge master Chris Spencer thinks the tugs can cope with the wind. We're right on the limits, but I believe there's plenty of power in the tugboats. OK. Are you in agreement? Yeah, there's power there. It's just as long as everyone's It's just that odd gust. Yeah. Our limit for the move is uh, 21 tw gusting 25 knots, and we're kind of sitting about 24 knots gusting 30. Um, so we're just over the limits. With the winds just under the maximum allowed for the move, it's a critical moment. Heather must call the owners, BAE Systems, to discuss whether they can move the ship in conditions verging on unsafe. OK, so uh, we just had a bit of a team talk there with the, the client and the warranty surveyor. They're not comfortable with us taking it out into the river um, in wind speeds that are higher than what the documentation says. Um, so we're just basically going to knock it on the head for the day. Heather must make a difficult announcement to the team. Yeah, we just had a word from the client there. Um, they're not happy with us taking it out into the river over limits. So, lines back on, please. OK, Ronnie, did you catch that? Yeah, I caught most of it that way. I'll just take it back on then, yeah? I'm afraid so. Yep, yeah, no problem. I'll head over get it. It's a huge blow. We're at the top end of the limit, so, yeah, it's, it's it makes exactly, sense. Yeah. Months of planning have just been thrown up in the air, and Heather's left to pick up the pieces. Bit of a bit of a pain for the day. Uh, makes my day a bit more stressful than it needs to be. We can plan absolutely everything except the weather. You know, the weather is what the weather is. Heather must spend the rest of the day seeing if the constantly in-demand tugs will be available to try again in the next few days. Uh, I don't know if you are updated on the situation, but the move today got aborted due to weather. Until she can reschedule the whole operation, the offshore patrol vessel remains stuck on the barge. The launch of the Royal Navy's brand new ship postponed indefinitely. Quorn, Leicestershire. The Great Central Railway. An eight mile long restored stretch of track running through the Midlands south of Loughborough to Leicester. On the move, the Witherslack Hall, a steam locomotive originally built in 1948 and recently restored. But today, she'll be the passenger on a road trip. Heavy haulage specialists, Alla Lease, have arrived to take the locomotive 180 miles south to Bishop's Lydiard, where it'll be the star attraction at the West Somerset Railway Steam and Vintage Rally in two days' time. Eric Harrison and the team need to winch the Witherslack Hall onto the trailer in under two hours to depart by 3 p.m. and avoid driving the oversized load in the dark. Sounds easy. <laughs> it's down to experience. We've moved hundreds of these and each loco is slightly different. I think we're almost about 115 tonnes with this on board. I think the loco weighs about 70 tonnes. The Witherslack Hall took 10 years to restore and is now worth half a million pounds. She weighs 75 tonnes, is 19 metres long, nearly 3 metres wide and 4 metres high. To get the locomotive on the trailer, they need to extend a 10 metre long, slowly inclining track from the back of the hydraulic platform transporter. We line up the rails which are built into the trailer with the rails that are on the floor. With the rails in place, the winch can be attached to the 70-year-old engine. It's a very old loco. You've got to treat it with a bit of respect and uh, make sure that you don't put weight where it doesn't want to go. You've got to keep it all level as you can. 
she spent the 1950s running at over 70 miles an hour, taking commuters between London and Manchester. But her progress onto the trailer is more leisurely. And just as she reaches her final position, there's a problem. You broke it, did you? Yeah. Which one was it? The trailer has seven rows of four wheels, enabling it to go round corners. But a steering arm on one of the axles is broken. I can't pull back off this wheel, can I? If it can't be fixed, the trailer won't be able to turn properly. It's all works on the front end, so all these axles stay in. So as you turn a sharp corner or whatever, or roundabout, they all sort of turn at the right angle. So if you haven't got that steering arm in, you won't have any steer on the back. It's a setback. The steam railway fare in Somerset begins in just two days' time. If the steering arm can't be fixed or replaced with a spare, the Witherslack Hall won't be getting to Somerset any time soon. And the vintage railway event will be denied their 70-year-old star attraction. Monday morning, in the west of Scotland, on the River Clyde in Glasgow, marine architect Heather Crockett has loaded the Royal Navy's latest offshore patrol vessel, HMS Trent, onto a barge and needs to tow it downriver where it will be launched. The first attempt was aborted due to high winds. We're itching to get going. Nobody wants any more delays. We've been delayed by two days so far. The weather's absolutely perfect. The sun's shining. Most importantly, the wind's dropped right down. The water's pretty much flat calm. Yeah, a perfect day for a move downriver. HMS Trent needs to be towed from the roll-on, roll-off quay one and a half miles downriver by three tugs to the King George V deep water berth, known as KG-5, where she'll be launched for the first time by floating her off the barge. Morning, chaps. Two box talk before we start the move for today. Um, obviously, the move is from Roro Key down to KG-5 float off berth. In charge of getting the Dina launcher down the River Clyde is navigation pilot Gillan Locke on the barge and in control of what direction all three tugs push and pull. That's, uh, the bruiser are all fast, thank you. By 11 o'clock, Bruiser and Battler can get in position to pull her away from the quayside. Yeah, Battler, uh, when you come in, leave enough space for the warrior to, uh, to fit in. OK. With Battler and Bruiser in position, some of the mooring ropes can be released to make room for the third tug called Warrior. Yeah, Bruiser, just uh, we're all clear wire now, so we should be uh, in position to start making a move. Finally, at 11 o'clock, two days behind schedule, the tugs can begin to tow the Dina launcher downriver. And we'll just uh, start getting the barge moving ahead. Perfect, perfect. That's us off the berth. Um, warrior tug will just move in at the stern here. We've got another tug on the bow, um, and we've just got a wee helper tug on the side. So the pilots are going to take her out into the river. It's a short journey, but on the River Clyde, even if the skies are blue, the wind can turn at a moment's notice. The main risk at the moment is if the, the wind just catches her and she takes a shear. Um, so we're just watching to see how, uh, how she sits within the river channel. Barge and ship combined have 1,500 square metres of surface area and the wind can easily push them off course. As we came round the small turn in the river, uh, the wind just pushed on the, uh, on the side of the barge, uh, so it just made the whole barge just very slowly uh, drift over the side of the channel. And despite two years of planning, an unexpected police diving exercise is under threat from the swirling water left behind by the 4,000 horsepower tug. I think that's a bit stupid to be in the head when we're moving the barge down, especially the water that just under five metres of draft. Okay, advice from the pilot would be it would be more sensible to take the uh, diver out the water. Uh, just in case the barge does slide over. Yeah, going. Uh, they're going to take him 
out. I've taken him out just now. All received, thank you. Anytime you do these things, you always expect the unexpected. With the human hazard avoided, the wind and current negotiated, they approached the King George V deep water dock after 30 minutes. Uh, so we're aiming up, um, you can see these big black rubber fenders. We're going to be putting the barge uh, just, just on the two of those. Nearly there, nearly there. Final stage now, final stage. Roughly 50 to go, Alan. Yeah, worry, well, just, uh, just take the speed off for a little bit. We don't arrive too fast. Heather is dockside and needs to get the barge perfectly lined up. Just need to pull it so that the fender wants to walk this way. How's that going? OK, yeah. I'm just going to dash up the forward end there and have a final check. OK, stand by, Gillen. Hi, hi. OK, Chris, she's all stopped. We're on the fenders, position-wise. Happy? Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, that's us. We're safely alongside, so the barge is now on its berth, on the fenders. Time to go home and, uh, yeah, feet up, have a cuppa and uh, relax. Tomorrow, the Dina launcher will be pumped full of seawater so it sinks to the bottom of the river, and the HMS Trent can be floated for the first time. The team are already two days behind schedule, and need the launch to go smoothly if the Royal Navy is to get its latest ship on time. Quorn and Woodhouse Rail Yard, Leicestershire. A 75-ton steam locomotive, the Witherslack Hall, is meant to be on the road to Somerset, but one of the steering arms on the trailer that allows it to go round corners is broken and has to be replaced. Now you got all the pipes on the way down. I thought maybe you put a small hook down there. Yeah. Through, through you got all your pipes. Yeah. You've got it as far back as you can, really, haven't you? The spare steering arm finally works, and the trailer is safe for the road trip. Twelve rod and chain lashings are put in place, each one capable of securing 10 tonnes of weight. Safety is paramount. We have to make sure that it's safe to go on the roads. Uh, you have an incident with this, it becomes a major problem for everybody. The loco needs to travel 180 miles south to Somerset. Along the way, they'll pass under motorway bridges, but at 16 foot high, that could be a problem. Well, the crucial part now, we have to uh, check the height of the trailer and load to make sure it's at a safe height to run on the motorway because obviously the height is quite critical. Because we need to get down to uh, around about 16 foot, 16 foot two maximum to run on the motorway. More than that, you're a bit close to the motorway bridges. Back in the oh, old wow. days, we used to use a tape measure, which meant climbing up there and measuring, but health and safety nowadays, you can't climb up things like that. Yeah, it's around about 16 feet, that is. Let's check it back. The driver's cab looks much taller. But it's higher than I was hoping it was going to be. Just means we have to run the trailer quite low to the floor. Down a bit. The trailer has to be lowered to safely go under the bridges. But so close to the road, the journey's just become more hazardous. So lowering it right down, you're cutting down the axle travel. So if you go onto any bad cambers and all that, you've got to be careful. The locomotive was due to be delivered to Somerset by the end of the day. But the delay has put Eric two hours behind schedule, which means he's unlikely to be there before sunset. Well, you certainly get a lot of funny looks. Uh, people aren't used to seeing a steam engine on the back of a trailer. With one support vehicle, but no police escort, Eric and his team are solely responsible for public safety. You have to travel at the correct speeds, make sure that you've got plenty of stopping distance. At 60 miles an hour, Eric must allow at least 80 metres stopping distance to protect the half a million pound locomotive. You've got to be careful that you don't scratch them, get too close to overhanging trees and things like that. But the loco can't be offloaded in the dark, 
and as night falls, Eric and the engine have to overnight in a service station in Somerset. At first light, Eric is back on the road for the final few miles. The West Somerset Steam Gala begins in less than 24 hours, and Eric needs to get her there on time to be prepared and fired up, ready to roll. By 8 o'clock in the morning, the Witherslack Hall arrives safely at Bishop's Lydiard Station in Somerset. The offload overseen by steam fair organiser Stuart Nellums. We're always very pleased that the locomotive has arrived. Obviously, it's here on time for the event. Um, it's in one piece. Uh, we've just got to uh, hopefully get it off the lorry, do the inspections, and we're ready to roll. The loco needs to be ready to run on the track tomorrow. The next day, the Witherslack Hall is put through its paces and shown off to the avid fans at the West Somerset Steam Gala. Enthusiasts from across the country experiencing a piece of British engineering from the days when mega shipment was fueled by coal and powered by steam. In Glasgow, at the Deepwater Dockyard, naval architect Heather Crockett is preparing to launch the Royal Navy's latest patrol vessel. The ship will be offloaded by filling the semi-submersible barge with seawater to sink it and let HMS Trent float off its supports. Heather heads into the ballast control room to level out the Dina launcher. At 6.45 in the morning, after a two and a half year build costing millions of pounds, the sinking begins at the back of the barge. We started pumping in water about 30 minutes ago, so that's bringing the stern end of the barge down before the bow, um, so it's nice and controlled. Naval architect Jonathan Fettis keeps Heather in touch with where the barge is sitting against the waterline. Currently, Heather is up in the ballast control room. Um, she will be pumping the water into the stern of the barge and she will be bringing the stern down first. Three hours into submersion at 10 o'clock, the back of the barge is almost down. But the tide's not rising as fast as they were expecting, known as a cut. Currently, the, uh, the stern is actually uh, touching the bottom at the moment. Um, we have a slight uh, cut in the tide, um, so we've uh, stopped ballasting just to allow the tide to come up a wee bit more. The vessel is loose on the cradle. The angle is getting dangerously steep and they could lose control of the ship. Obviously, we don't want to ballast her down too much or the, the angle will cause a dynamic launch, which is not what we want. It would become a point where the friction that is holding the ship onto the cradles at the moment wouldn't be sufficient to hold the ship in place and she would actually start to slide off. There would be no way of holding her. They're relying on the rising tide to keep the vessel safe because after almost six hours of submersion, the barge can't get any lower. We're just sitting on the, the seabed at the moment, um, waiting for the tide to come up um, to float the OPV off nice and level. While they wait for the tide, navigation pilot Gillen Locke returns to supervise the tugs that'll pull her clear of the barge. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So the overall plan is to take the patrol vessel off the barge and move it astern to this berth where the rubber fenders are. So we'll have one tug on the bow, one tug on the stern. It's a highly risky manoeuvre. So what happens as we slide the patrol vessel out, uh, the clearance, uh, we're, we're, we're talking uh, about 20 centimetres, um, so we've got very small tolerance to work with. Heather needs to make sure the barge is level before the tugs pull HMS Trent clear of the cradle. We are happy with these drafts. Are you ready for us to start calling the tugs in then? Yes, please. The ship is yours. Okie dokie, thank you. The vessel will be towed free backwards, with a 2,000 horsepower tug Battler leading the float out. Okay, uh, Battler, Lawrence, just nice and gently, uh, just, just put a minimum weight on and we'll just start sliding up. With just 20 centimetres between the cradle 
and some of the fins attached to the hull, there's very little room for manoeuvre. The most important thing is keeping her parallel to the barge. And the wind's pushing her over to the left. Uh, the bow's gone over to port slightly because of the wind, so we're just holding on to this rope to bring the, the boat back central, because we've got to get through these cradles that you can see under the water down there. Yeah, happy of that. Back in the centre now, looking good. Uh, Baita, let me know uh, once you're clear of the castles and you're ready to uh, come in just on the starboard bow. After just 20 minutes, HMS Trent is out of her cradle. That's us clear of the barge now, so we're just going to line her up for the fenders and uh, we'll get her safely alongside. Cruise are all stopped. OK, we're on the fenders. Cruise are minimum. Yeah, all done, all safely done. Um, she's out, out the cradles, so that's uh, smooth. Uh, didn't touch anything. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we like. After six days of manoeuvres, from a build shed to a launch site, HMS Trent is finally free on the water for the first time. Yeah, really successful day. That went absolutely fantastic. And the tug just had to squeeze a little bit through, but yeah, she went down a treat. In a couple of minutes, she'll be towed away back down to the, the shipyard where she's got about a year's worth of outfitting. And then she'll be handed over to the Royal Navy where she can go off and protect our great nation. HMS Trent is towed downriver for the next stage of her preparations. She's destined to become part of a fleet of five river-class offshore patrol vessels in service with the Royal Navy by 2020.